Okay, welcome back everyone. Just checking, just checking that you're here. It's same me, and we have Jonas here with me. All right, yeah. yeah. So see you all. Uh, nice to have you here. So um, welcome back to the new stream. Um, I was a bit confused to be honest, but now uh, everything is working. So and also we have Mehmet here with his next talk: um, test automation engineering through the eyes of a scenarist. So I'm really looking forward to your talk. Um, how are you today? I'm fine, Jonas. How are you too? Doing good. So, yeah, so really looking forward to your talk. Um, like, I'm sharing do you have your slides? You can, you can start sharing your screen and I would just hand over to you if you want. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Now we should see it. All right. Yeah. Have fun, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad that Vehicle invited me to a, such a great event. I hope you are not tired. Uh, there were nice sessions today. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm Mehmet Kök from Turkey and working for Udemy. Uh, I have almost 15 years of experience in software development industry. Uh, in my profession, there are some roles that have been deemed suitable for me, like uh, project manager, software analysts, but I like testing, finding bugs, and also automation. And I found my career path as a test automation engineer. Lastly, uh, I want to say I love my daughter and she's my biggest weakness. Anyway, uh, today we have a tight schedule and we will give I will give you as much as possible I can. Uh, firstly, I will ask you a question about movies cast and creep. And after we will go through some agile terms like user story and requirement refinement techniques. Since uh, this day is a junior session, uh, I prepared some brief explanation about those terms. So, and lastly, we will look at how to write BDD and how, write it, how to write it properly. Before starting, I want to ask you a question. Uh, which role is the best for a test automation engineer in a movie cast and crew? Take 30 seconds to think about this. At the same time, please draw an elephant on a paper or on a drawing tool. Uh, yes, you heard it right. It's an elephant. I want, to, I ask you to draw it. So I will be wait, waiting for you for 30 seconds. And let me help you with the roles at Mui, Cast, and Kriv. Let's think about that. And I hope you draw an elephant. <laughs> Thanks for the time. Okay, all right. Uh, let's take a look at the movie cast and crew. Uh, for example, producer. Uh, he's the one who have some investments on the movie as a project. So that's not a nice fit for us. Maybe producer is like C-level executives. And actors and actresses are like our users, our personas that make the stories alive. Uh, and also the director is something like managerial side, isn't it? Uh, the, others, the others who make the movie project alive, like sound mixer, operators, and special effects are workers, I mean laborers, who make the things. Uh, it's also part of us, developers and the product folks. But today's subject is script writing, and we will be, we will see the scenarist side of us. Before script writing, let's go through some basics. Since today is the junior session, yes, this is an agile Scrum sprint flow that is taken from Scrum.org. 
There are large and small tasks in the product backlog. With the sprint planning activity, we create a sprint backlog that contains more refined and granularized tasks. With the efforts of the Scrum team, uh, there is an increment at the end of each sprint, which is tangible and more meaningful to our product folks. Yes, everybody knows about that. I know user stories. So what makes a task refined. This is an example of user story and it defines what a student intended to do. In front of the card, we have a persona intended activity and the benefit that persona take as a result of the activity. At the back of the card, we have some confirmations. Those are the rules, all rules about this user story we will see how refine a user story. Okay, those are three amigos. So the uh, agile team is here. This picture actually means a lot to me, like uh, the needs to be the, a team of people with different perspectives and also early involvement and collaboration. Uh, refinement activities should be sold within this team. So the team itself is the scenarist. We are part of a scenarist, but it is usually test automation engineers, engineers accountability to ensure and maintain the edits of the script written. Let's look at some refinement activities. We talked a bit about refinements and we will deep dive into this. Okay. According to the 2020 Scrum Guide, the product backlog refinement is an act of adding detail and refinement activity usually consumes no more than 10% of the capacity of the development team. So while there are goals, impacts, and deliverables in the larger boxes, when we come down to half side of the product backlog, we should refine user stories and acceptance criteria. I, I mean the rules, uh, the previous slide, to the concrete examples. Afterwards, those concrete examples will be our executable scripts. So at the end of the day, if we don't have concrete examples, we all agree on different things. Like your drawings at the beginning, uh, I asked which I asked you uh, to draw an elephant. I don't declare any concrete detail about an elephant and we all drew an elephant in our minds. Yes, there are some bunch of requirement refinement techniques and I want to give you one example of example mapping here. We have a sample user story from Udemy and the conditions below. With the example mapping technique, our layout like this one. We will write user story to the upper yellow post-its and the conditions as rules in the blue post-its. Uh, the concrete examples of these rules will be in the green post-its, but they should begin with the one where. And also we will have some questions during the refinement sessions. Okay, our user story is, as a student, I should be able to buy courses with a valid payment transaction so that I can see the course content. Okay. There are some also uh, confirmations. Uh, the payment transaction is successful when the bank response is successful. Uh, those will be our rules. The payment transaction should be blocked when the same credit card used on three consecutive wrong. Uh, there is no explanation so here 
let's see how we write them here. Uh, believe it or not, this exercise will be unique in across all the teams. Uh, I mean, all the teams output will be different at the end of the session. Okay, here is the rules in the blue boxes. One example is here. The one where bank, bank transaction is successful, user should be directed to the course content. According to this rule, there is an open point like what if the bank responded with, an, with any results? So as I said, this is a unique for every one in for every team. Each team's output will be different, but we will be all handshake on concrete examples. A quick recap of behavior driven development. Let's talk about some BDD stuff. Okay, this picture is taken from BDD in action uh, book. BDD from 15 feet. You see the conventional one and the BDD way of development. Uh, in the conventional one, each team members translates documents and artifacts between each other. And this may result mistranslations. And the BDD way is the collaborative way of doing this development thing. The Scrum teams defines requirements as structured Gherkin formats. We will see Gherkin formats. And it guides each of them while working, while doing their own work. Uh, and the BDD becomes the single source of truth. Source of truth. So what is BDD and what is not? BDD transforms conversations in the, into concrete examples with a collaborative way. Being testable is its nature. If it is, but there is a condition, uh, it should be in good hands. Uh, not a replacement for Kanban, Scrum, XP, any other uh, agile uh, or development uh, methodology, but incorporates with them. Also, ATT, ATDD and TDD is not BDD. They have some similarities, like starting with a failed scenario, but different in other aspects. OK. Uh, creating a, we, we are going to a little too far now. Uh, let's focus on our hands-on experience and how to add, how to and not to write uh, a Gherkin scenario. Here is our example. Uh, our concrete example will be our scenario before. The one where bank transaction is successful, users should be directed to the course content. We, sh we should first arrange state of the system first. And this will be our given step. And when it comes to acting in our system, it should contain some user actions. And this will be our when step. And lastly, we should assert some stuff on the system. And this will be then step. So below code part is an example of glue code that runs within the given step. Uh, in the given step, uh, there is a statement like a student on the checkout page with a course in the cart. Uh, this is a given state and this glue code uh, is connected with the statement in the given phrase. So a student on the checkout page with a course in the cart uh, is responsible for realizing this stuff in this function. 
So we should add some mystery with our BDD uh, scenarios. So let's talk about some don'ts. Uh, really, uh, I see some gherkin stuff like this in some projects. This is a basic don't. Uh, when it comes to reality, nobody cares your locators and weights in the scenarios. Nobody can understand those. I mean, product folks or any, any other colleagues uh, rather than us. There should be no step definitions like this one. Uh, we should add some mystery to our automation and keep them secret in our code. And also we can give the elements some secret code names like save button or some headers, some page header. Uh, we, we can use those secret code names <laughs> in, in our uh, scenarios, in our steps, step definitions. So, being simple is an art. Being simple can sometimes be complex. Uh, we should focus on test intention and the test conditions. Ask twice yourself what we are testing here. So, you are just realizing three A's. Three A's, what I mean three A's is arrange, act, and assert. Nothing more. And everybody in the team should understand it. Define a maximum test step count and do not exceed it. Uh, there should be there should be a threshold uh, we that we shouldn't exceed on our scenarios. And everybody in the team should understand it. Define a maximum test step count for a scenario and a maximum scenario count for a feature. I mean, the feature here is our user story. So keep the user story also simple, the rules also simple. And if the rules are simple, then our scenarios are limited in, in the feature. So, uh, there should be no glitches in the matrix. Always ask yourself, are there any step definition that corresponds to what am I trying to add? Do not repeat yourself. I mean, do not repeat step definitions. They are all single. They should be all single and uh, aim to one uh, one aim, uh, one responsibility. So if you are adding scenarios with same step sequence, I mean, do this, do this, and do this. Th those are three uh, steps and three unique steps and recurring in many scenarios. Don't do that. Please group them in one step definition and use it uh, sometimes it, it's hard to uh, give a name to like uh, this step definition, but we should group them all uh, not repeat to not repeat ourselves. So uh, as, a, as a whole scenario, if a whole scenario is repeating in within other scenarios, uh, it's a basic, it's a basic uh, scenario thing that you can do, it's data driven. So we can use scenario outlines in our uh, scenario definitions. So scenario outlines gives us uh, some flexibility uh, to, to write our scenarios uh, in data-driven way. Also, you can group steps into one step definition if it recurs one more time. I think we are uh, behind the time, but my presentation 
is over here. I just want to advise you a book, lastly, that I like uh, and get support to prepare this to you. Uh, I absolutely recommend you to read this book. Thanks for attending and listening to me. Hope you enjoyed this and get some stuff for uh, your daily work. All right. Thank you so much, Mehmet. Um, it was a pleasure having you here. So we are a bit ahead of schedule. So um, that's uh, not a bad thing always, but yeah, maybe we can have like the questions later and you can answer in the Q&A session a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. But for now, as I said, thank you so much. We will see each other like shortly. Um, and yeah, furthermore. I will be waiting for the uh, Q&A session. Thank yeah, sure. Much. Yeah. All right. Let me just get you out and then we can announce the next speaker, which is, um, I'm really looking forward to that, the uh, Automation Panda, Andrew Knight. Um, so, hi, Andrew. How are you? Yo, I'm doing well. How are y'all? Doing good as well. So, I'm really looking forward to your talk. So, um, yeah, let's, I don't know, let's jump maybe right into it. And then we have like a lot of time for the Q&A session later. So, I'm not sure. You can start sharing your slides, I think. Yep. So it should be sharing. Can you see it? Uh, I cannot right now. Okay. Um, this permission. Hold on one second. Technical oh, difficulties. Oh my gosh. I mean, this uh, wouldn't be a conference if there wouldn't be technical difficulties. Tell me about it. Okay. Um, security and privacy. Looks like I need to enable Chrome to share the screen. What the heck? One moment, folks. I'm so sorry. No worries. It has it already. All right. Meanwhile, I hope you all enjoyed the conference so far. I think we had some great speakers and there's some more to come. And um, maybe you can write in the chat what you liked so far the most. Till we have Andrew back here. I think he has to enable his... Um, settings probably he's using a mac as well because like i think i know what's going on so yeah uh maybe a question to you guys how do you like the conference what was the most interesting part for you so let's wait no one actually gonna talk about anything so maybe i can start so I really like the, like, uh, there are so many topics covered today. Um, I had a chance to look into a few talks and I'm really impressed by all of the speakers. And I'm going to have a talk uh, as myself as well. So uh, it's, it's really great. Oh, we have some answers here. So the UX testing until now. Yeah, UX testing is a really interesting topic. Um, Visual testing. Visual testing is also like pretty new, I guess. Yeah, visual testing, UX testing. I'm, I'm not sure if there will be more UX testing and visual testing um, tomorrow in the senior track. But those are actually topics I think most companies are right now adopting um, and are really like kind of showing up in the trends um, and I'm also happy to see more of those and we have Andrew back. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Oh my gosh. Were y'all just talking about visual testing or something? Yeah, we were talking about visual testing because, uh, oh you know, Apple God. tools. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So yeah, maybe let's start, just jump right into your talk. Uh, we let's can do see it. the screen. Everything is working fine. So have fun, everyone. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jonas, for introducing me. Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending my talk here at QA Global Summit 22. I want to thank Geekle for inviting me to speak at this thing yet again. And I'm super excited, whether we want to talk about screenplay or later talk about visual testing and Apple tools, I'm here for it. So my name is Andrew Knight, or Pandy for short. I am the automation panda. I love testing, software development, all those cool things. So be sure to read my blog, automationpanda.com and follow me on Twitter at AutomationPanda. 
I am also a freshly minted developer advocate at Apple Tools. So that's probably why y'all were talking about that. Um, if you don't know, Apple Tools provides visual testing tools to help make your apps look visually perfect. It's really cool stuff. I've, I've gotten my hands on it the past couple of months. I absolutely love it. If you want to give it a try for yourself, note that you can register on the Apple Tools website for a free account. So there's no reason why not to give visual testing a try. Why I'm here today is because I am also the lead developer for Boa Constrictor, which is the .NET screenplay pattern. So today I'm going to introduce y'all to the screenplay pattern as a new way of automating interactions. Now the screenplay pattern isn't exactly new. It's been around for quite a few years, but it's still new to a lot of people in our industry. I strongly believe that screenplay is a much better way to interact with web pages than the traditional page object model. So in this talk, I'll back up my claim in three parts. First, I'll cover problems with traditional ways of automating interactions. Second, I'll explain why the screenplay pattern is a better way. And third, I'll show how to use the screenplay pattern in C Sharp with a library named Boa Constrictor. <laughs> so to start, let's define that big I word that I kept tossing around, interactions. Simply put, Interactions are how users operate software. For this, work, for this talk, I'll be focusing on web UI interactions, like clicking buttons and scraping text. Interactions are indispensable to testing. The simplest way to define testing is interaction plus verification. That's it. You do something, and you make sure it works. Think about any functional test case you've ever written or executed. Test case was a step-by-step -step procedure in which each step had interactions and verifications. Here's a quick example. Simple DuckDuckGo search test. DuckDuckGo is a search engine just like Google, Yahoo, Bing, whatever. Steps here are fairly straightforward. Opening the search engine requires navigation. Searching for a phrase requires entering keystrokes and clicking the search button. Verifying results requires scraping the page title and result links for the new page. And if we notice, oops, interactions here are everywhere. Everything we're doing is an interaction. Unfortunately, our industry struggles to handle automated web UI interactions well. Even though most teams use Selenium WebDriver and their test automation code, every team seems to use it differently. There's lots of duplicate code and flakiness too. Let's look at the way many teams evolve their WebDriver-based interactions. I'll use C-sharp for the coding examples, and I'll continue to use that DuckDuckGo search engine example. When teams first start writing test automation code using Selenium WebDriver, they frequently write raw calls. Anyone familiar with WebDriver's API would probably recognize these calls, regardless of the language. The web driver object is initialized using, let's say, a Chrome driver for testing Chrome browser. The first step to open the search engine calls driver.navigate.gotoURL with DuckDuckGo's website address. The second step performs the search by fetching web elements using driver.findElements with locators, and then calling the methods like sendKeys and click. The third step uses assertions to verify the contents of the page title and the existence of result links. Finally, at the end of the test, WebDriver quits the browser for cleanup. Like I said, these are all common WebDriver calls. Unfortunately, though, there's a big problem in this code. Race conditions. There are three race conditions in this code in which automation does not wait for the page to be ready before making interactions. WebDriver does not automatically wait for elements to load or for titles to appear. Waiting is a huge challenge for web UI automation, and it's one of the main reasons for flaky tests. Now, you could set an implicit wait that makes calls wait until target elements appear, but they don't work for all cases such as the title in race condition number two. Explicit weights provide much more control over waiting and timeouts. They use a web driver wait object with a preset timeout value, and they must be placed explicitly throughout the code. 
Here, they're placed in the three spots where race conditions could happen. Each wait.until call takes in a function that returns true when the condition is satisfied. These waits are necessary, but they cause new problems. First, they cause duplicate code because web element locators are used multiple times. Notice how search form input homepage is called twice. Second, raw calls with explicit weights make code less intuitive. If I remove the comments from each paragraph of code, what's left is arguably a wall of text. It's difficult to understand what this code does at a glance. To remedy these problems, most teams use the page object pattern. In the page object pattern, each page is modeled as a class with locator variables and interaction methods. So a search page class could look like this. At the top, there could be a constant for the page URL and variables for the search input and search button locators. Notice how each has an intuitive name. Next, there could be a variable to hold the web driver reference. This reference would come via dependency injection through the constructor. The first method would be a load method that navigates the browser to the page's URL. And the second method would be a search method that waits for elements to appear, enters the phrase into the input field, and clicks the search button. This page object class has a decent structure and a mild separation of concerns. Locators and interactions have meaningful names. Page objects require a few more lines of code than raw calls at first, but their parts can easily be reused. The original test steps can be rewritten using this new search page class. Notice how much cleaner this new code looks. The other steps can be rewritten too, if we had a result page. Unfortunately though, page objects themselves suffer problems with duplication in their interaction methods. Suppose a page object needs, to, needs a method to click an element. We already know the logic. Wait for the element to exist and then click it. But what about clicking another element? This method here is essentially hard-coded for one button. We need a second click method to click that other button. If we notice, the code for both methods is basically the same. And the code will be the same for any other click method that we'd want to add. This is copy pasta, and it happens all the time with page objects. Personally, I've seen page objects grow to be thousands of lines long due to duplicative methods like these. That's, at this point, some teams will say, well, you got problems with duplicate code? We can solve that with more object-oriented programming. And they'll create the infamous base page, a parent class for all other page object classes. The base page will have variables for the web driver and the wait object. It'll also provide common interaction methods, such as this click method that can click on any element. Abstraction for the win, right? Child pages will inherit everything from the base page. Child page interaction methods frequently just call base page methods. I've seen many teams stop here and say, eh, chub blah, this is good enough. Unfortunately, this really isn't very good at all, in my opinion. The base page helps mitigate code duplication, but it doesn't solve its root cause. Page objects inherently combine two separate concerns, page structure and interactions. Interactions are often generic enough to be used on any web element. Coupling interaction code with specific locators or pages forces, every, forces testers to add new page object methods for every type of interaction needed for an element. Every element could potentially need to do a click, to get the text, to check if something's displayed, or any other type of web driver interaction. That's a lot of extra code that shouldn't be necessary. The base page also becomes very top heavy as testers add more and more code to share. Most frustratingly, the page object code I showed here is merely one type of implementation. What do your page objects look like? 
I'd bet dollars to donuts they look different than mine. Page objects are completely freeform. Every team implements them differently. There's no official version of the page object pattern. There's no conformity in its design. Even worse, within its design, there's almost no way for the pattern to enforce good practices. That's why people argue over things like whether page object locators should be public or private. Ugh. Page objects would be better described as a convention than a true design pattern. There must be a better way to handle interactions. Thankfully, there is. Let's start by taking a closer look at how these interactions happen. First, there's someone who initiates the interactions. Usually, this is some sort of user. They're the ones making the clicks and taking the scrapes. Let's call them the actor. Second, there's the product under test. For our examples in this talk, that's a web app. It has pages with elements. Web page structure is modeled using locators to access page elements from the DOM. Keep in mind, the thing under test could also be anything else, like a mobile app or a microservice or even a command line. Third, there are the interactions themselves. For web apps, they could be simple clicks and keystrokes, or they could be more complex interactions, like logging into the app or searching for a phrase. Each interaction will do the same type of operation on whatever target, page, or element it's given. Finally, there are objects that enable actors to perform certain types of interactions. For example, browser interactions need a tool like Selenium WebDriver to make clicks and scrapes. Let's call these things abilities. Actors, abilities, and interactions each have different types of concerns. We could summarize their relationship in one line. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. This is the heart of the screenplay pattern. In the page object convention, page objects become messy because concerns are all combined. The screenplay pattern separates concerns from maximal reusability and scalability. If there's one thing you remember from this talk today, actors use abilities to perform interactions. So let's learn how to screenplay using Boa Constrictor. Boa Constrictor is an open source C Sharp implementation of the screenplay pattern that my former team and I developed together at Precision Lender. It is the cornerstone of Precision Lender's end to end test automation solution. It can be used with any .NET test framework, like Specflow or NUnit. The project has a pretty good doc site hosted on GitHub pages. The GitHub repository name is Q2eBanking slash Boa Constrictor. Note Q2 software bought Precision Lender. And the NuGet package name is boa.constrictor with title caps. So let's rewrite that DuckDuckGo search test from before using Boa Constrictor. As you watch this talk today, I recommend just reading along with the code as it appears on the screen to get the concepts. Trying to code along in real life might be a little bit challenging. But after this talk, you can by taking the official Boa Constrictor tutorial. That's the best way to learn hands-on. To use Boa Constrictor, you'll need to install the Boa Constrictor, REST Sharp, and Selenium WebDriver NuGet packages. My example code will also use the Fluent Assertions library, and it'll use Chrome Driver and Chrome as the target browser. Let's get started with the actor. The actor is the entity that initiates those interactions. All screenplay calls start with an actor. Most test cases need only one. The actor class optionally takes two arguments. First is a name, which can help describe who the actor is and will appear in logged messages. The second is a logger, which will send log messages from screenplay calls to a target destination. Loggers must implement Boa Constrictor's iLogger interface. And this console logger here is a built-in class that will log messages to the system console. If you want, you can define your own loggers by implementing iLogger. Next, abilities. 
abilities enable actors to initiate interactions. For example, an actor needs a Selenium web driver instance to click elements on a web page. Read this line in plain language. The actor can browse the web with a new Chrome driver. Well, constrictor's fluent-like syntax makes this call chains very readable. Actor.can adds an ability to the actor. Browse the web is an ability that enables actors to perform web UI interactions. Browse the web dot with provides the web driver object that the actor will use, which in this case is a new Chrome driver object. Bow constrictor supports all browser types. All abilities must implement the iAbility interface. Actors can be given any number of abilities. Browse the web simply holds a reference to the web driver object. Web UI interactions will retrieve this web driver object from the actor. Before the actor can call any web driver based interactions, the web pages under test need models. These models should be static classes that include locators for elements on the page and possibly page URLs. Page classes should only model structure. They should not include any interaction logic. The screenplay pattern separates the concerns of page structure from interactions. That way, interactions can target any element, maximizing code reusability. Interactions like clicks and scrapes work the same regardless of target elements. The search page class here has two members. First, a URL string. Secondly, a locator for the search input. Notice that a locator has two parts. First, it has a plain language description that will be used for logging. Second, it has a query that is used to find the element on the page. Boa Constrictor uses Selenium Web Drivers by queries. For convenience, locators can be constructed using the statically imported L method. The screenplay pattern has two types of interactions. The first type of interaction is called a task. A task performs actions without returning a value. Examples of tasks include clicking an element, refreshing the browser, and loading a page. These interactions all do something rather than get something. Boa Constrictor provides a task named Navigate for loading a web page using a target URL. Read this line in plain English. The actor attempts to navigate to the URL for the search page. Again, Boa Constrictor's fluent like syntax is very readable. Clearly, this line will load the DuckDuckGo search page. <laughs> Actor.attempts2 calls a task. All tasks must implement the iTask interface. When an actor calls attempts2 on a task, it calls the task's perform as method. Navigate is the name of the task, and dot to URL provides the target URL. The navigate task's perform as method fetches the web driver object from the actor's ability and uses it to navigate to the given URL. Search page.url comes from the search page class we previously wrote. The second type of interaction is called a question. A question returns an answer after performing actions. Examples of questions include getting an element's text, location, and appearance. Each of these interactions returns some sort of value. Boa Constrictor provides a question named value attribute that gets the value of the text currently inside an input field. Read this line in plain English. The actor asks for the value attribute of the search page's search input element should be empty. Actor.asking for calls a question. All questions must implement the, you guessed it, I question interface. When the actor calls asking for or the equivalent asks for method, it calls the questions request as method. Value attribute is the name of the question, and dot of provides the target web element's locator. 
The value attributes request as method fetches the web driver object, waits for the target element to exist on the page, and then scrapes and returns its value attribute. The biggest difference between a question and a task is that a question returns something. Hence, it has a request as method. Search page dot search input is the locator from the search input field. It comes from that search page class. Finally, once the value is obtained as an answer, the, the test must make an assertion on it. Should be empty is a fluent assertion that verifies that the search input field is empty when the page is first loaded. Test case next step is to enter a search phrase. Doing this requires two interactions, typing the phrase into the search input and clicking the search button. However, since searching is such a common operation, we can create a custom interaction for search by composing the lower level interactions together. The search duck.go task takes in a search phrase. In its perform as method, it calls two other interactions, send keys, and click. Using one task to combine these lower level interactions makes the test code more readable and understandable. It also improves automation reusability. Read this line in plain English now. The actor attempts to search DuckDuckGo for Panda. That's concise and intuitive. The last test case step should verify that result links appear after entering a search phrase. Unfortunately, this step has a race condition. The result page takes a few seconds to display result links. Automation must wait for those links to appear. Checking too early will make the test case fail. Boa Constrictor makes waiting easy. Read this line in plain English. The actor waits until the appearance of result page result links is equal to true. In simpler terms, wait until result links appear. <laughs> Waits until is a special method. It will repeatedly call a question until the answer meets a given condition. For this step, the question is the appearance of result links on the result page. Before links are loaded, this question will return false. Once links appear, it will return true. The condition for waiting is for the answer value to become true. Bell Constrictor provides several conditions out of the box, such as equality, mathematical comparisons, and even string matching. You can also implement custom conditions by implementing the iCondition interface. Waiting is smart. It will repeatedly ask the question until the answer is met, and then it will move on. This makes waiting much more efficient than hard sleeps. If the answer does not meet the condition within the timeout, then the wait will raise an exception. The timeout defaults to 30 seconds, but it can be overridden. Many of Boa Constrictor's WebDriver-based interactions already handle waiting. Anything that uses a target element, such as click, send keys, or text, will wait for the element to exist before attempting the operation. We saw this in some of the previous example code. However, there are times when explicit weights are still needed. Interactions that query things like appearance or existence do not automatically wait. The final step is to quit the browser. Boa Constrictor's quit web driver task does just that. If you don't quit the browser, then it will remain open and turn into a zombie. Always quit the browser. Furthermore, in whatever test framework you use, put the step to quit the browser in a cleanup or a teardown routine so that it is called even when the test fails. And there we have it, our completed test using Boa Constrictor's screenplay pattern. All the separated concerns come together beautifully to handle interactions in a much better way. The screenplay pattern can also be used for more than web UI interactions. Built in, it supports REST Sharp for REST APIs. Let's quickly step through a REST API test. The actor is the same as before. To call REST APIs, the actor needs an ability named call REST API. It uses a REST Sharp REST client 
with a base URL. For this test, we'll use a public API called Dog API, which returns random pictures of dogs. One actor can have multiple abilities, as long as each ability has a different type. Boa Constrictor uses REST Sharps REST request objects directly, which specify resource path and HTTP method. To call the REST API, Boa Constrictor uses this call. The actor calls the REST request, <laughs> and it uses that given request object. We can then check the response object for the response code and potentially other data. This test is quite basic, but Boa Constrictor can do some advanced tricks too, like downloading files, dumping responses, and automatically deserializing response bodies. REST API interactions may also be composed with web UI interactions. As we said before, the screenplay pattern can be summed up in one line. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. It's really that simple. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. For those who are really into object-oriented programming, the screenplay pattern can be seen as a solid refactoring of the page object convention. Solid refers to five design principles for maintainability and extensibility. Now, I won't go into detail about each principle here because information is a bit dense. But if you're interested, snap a quick screenshot and check these out later. Wikipedia has some excellent articles. You'll find that the screenplay pattern covers each one nicely. So, why should you use the screenplay pattern over the page object convention or making raw web driver calls? There's a few key reasons. First, screenplay pattern, specifically Boa Constrictor, provide rich, reusable, reliable interactions out of the box. Boa Constrictor already has tasks and questions for every type of web driver based interaction. Each one is battle hardened and safe. Uh, the team at Precision Lender uses Boa Constrictor to run upwards of 10,000 end-to-end test iterations on a daily basis. <laughs> so when I say this thing is battle-hardened, I mean it. Second, screenplay interactions are composable. Like we saw with searching for a phrase, you can easily combine interactions. This makes code easier to use and reuse, and it avoids lots of duplication. Third, the screenplay pattern makes waiting easy using existing questions and conditions. Waiting is one of the toughest parts of black box automation. Fourth, screenplay calls are readable and understandable. They use a fluent-like syntax that reads more like prose than code. Finally, the screenplay pattern at its core is a design pattern for any type of interaction. In this talk, I showed how to use it for web UI interactions, but the screenplay pattern could be used for mobile, REST API, and other platforms. You can even make your own interactions too. Overall, the screenplay pattern provides better interactions for better automation. That's the point. This is not just another Selenium WebDriver wrapper. It's not just a new spin on page objects. Screenplay is a great way to exercise any feature behaviors under test. And as we saw before, the screenplay pattern isn't that complicated. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. That's it. That's the programming behind it with just some nifty dependency injection. <laughs> if you'd like to start using screenplay for your test automation, there's a few ways to get started. If you're programming in C-sharp, congratulations. Use Boa Constrictor, <laughs> the library I've been showing. If you're using Java or JavaScript, you can use Serenity BDD, which is a mature and complete test automation framework that includes a screenplay implementation. In fact, Serenity greatly influenced Boa Constrictor. But do keep in mind the two are separate projects. Boa Constrictor is not Serenity BDD for .NET. Instead, Boa Constrictor aims to be a simpler, standalone implementation of screenplay. If you're programming in Python, then hold on to your seats. Python is personally my favorite language, and I think it's one of the best languages for test automation. 
In my spare time, I've been working on a screenplay implementation. It would be like Boa Constrictor, but I think the code could be even simpler because it's Python. I don't have an ETA on when that can be ready, but if you really want it, reach out to me. We can try to make it happen. If none of these suit you, you could create your own. Screenplay does require a bit of boilerplate code, but it's worthwhile in the end. You can always reference code from Boa Constrictor and Serenity BDD because they're open source projects. If you want to learn more specifically about Boa Constrictor, please visit our doc site. It provides thorough information about the project and the screenplay pattern. I recommend taking that hands-on tutorial I mentioned earlier so you can develop a test automation project yourself with Boa Constrictor. The tutorial covers both Web UI and REST API, like I showed here today. Also, since Boa Constrictor is open source, I'd love for you to help contribute. We've got a lot of stuff to get done. So thank you so much for taking the time to learn more about Screenplay Pattern and Boa Constrictor today. Again, I'm Pandy Knight, and I'm the Automation Panda, also developer advocate at Applet Tools. Be sure to read my blog, follow me on Twitter, and reach out to me if you'd like to join the Boa Constrictor project. Thank you. All right, thank you, Andrew. Very nice talk. So and I think we can just jump right into the Q&A session together with Mehmet. Uh, I hope he's here. Let's see, there he is. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a lot of questions. And please feel free to uh, write more. So maybe we can just start with the first one. So it's a question for Mehmet. How do you introduce BTT to a team that has not done proper refinement for a long time? Uh... Everything has a start, I think. <laughs> so, uh, firstly, uh, you should uh, encourage your colleagues uh, to make BDD. Uh, and uh, I, I actually uh, prefer a way uh, of doing workshops, BDD workshops, I mean, refinement workshops uh, in our uh, teams. And uh, that would reflect very well. Uh, I I don't I I uh, actually uh, if if it is the answer of the question, but uh, we should uh, begin with the uh, sessions. I mean refinement sessions. BDD uh, is perfect itself but uh, it is good in good hands. Uh, so before taking BDD in the first place, we should think about it and uh, there, there, there will be, uh, there should be so much complexity within itself uh, in BDD if there is no uh, refinement sessions and also uh, you also take a, take a step back from your BDD scenarios and look uh, what you write uh, on those scenarios and refactor your code and steps, step definitions uh, after all. all right, thank you. Yeah, I guess like training the team is always like a proper way to do it. Um, the next question I have is for Andrew. So is Boa Constrictor a creation by Automation Panda? Uh, yes and no. So the way Boa Constrictor started, it's a project that I started at my previous company, Precision Lender. Um, we were building a large scale test automation solution in C Sharp uh, with SpecFlow and with um, the web UI testing, so Selenium WebDriver, and we also added REST Sharp for REST API calls. And I started off, this is back in like 2018, you know, at the very genesis of the project using page objects. And I'd used page objects at a previous company too. And I realized very quickly, this, this ain't it, y'all. <laughs> this is not scaling. And so I um, had heard about screenplay. I had um, been, been told through articles of its benefits, but I never tried it myself. And the, the major screenplay implementation at that, at that time was Serenity BDD, which was Java and JavaScript. So I'm like, well, I'm stuck in C-sharp. 
let me make my own. And so internally at Precision Lender, we created our own um, screenplay implementation. And I was lead on that project. At that time, I was the only test automation person there. I was the only SDET. And so um, you could say like, yeah, I, I kind of created Ball Constrictor, but the screenplay pattern originated before me. I learned about that from others. And um, it was a project by my company, right? It was originally proprietary. And then uh, um, it was in, gosh, October of 2020 that we decided to release it publicly as open source rather than keep it proprietary. So it's still managed to maintain technically by um, Q2 software, but I'm still the project lead, even though I'm now at Apple Tools and uh, we're looking forward to a bright sunny future. Yeah, all right. And maybe there's a follow-up question as well. Um, so screen blade pattern looks friendly to use. Um, how were the performance of tests using like page, or page object and screen blade pattern? That's a great question. So I don't have any benchmarks to share on that. But what I can tell you is that the performance hit you're going to find with web UI testing or any kind of black box testing is not going to be from any sort of like minute detail within your compiler or if you're using one pattern over the other. Um, the, the main performance drags are going to be your, your wait times on your website. <laughs> so I could confidently say, even though like I don't have like huge implementations to benchmark together, your, your performance hit is going to be like not an issue at all. Like, I don't even know if there would be a performance hit using screenplay versus page object. Um, of anything, because screen because screenplay and specifically bow constrictor it, um, by design encourages you to use better weighting, <laughs> your tests will most likely, from an implementation standpoint of how you design them, will probably be more efficient anyway, because by default, you're using better weighting, you're handling race conditions better than you would just willy nilly with page object or with your own raw calls. Yeah. All right. Yeah, very interesting. All right. Um, maybe get back to the talk to Mehmet. So thanks for the presentation question. How do you know if BDD is suitable for a project? How do you evaluate on that? Uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> But uh, it's hard to know. Uh, you can try BDD uh, as a methodology. Uh, so there should be some know-how within the team uh, about BDD. Uh, that it's it's it may not be the perfect one uh, for every time. Every time, but uh, we, sh for example, my at my previous company, uh, nobody uh, is aware of BDD and. We have re realized many BDD uh, refinements sessions and uh, workshops within uh, our team. And we realized that uh, we can do this BDD thing in whole our whole uh, department. So we decided that uh, to extend it uh, in other teams as well as mobile uh, teams. Uh, so uh, th that's hard to change people or uh, culture uh, in your company, but there is a way to do it. Uh, please uh, don't, do not forget uh, making refinements. Uh, refinements make the things uh, better. So uh, that you can put a uh, put an automation code in, in the middle of your software, but uh, as far as that's not meaningful for the uh, people, it doesn't make sense. So you should make refinements first. I yeah. uh, that's my opinion. I guess you're right. There, refinements is like very important for uh, you can give that as a general advice i would agree on that um yeah so apparently a lot of questions to you andrew so um, <laughs> next one no is can we make a request to the api that requires authentication basically all auth yeah sure not a problem um rest sharp has built-in support for all sorts of authentication whether it's basic or token bearer or OAuth or whatnot, 
Um, bulk, for boa constrictor, that's just pass through, right? Keep in mind with boa constrictor, it's, it's a design pattern of interactions. That is the main kind of concern it handles. So whatever types of interactions you want to handle, whether that's web UI, REST API, you know, if you want to, let's say, you know, you wanted to do like, um, like a command line and you add your own package or something. We've even talked about doing web UI with Playwright as a new set of interactions, right? All that is not handled by Boa Constrictor directly. That would be more of like the kinds of interactions that you handle or the tools that you're using as abilities in Boa Constrictor. So in this case, I would say, yes, we can because REST Sharp can. All right, perfect. Um, all right, and we have a question, I think for both you guys, um, or at least I think both of you can answer here. What is the best way to try and improve, improve reliability of tests in a sometime unstable test environment? I'm mm. eager to learn more about what you think about that. Who wants to go first? I went last, you go first, Mehmet, <laughs> then I'll take it. <laughs> okay. I think uh, in my honest opinion, uh, the first thing is following. Uh, you should follow the uh, running situations. You should not disable your tests when they fail. Please, uh, firstly, uh, discover why it's failing. Uh, that's the way. Uh, that's the way we can uh, do more reli reliable test automation uh, software projects. When when the uh, situations come to the flecky, uh, so. People try tend to be uh, skipping things. Uh, so the failed scenarios I, I heard lots of times uh, failed to skip the failed scenarios, but that's the not not the best way. Please left it as failing in your uh, if if it is not breaking your pipeline. By the way. Uh, left them uh, failing in your uh, test repository. After some time, or if you have time to uh, discover what's going on, uh, please do some work on it and uh, discover why it's failing. This That's the main reason that the flaky tests are uh, appearing on our pipelines or any other running test automation. So Mike, what about you? Alrighty, so I'll take a swing at this. I agree with what you said. Um, you've got to figure out why, what's the root cause? Because if your tests are failing for whatever reason, that's information provided as feedback to you and your team that there's a problem somewhere. Is it a problem in the product? Is it a problem in your environment? Is it a problem in your automated test? There's a problem somewhere. Don't gloss over that. Don't ignore it, figure out what the problem is. So if we're specifically talking about an unstable test environment, again, I would ask, well, what is making it unstable? Is there some sort of problem in the infrastructure or the resources or how we configured some policies for security? Let's try to straighten that out, right? Because if, if you're going to have an unstable test environment, then you're not going to be able to get good results no matter how stable your tests are, right? Let's, let's fix that. If that's the problem. Let's, let's fix that. Now, I understand sometimes... Um, like web app performance can be a little slow for whatever reasons, because the time of day or some dark energy going on, who knows, right? So to handle those kinds of issues, there, there are ways you can build in um, resiliency and reliability into your test suites as well, not to mask the issue, but rather to note the issue, log a morning, and keep moving so that you as the human don't have to come back later and rerun it. Um, you can handle it at the interaction level. For example, if you're doing like, you know, if you try to click a button and it's not taking, maybe you could have some immediate retry logic to be like, let me retry that interaction real quick. Well, I had to do this pretty frequently actually years ago when I worked at NetApp doing uh, operating system testing because our SSH sessions would just randomly crash. And it's like, what the heck, guys? So we would, you know, 
Let's try to reconnect real quick and keep going with the test log that we dropped. It most likely wasn't a product problem. It was just random whatever, right? So you could try it at the interaction level. Another thing you could do is you could try it at the, the test case level or the test suite level. And what I mean by this is if you have a, a test, let's say you have a, this most applicable for like large test suites. Let's say you have a suite of like a thousand tests or something and you're running them overnight or you're running them you know, a couple times a day. Um, with a suite that large, it's, it's a statistical probability that some test somewhere will have some sort of crash, right? Um, it, and not be necessarily because there's a bug, but because of all the factors that go into the fragility of automation. And when you see that one failure, it looks really bad. And you look at it and you're like, you try to rerun it and it passes. And you're like, well, something you could do at your test suite level is to say, anytime you have a failing test, immediately rerun it. Maybe rerun mm -hmm. it twice, maybe rerun it three times. Not to, again, not to cover it up, but to get more information. At my previous company, that's what we did. Anytime there's a test failure, immediately rerun that failed test twice. And so if it passes the following two times but failed that one time, most likely it was some sort of off the wall kind of thing. You know, not good, but we can keep moving because we have business objectives to meet. Um, but if it failed repeatedly, now you have a hard failure and you really should drill into that one. You should prioritize that kind of failure. So that's what I would recommend for handling unstable test environments. Yeah. All right. Yeah, very good advice, actually. So I like that. Um, next question. So again, for Mehmet, which are the biggest issues which you have seen when implementing BDD in the organizations where you have worked? Uh, the biggest issue, I think, the changing culture. Uh, it's, it's very hard, so much hard. Uh, so uh, making refinements uh, sessions and to, I mean, the people uh, should first uh, recognize you as a BDD uh, instructor or uh, influencer. So you should first uh, describe what the BDD is to your team and uh, make some negotiation <laughs> to make those uh, BDD sessions. So uh, that's the only hard way to make BDD. Uh, BDD is not a uh, way of doing automation uh, rather than any other tool like uh, selenium or any other stuff uh, that is discussed in here also uh, but we should uh, the people is the most obstacle uh, in our in my uh, work I mean the culture is so hard to change yeah Right, and maybe a direct follow-up question is, what is the role of a manual tester in BTD? Uh, there is no difference between manual tester and the automate, uh, test automation engineer in uh, BDD sessions. Uh, I mean, uh, when if you're realizing a, a refinement, uh, session so the tester is tester it it doesn't make any difference between them uh, also the refinements uh, some sort of manual testers are better than automators i i mean the uh, the uh, aspect their uh, aspects are different from us uh, I'm also a test automation engineer, but uh, some of manual testers, good manual testers, are uh, things different way, things in different way, and makes uh, the refinement sessions more meaningful. Yeah. All right. So and the other, what? I love manual manual testers. <laughs> 
Yeah, like I would call them not manual testers, I would call them human testers, right? So yeah. a manual tester is like always like such a, uh, not such a bad thing. Um, all right, so we have a lot of questions about features about screenplay. So um, if I program in JavaScript, can I use screenplay pattern? Yes, Serenity BDD has a JavaScript implementation. All right, next one. Can screenplay pattern be combined with Cucumber? Absolutely. In fact, uh, when I was building Boa Constrictor, we were using Specflow, which is BDD for .NET. Works very well. Perfect. Next one. You mentioned zombie browsers. Is there any garbage collector-like mechanism that would handle this? <laughs> Write a shell script after your tests are done to, to kill any processes. <laughs> that's that's just the way you have to do it. Sometimes yeah. you you interrupt your test suite in the middle because of whatever reason, and it leaves it. Have have a side process after the fact to go pew pew. All right. Um, okay. So I think we have three more. Um, so could we use this actor class as a class for step def definitions and therefore to write BDD tests? Do we use a tool such as Cucumber to translate the tests? Yep, yep. So this kind of goes back to the previous question. Yeah. Um, what I recommend is, first of all, I love BDD test frameworks. Um, I'm a Specflow fanboy, for example. Write your test in Gherkin. Then you would have like before scenario hooks to set up your actor and add the abilities. And then in your step definitions, pretty much your step definitions are going to be things like actor attempts to click, actor attempts to navigate, actor asks for this text field, actor. And then you have you could have things like, you know, search you know, a, a custom interaction in there. Yeah. All right. Yeah, a lot of questions about screenplay, I guess. Um, do you suggest any screenplay library for PHP? I don't know of any. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you want to, you could implement your own. Just follow the, the uh, boilerplate code. I guess so, yeah. It's open source. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's open source. That's why I open sourced it so other people could follow. It's true. That's the idea of open source, I guess. Um, Okay, so we have like we can get through all of the questions. Okay, so uh, maybe tricky one. So it looks like a copy of Selenite. Can you compare them? So I can assert Boa Constrictor is absolutely not a copy of Selenite because I've never even seen or used Selenite code. I've heard of the project. I know nothing about it. <laughs> um, can I compare them? I can't, but I'm sure if you looked at it, you could go boom, boom, look side by side, and you'll see similarities and differences. All right. Last question for the session. So I imagine with the screenplay pattern, the number of interaction classes would get very large. Do you have any suggestions on how to organize and find them? Great question. So when I first started out, I had the same fear as well. Um, honestly, though, it didn't grow as quickly or as, as bad as I thought it would. Um, at Precision Lender, uh, when I left, they had about 2,000 unique end-to-end -end tests and... Um, they would run those, you know, multiple times a day continuously and then full suite overnight on different configs. And honestly, the number of unique interaction classes, the tasks and the questions, we probably had order of magnitude only about 100. I would have thought it would have been a lot more for that large of a test suite. But what we found was the, the, the vast majority of times we were doing interactions were the built-in ones that we have written for web drivers. So things like bow constrictors click, the text. Um, the, the larger interactions, things like logging in or creating an opportunity, there, there were those and we use them frequently, but it wasn't like they were order of magnitude a thousand plus. We're, we're talking, you know, 50 to 100 for a project that large. Um, and we just, we used, you know, folder hierarchy to organize within a package. All right. And uh, now we have to stop the session here. So if you have any more questions, just... Um ask them and contact them directly. And thank you both for the session. It was awesome having you here. And uh, also I'm done with my moderation session. Uh, next up is the talk by myself actually. So looking forward to seeing you there. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Have a good one. See you. Hi everyone. And now we want to say thank you to our next sponsors at uh, Kabiton. Kabiton scriptless test automation makes automation testing accessible and scalable to teams with codeless test automation process. Automatically create test scripts by converting manual test sessions into scripts that can be executed on over 350 real devices. That's how you make it better everywhere. Identify common pitfalls, 
best practices and new innovations for test automation in the survey that we will post in the chat. And you will have the chance to win $100 US dollar Amazon voucher. Thank you, Kapiton, once again. And hello, everyone, again. Now it's time for our giveaway results. I'm just going to share my screen uh, with all the list of uh, comments that we got from our uh, post in YouTube. And I'm going to run it through random org. Just give me a second. OK. So here we go. We got 282 comments, as you can see. I'll just randomize it. I don't know, let's say five times. OK, one, two, three, four, and final one, five. OK, here we have an Instagram account, Iwa Sabolek. So I'm going to check if this Instagram account follows our page. Let's see. Um, unfortunately, we tried doing it uh, through laptop, but it's not possible. So we will have to check it only uh, through phone. OK, I'm entering the. Iwasa Bolek. Yes, it follows. Here it is, as you can see. Uh, I'm going to check if it follows a Geekle account as well. Was, yes, as you can see, it's right here. Okay, now we're going to check likes. Okay, I'm entering. Yes. Okay, this person seems like done with everything. I just gonna check if we have registered this person. Okay. Yes, and we have an email. Okay, I think you don't see my screen right now. Let me just share it once again to show you uh, that this person actually submitted uh, the form. I think I can just share this. Okay. Yes. Here it is. Just let me know if you see it. <laughs> OK, here is the email, Iva Sabolek. As we can see, the form is submitted. And Nick is currently checking if this person is registered for the event. Uh, so I know there uh, were questions. What we will do if we won't be able uh, to find the same uh, email in the list of participants in case the person was registered with another email? So the only condition is for us to be able to identify this person uh, by a name and surname. So I'm not sure if uh, this person is there in the chat. So if you are, please. Let us know. <laughs> we'll be happy to uh, greet you and to congratulate you with uh, the prize. And thank you, everyone, for your support, for your participation. Uh, we will uh, contact uh, the winner in, I think, uh, by today or tomorrow with all the details. So we'll know where, uh, like, which country is this uh, person for, from. So thank you everyone once again. I think we'll soon uh, hope to hear from our winner. So to show everyone that it's fair and clear and and we hope to see at least one post <laughs> uh, uh, from our winner with new gift. So thank you everyone. And now I think we can uh, have, I think like, Two minutes break before we proceed with our next moderator and Mike and Jonas, who you already know. So thank you everyone once again and see you soon.
Hey everybody, this is Mike, and sorry if you can hear an echo, I'm kind of in an undisclosed location place. But anyway, I am so super stoked to be here. This is my second QA summit, and I'm, man, I'm so excited. I don't know what to tell you. But anyway, um, I just want to let you know, I just can't wait to introduce my next uh, speaker. I think you know him, though. I think it's Jonas. I'm going to bring Jonas in. Man, you know what, dude? I was sitting there, and I was going like, wait, Jonas, wait. And I, I got the connection that you were just moderating. That was really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Like, uh, it was quite a busy day. And I, I actually I looked into a lot of talks and I love moderating as well. And But I'm now I'm happy to be sitting on the other other side as well. So um, that's really yeah, let's cool. See. Just, just, a, just a quick rundown. What was the like the best thing that you saw today? I'm sure you saw some really amazing speakers, right? I don't know. I don't think there's anything to put like as the best talk uh, i yeah. love the ux mm -hmm. sessions as well because like i have a background with my bachelor's in user experience so i was really interested in that um but overall all of the speakers were great so i don't think i can i can point the finger on any one of those right right i agree with that but anyway okay so here we go so hey what are you gonna talk to us about today what do you got going on for us yeah so um i think there's like a a few speakers talked about it a bit already, but uh, yeah. I will especially talk about like challenges in modern UI automation and yeah. how to solve them, because I think it's a hot topic right now with all those kind of new AI developments going on. Right. Um, yeah, and I'm going to talk about like what AI actually is in the sense of like test automation, how it can solve problems and challenges and why there are actually challenges right now in UI automation. Um, and Normally, this is a topic for like uh, one, two, three, I don't know, a few days maybe, but yeah, uh, I will try to narrow it down. Yeah, Yeah, that sounds super amazing. I'll tell you what, I'm going to get off stage. I'm going to let you take it and I'll talk to you later. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, glad to see you again all um, now on the other side. So yeah, as I just said, I'm going to talk about modern challenges in UI automation. Um, so maybe i've not introduced myself um you've just seen my face so who am i actually um so my name is jonas or jonas whatever you would like to call me um i studied industrial engineering and management in Karlsruhe at the kit uh, originally with a background in uh, cybersecurity, and i'm organizer of some meetups some community groups and uh, the founder of ask ui um yeah so and yeah, maybe let's just jump right into the talk. So if we talk about UI automation and challenges in UI automation, I want to start, like, I think all of you know what the user interface is, but uh, I think it makes sense to clear some words here. Because if we talk about UI automation, I feel like we always talk about graphical user interface automation. And with graphical user interface, I mean things like uh, web applications, or mobile, Android, on smartwatches. We have a different kind of UIs going on in in cars even or on smart home devices. So the market is really evolving there. But you also have to consider voice user interfaces and um, also like text user interfaces like uh, command, lines and, command lines and stuff like that. Um, but we don't talk about that in the ta talk, although I feel like voice user inter interface especially will have a great or will be a, actually a great challenge to automate in the future um, with Siri and all of kind of new ways how you input data. So, yeah, um, let's see how the market will develop there. But today I'm going to talk about graphical user interfaces and the challenges uh, which are arising there. And... Maybe I also have to go back to like one of the problems there. So there are right now two trends going on in the test automation industry. Um, I'm sure you notice all of them by yourself, but I want to point them out again. So the one side is how we actually write our test cases. So there's BTD, there's like uh, classical code instructions, um, there is no code, low code, and whatever, and there is a large discussion about that. Um, but 
also, this is like the day for another talk. So this is one part of the story, how we actually write our test cases. And the other side where a lot of companies focus on is how we actually find the elements then. And UI automation, it's not necessarily test automation. UI automation is just used for test automation. Um, it's like always a combination of those two things. Like you have on the one side, the, the way how you write your tests and you, on the other way, how you find the elements. And um, a lot of challenges are on those writing test cases uh, thing, but I'm gonna focus on the other part, like on all of those kind of marketing terms, like self-healing tests, um, smart locators, AI, um, all of that kind of stuff. And I want to dig a bit deeper into actually how to function so you can know um, when to use what kind of approach. Um, and for that, I'd like to start with a brief introduction to how like the basic tester would find elements. And the best tester, in my opinion, is still the human tester. The problem with the human testers is only that they are not very fast and there might be errors sometime due to human like fatigue or something like that. Um, but the human tester, like how do they find elements? Um, they use the eye. So we always build like user interfaces for humans, for normal users. So, and our users of our applications we built, they always find the elements with, with their eyes. Like there's just no other way to put it. Um, and I will call that a visual selector here. Um, if I tell you, click on the login button, you would know what what I mean by that. Um, on the other hand, uh, a computer always like for a, for a computer, it's really hard to use like visual stuff, but there's a lot of developments going on there, but it rather uses like the document option model and you have uh, a tree of elements and uh, you find the element by a unique uh, path, which points to that specific element. And I will refer to that as a code selector. All right, and for code selectors, we all know XPath CSS selectors. And here, for example, there's a very ugly XPath. I mean, there are a lot of differs in there. Um, if you, for example, have an element, you can inspect, inspect it on the web and you have like your XPath going on in the DOM structure. And you can, for example, here on the right, see the XPath, which points to that specific element. And you can also find it by saying, okay, it's an input field with a specific ID, which is specified uh, by the developers when writing the, the program. Um, on the other hand, we also have like, um, like another attribute, which is widely used for our test automation, which are CSS selectors. Um, and CSS is basically uh, the way how we style those kind of elements. And so for styling one element, we, we need like to exactly know what kind of element we style. So that's why the CS selectors are also unique and can be used for test automation. Um, but okay, let's jump back. Um, but why are there actually challenges with that? So um, I don't know, like it's pretty straightforward. So you have like your DOM structure, you get the XPath, you get your selector and automating that and it works, right? So but uh, what I've seen is that there are a lot, of, a lot of flaky tests. There are a lot of things which are not so easy to automate, actually, if you really try it. And I want to clear or dig deeper, actually, why that is right now. And for that, I have one example case, um, which is Flutter. Um, I'm sure you all heard of it. Um, so Flutter is basically like a framework for developing platform independent, so for mobile, for web, and so on, uh, platform independent apps. And with the development, like with the like trend of making more cool, cool tools and giving more features to development, and Flutter is really trending in the last two years, as you can see here. Um, to actually be able to make all of those kind of platform independent development possible and to enable all this, they use some kind of technologies which make the lives of our, or like of test automation engineers basically really hard. So um, 
but this is not only the case. So there's another thing going on. Um, I'm sure you also heard of Bubble IO, and I don't know. There's there's many more no code platforms where you can build your code and stuff like that. And when you use those kind of platforms, you kind of always use like, or they use like kind of technologies which are like not really a way like which was back in the day used. So like straightforward HTML, you build your, your website, your static web page, whatever. So it's like really not so flexible and like it's, it's more flexible the development, but it's also harder to automate. And a few of those kind of things which we see is for example, Shadow DOM, um, everyone knows it. Um, and a lot of tools support it. So what is Shadow DOM? So I think we had Shadow DOM supports like in a few talks, which we're talking about, okay, Selenium 4 is supporting Shadow DOM out of box, I don't know, and so on. Um, but what is it actually? Why is it so hard to automate? Or why do we need actual um, support and automation of these? Um, and Shadow DOM is basically a subtree of DOM elements. Um, so you you can identify it if you look at like if you can see like the, the, the hashtag shadow root, um, which then opens a subtree. And because there is a subtree of the element, XPath selectors won't work there. So um, if you know that there's a shadow element going on, so this is like a tuner track. So you know uh, you are not very like you shouldn't use like the out of box XPath selector. And CSS selectors actually work there um, because they also find like use the unique um, element or just selector there, so you can use that. And Shadow DOM is not that hard. Like a lot of lot of tools support it basically out of the box, but you have to know that you cannot use like XPath selectors out of the box if you want to automate on them. And there's another thing going on, uh, which is iframe. Um, what is iframe? Uh, so iframe is basically if you embed another full document within a HTML document. So you can recognize this by like the tag iframe uh, before that. And then there's another full HTML document in it. And yeah, what's the difference between Shadow DOM and iframe? So basically it's Shadow DOM is only a subtree of documents which you get through a tag and iframe is like the whole new document inside there. And because there is a whole new document inside there, you're not able to use CSS selectors as well. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, I don't know, pretty challenging and there's a way to go around that. Um, and also like the same as for Shadow DOM, XPath selectors are not, like CSS selectors are not working there because it's no new document. XPath selectors are not working there, but there's a trick. Um, you can move with some automation tools and I know that Cypress and Selenium, you can do that. Um, it's basically like moving first into the new document and then using XPath and CSS inside the new document. And you can do that for those kind of automation tools uh, or automation. And the last one, uh, which I see commonly right now is uh, absolute automation nightmare. Um, it's Canvas. So what is Canvas? I'm, I'm sure you also heard of that. Uh, Canvas is basically if you render graphics into like a 2D plane in an HTML document. So, oops. Um, and because of that, you, you render stuff graphically. You can't use any selector there. Uh, XPath just fails. CSS also fails. Um, the best way to go around that is either you use coordinates to automate on that or you use AI technology, which I just shortly show you, or you use visual regression, which is not like a functional test, but rather we had some talks on that as well um, to see if there are any visual differences there. Um, yeah, and, and those kind of things, they are pretty much arising more and more in, in, in elements. And that's, I feel like the reason why a lot of uh, tools are trying to solve like the problems with selectors to make it more stable, more robust, um, to allow for those cases, which are hard to automate for beginners at least. Um, yeah, and 
therefore, a lot of people come up with uh, smart ideas and those smart ideas, they are called smart selectors. So what are smart selectors exactly? Um, and I'm sure you've all visited some kind of pages um, where they say, okay, we have smart selectors, we can, we can automate on everything um, and we find the elements. And I want to clarify what is actually meant by that. And one smart selector, um, it's, it's basically just a marketing term for new technologies to find elements. Um, and one is uh, OCR, optical character recognition. And it's widely hyped and we even use it, but I think there are some limitations to it, which are worth mentioning. Um, so what is OCR? OCR is basically AI for text detection. So you have a trained model, um, which sees basically visually text and can read the text and convert it into text. And if you use it on a screenshot, for example, you can recognize or you can search for a text on that screen and directly get the text on the position where it's located right now and use that for identifying the text element. Um, why do I say there are limitations? So first of all, um, it only works with text. So you don't have like OCR won't work with any icons or any like text is changing a lot. Um, you have different kind of translations going on. Um, and those are all like kind of cases where it's not like so nice to use. And there's also a case which I found really interesting, which uh, I learned like recently in an interview I, I had. Um, there was like one guy trying to automate um, some, ki some kind of calculations and they couldn't like find the element or address the elements normally in the UI. So they had to use like some visual identification and they tried OCR and it was a nightmare for them. Why? Um, because OCR has the problem that it's um, not always very um, precise. So for example, if you have like, uh, if you tier detects Apple, uh, it will detect like some kind of similar icons and stuff like that and try to merge it to the text you want. And if you want to validate in a calculator, for example, that exactly one number is calculated via OCR, it can happen quite frequently that this exact number is not recognized by the OCR correctly. And you should know that if you try to implement it. Um, but overall, it's a great thing because it's super platform independent. Um, but just for you to know, there are limitations and you should consider it when trying to implement or choosing the right technology for automation. Next smart selector, um, picture and picture search. Um, also very widely used right now. Um, there are smart adoptions of that, not so smart adoptions of that. Uh, basically what it does is you crop out some kind of image on a screen uh, and then use that image, like render it through the screen, uh, draw it there and look for this exact image on the screen. And if it matches, like if the pixel match, you know that the element is there and you can move the mouse on that position and click there. Um, problems, um, it's really not so great with some kind of resolutions going on if it's really pixel matching. And also you have to maintain the object repository because if you change the color of the button or whatever, um, it's not so easy to find the element uh, anymore with a classical picture and picture search. What's really great about it uh, is that you can use it on any platform you want to automate on. So basically you, you're not relying on technology based for automation. And this is like, you have to consider when uh, choosing a tool. Next, we also, I think this was also in the talk about Selenium. Um, one smart selector is like relations. Uh, or relational locators. Um, so this means basically if you try to find the element, you always try to locate the element based on another element, which is near the element you want to, you want to find. For example, if you, I don't know, type test in the text field below an email address, and then it would look for a text field 
which is below of some text. And I actually like, I really like those kind of selectors because you implicitly can test for uh, visual things like visual relations, which should be always there, which are not possible by classical XPF approaches. So for example, if you would move the text field away from those from that email text, it would be really hard like to to recognize this with like classical test automation. And you would need some visual testing on top of that. But if you use relational selectors, no problem. You your test will fail if those two move away. Um, I also, you need to know that. And the last thing um, is basically self-healing tests. So uh, what are those? Um, self-healing tests is basically if you have like one test and you, while executing the test, um, you use like, or you record some other selectors, uh, which will be a fallback mechanism for when the original selector will fail. So it will update the selector in the background and then it will click on like use another selector. Um, and this is like also like right now there's a trend of going with AI and a lot of people are using AI to actually make fallback mechanisms out of it. Um, and how it works is basically if you have um, a button with a classical selector, first time you execute the test, the image of that object is recorded and used for training a machine learning model um, so that in the future, the machine learning model can fall back in and use the, the training it had for finding the correct element. Um, but, but I'm wondering in this case, if you like, if there are so many ways of like trying to optimize selectors, if we, if we would even like if we need to have those kind of selectors in the first place, and if we shouldn't just try to find the elements like purely visually with a smarter approach. And um, yeah, so another thing uh, is like, because of that, like uh, I, I talked about um, relations and visual testing. So uh, I think if you heard like a few talks before that, um, Visual testing or visual regression testing, I think everyone knows right now what it is. Um, so I can go shortly over it. It's basically um, trying to find differences in two screens. So you have like a golden master, uh, which is your go-to screenshot of the UI. And then you like basically take on each uh, execution of your test, you make a new screenshot and map it on top of it and try to find like visual differences between those two screenshots and if there is a difference it gets highlighted and your test will fail and tell you okay so this element moved away and it's a great addition to functional testing um, and yeah so apply tools and so, like those are really large companies which are doing that um, yeah but I was I was here and I was I was asking the question is it really necessary to like make like a lot of fallback mechanisms for all of those kind of selectors and um, I think that in the future we will move away from those classical selectors which are technology dependent and I think it makes sense to do that because then you can automate basically on anything and that's where I come in with the outlook at AI. So how can AI actually help us with test automation and localization of elements and basically you, you want an AI to understand your UI uh, the same as we humans do. And this is actually a screenshot we took with, uh, like we started in university with that research project. Um, basically it's a, it's a model trained on all kinds of different UI elements. So there are a lot of classes going on. Um, and it doesn't like, it's limited to OCR or some kind of things. Basically you can train a model on any UI elements you have and it will be sufficient for finding those kind of elements. Um, and those works for icons. You can use like OCR um, with its limitations. You can uh, find buttons with it. And the great thing about this is um, you want UIs to look like similar because you want users to understand UIs. And this makes this machine learning task actually really easy or not so easy, but rather easy to implement because you, you want to, to have the user like a common understanding of UI. And so the AI can also learn how those elements look like. 
And actually on that screenshot, there's no look into the DOM structure at all. And it finds, for example, I highlighted on the top left, those element, it will mark this as a card. It will mark all the kind of icons there are. It will mark text, text fields. It will even like mark the icons of the operating system. And you can use those kind of description or to just move the mouse around. Um, just you as a human tester would look like, would use it. Um, this is one thing I think will solve a lot of problems. I think it makes more sense to not try to make a lot of, like, I, I think we need them right now because the AI is maybe not there where we want it yet. Um, but uh, I think in the future, there will be more of a technology independent solution, which will uh, try to understand your eyes just as we humans do. Um, and basically, this is the same technology as which is going on with like autonomous driving cars, where, where they are driving around and like drawing bounding boxes to, um, um, around like pedestrians and stop signs and stuff like that. It's the same technology adopted for uh, UI. And I think it makes total sense. Um, one limitation is, of course, that it takes a lot of time to um, calculate those. Uh, images and to draw all the like to analyze it with AI because like it's running on a, on a GPU. Um, but I think with modern technology and like with the further developments, we will solve that problem as well. And now in the end, I think I want to talk about also like an outlook with AI, um, which I think is not adopted right now, but I think also they make a lot of sense. And it's not that much about object detection, but rather like a overall development going on. So um, first of it, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's visual question answering. So visual question answering um, is basically a technology which is arising right now but more on the research side of thing and i think it will help ui automation or at least like ui test automation um huge um, because basically what you do is you map questions to images and you train on that an ai um, for example here on the left you have uh, image with like a bike uh, sitting um, a woman and a girl walking on the street and then you really ask a question, um, is the girl walking the bike? And the AI will tell you yes or no based on that image. Um, and I think this makes total sense to adapt on UIs because you can start asking questions like, are there shoes on the screen? Or is there, um, I don't know, like for a web shop, other shoes, or is there uh, the logo on the top left? And it will tell you yes or no. And you don't have to um, like look at it like kind of manually. And you can ask like for every screen, like some kind of questions if it's visually there where you want it and if the re relations are correct. And I'm re really looking forward to have this kind of technology. Um, and the other thing is uh, GPT-3. Um, GPT-3. Uh, I think you also heard of it, like it's uh, also AI development going on. Um, and what GPT-3 is, I think will change the way how we write tests. Uh, right now there's this discussion I mentioned with like no code, low code and um, code tools. And you want to have like every people trying to write the best automation, like, like everyone shall be able to, to write uh, automation code. Um, and GPT-3 is basically, you just give it like a normal sentence and it tries to make sense out of it. And here the example, I hope you can read it, um, was you ask an AI if it can come up with some great startup ideas. And it came up with good idea, help people draw plans for their dream home and then help them find contractors to build it, which is really awesome as a result of it. We are not there yet that we can use it. Um, so... But I think like in the future, it will be like a technology which can understand like your normal human input and then use that based on that to, to go with like automation. Um, and that's it for my talk. Um, I hope you learned something. I was originally planning to do some demos, but I think we don't have time. So 
Um, thank you all for listening. Um, you can contact me on LinkedIn or whatever and ask more questions. Okay. Thanks, Jonas. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. We'll catch you again. I'm sure there's a lot of questions everybody has, but we'll get all those in the Q&A session. So thank you so much. That was super awesome. Talk nice. to you later. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> Hi, Kristen. How's it going? It's I'm, it's going well. How's it going with you? Oh man, you don't want to know. <laughs> we'll be here all day explaining that. We'll just we'll just get on. I saw your topic. I know we got to I know we got to get going and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, tell us a little bit about it. The power of negative API testing. That sounds like super cool. What yes. About? A API testing is super cool. And I yeah. really, really want more people to start using API testing because it is a way to interact with the business rules and the data store of your application without right. having to go through the UI. Right. That sounds super awesome, bypassing the UI. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go. I'm going to let you have it. But one thing before I go, I'm going to share your slides here. There they are. I'll talk to you later. And All right. uh, have a good talk. Yep, yep. Okay, hello everybody. I am Kristen Jackvoni and I am here to talk to you about the power of negative API testing. And I just need to figure out how to change my slides. There we go. Okay, a little bit about me. I am the principal engineer for quality at Paylocity, which is an HR and payroll software company. I am also a blogger at Think Like a Tester, which you can find at thinkingtester.com. I'm a LinkedIn learning course author. I have a course called Postman Essential Training, which is all about that API testing. And I am also the author of the brand new book, The Complete Software Tester, which talks about API testing and much, much more. It is available on Kindle through Amazon. You do not have to have a Kindle to read it. You can get the Kindle app and you can read it that way. All right, let's get started. So why should you know how to test APIs? Well, most software companies use APIs, which are application programming interfaces, to interact with the data stores of their application. So because software companies are using these APIs, they are going to expect that testers will be able to completely test those APIs. And it's important to note that running a request in an API and getting a 200 response code and saying, OK, it's good, is not completely testing an API. At the company Paylocity, where I work, we often hire new testers and we expect our testers to be able to test an API. So we actually give them a buggy API to test. And it's disappointing how many people we see who don't know how to do anything except just run the request and assert that they got a 200 back. So you definitely want to know how to test APIs so that you are more hireable, but also because testing APIs is important. What can happen if an API isn't tested properly? Well, a bunch of bad things. First of all, a malicious user could exploit a security vulnerability. Secondly, bad data could get into the database. An end user could be confused when their information isn't saved properly. And finally, the application could crash or slow down. So these are all of the reasons why you want to make sure that you are fully testing your APIs. So in my discussion today, I will be using a test application that I created to demonstrate how the UI and the API interact. And so you can find it at this link. And um, after my talk, I will also include it in um, the chat so that you can get it that way as well. And this is what it looks like. It's not going to win any design awards, but it, it's very simple. It's called the contact list app. And what you can do with it is you can create an account. And then once you have the account, you can start adding contact. And I also want to point out up at the top, it says the API documentation can be found here. Um, and that is where you can click to find out how the API works. So this is what it looks like in the contact list after you have logged in. You can see there's a list of contacts. You can click on them and you can um, update them. You can delete them. You can add new ones and so on. But of course, we are going to be interacting with the API rather than the UI. Um, and to do API interactions, I like to use Postman, 
Why do I use Postman for API testing? Well, the number one reason is it's free. There is also a paid version of Postman, and that is great for teams. That is what we use at Paylocity. Um, but for your own personal testing, as you are learning about APIs, you can use it completely free. Its visual layout makes API testing easy to understand. If you are first learning about how API testing works, I feel that it, this is really the best way to learn it and understand it. It comes with code snippets so that you don't have to memorize the test syntax. I like this because I can never remember what the syntax is to do anything. So um, what it has, and, and I'll show it to you a little later when I'm showing you some screenshots, there's a section called snippets and you can find the tests that you want to run, the test stubs. You can just click on that snippet and it will stub it out for you. And then you just have to make minor changes for your own particular test. It recognizes JavaScript, so all kinds of scripting can be used. So you can do pre-scripts and post-scripts. Um, it's, it's very, very robust in that way. And finally, it can run collections, test collections from the command line. So if you want to use it for API automated testing, you can do that. So if you go to the main page of that contact list app and you click on the um, link to get to the API documentation, this is what you will see. Um, so this is the documentation for the contact list API. And you can see that um, there's a couple different folders here and here's um, the add contact request. And there are also some um, samples here. And of course you can scroll down and you can see all of the different kinds of other requests that you can make. But in my opinion, the best way to really learn about how an API works is to actually run it in Postman. So up in the upper, upper right, there is a run in Postman button. And if you click on that button, then you can just um, upload your, the whole collection directly to Postman and then you can play around with it and you can see how it works. So, what kinds of negative tests can we run on APIs? Well, there are three main kinds of tests and they overlap a little bit as you'll see as we talk through them. So first there is the response code tests. So this is where you are doing some kind of an action and you are asserting that the response code you are getting in return is the response code that you were expecting. We can also do a lot of security tests and these are very important. So validating that only authorized users can get the um, uh, get the responses or excuse me, get the uh, data that they want in response, um, or that even if it's an authorized user, only a user with a certain number of permissions can get the data in response. Um, and finally, then there are input tests. Um, so input tests are when you're doing a post or a put request, so you are sending data to the database, making sure that that input is validated appropriately. So we're going to start talking about response codes now. Um, so you've probably heard of the 200 response code, which basically means everything went as expected, it was all okay. Um, but there are some other positive response codes like a 201, which means a new resource has been created. So for example, if you um, had a post request where you were adding a new resource to the database, you might get a 201 in response. And then there's also 204. That's where the request was processed successfully and no data was returned. So sometimes you might make a post request um, that doesn't return anything in response except the code, in which case that code might be a 204. And then we've got our negative response codes. So these are the ones that you get when something goes wrong. So the 400 level response codes are the ones where um, something has gone wrong with what the user is doing or what the client is doing. So a 400 level response happens if a user or client has incorrectly formed a request. So an example of this would be if somebody was doing a post request to add a new contact to the database and they didn't put in a last name, but last name was a required field, they would get a 400 in response. Then we've got a 401, which means the user is unauthorized to interact with this API. And then there's a 403, which is where the user is forbidden to view the resource. So the difference between a 401 and a 403 is with a 403, the user is allowed to interact with the API, 
but they're just forbidden to get whatever resource it is that they are requesting. Then there's also a 404. That means the resource was not found. So an example would be, I'm looking for a specific contact in, in my response and it's telling me that contact doesn't exist. So that would be a 404. Then finally, there's a 500 and 500 means internal server error. And generally the only time you want to get a 500 is when the server is literally not working. It's broken, you can't communicate with it. If you see a 500 response for something else, let's say in that example where I'm doing a post request and I've left out a required field, if I get a 500 in response, that means that the developer of the API has not adequately accounted for all possible errors that the user might make. So you would want to talk to the developer about that. So let's take a look at some ideas for response code tests. So first of all, we've got those happy path responses. So I could do a post request and I would want to validate that I was getting the correct response, which might be a 200, a 201, or a 204. I can also do that with my get request, any other request that I'm doing correctly and I should be getting an appropriate response. Then we've got our negative requests. So if I make a request that is incorrectly formatted or it has bad data, then I am expecting that I get a 400 in response. If I make a request without an authorization token, assuming one is required, then I would get a 401 in response. And finally, I could do a request for a resource that the user doesn't have permission to get. And in that case, I would get a 403 or a 404 in response. And you might be asking yourself, well, why would you get a 404 in response? And that is because sometimes developers like to add an additional layer of security to the API where they don't want a potentially malicious user to even know that a resource exists. So if I'm asking for a contact that I don't have permission to view, the developer might, instead of saying to me, oh yeah, that contact exists, you just can't see it, which would be the 403, they want to return to me, nope, that contact does not exist. So I'm not going to keep on trying to hunt for how I could get access to that contact. So here is an example of what it would look like in Postman when we are testing for the correct response code. So in this case, you can see that we're making a GET request and our endpoint is the contacts endpoint and then that long GUID after the contacts in the, the um, request URL is uh, the contact ID. So I'm looking for a specific contact with that contact ID. That contact ID doesn't actually exist. So you can see down at the bottom of the screen that you're getting a 404 not found response. And so that's what we want to assert on. We want to assert that when users are asking for a specific contact and it doesn't exist, that they get a 404 not found. So this is what that test looks like here in the middle of the screen. Um, so the title of the test is status code is 404. And then the actual assertion itself is expecting that that postman response will have a status of 404. And you can see on the right of this screen are snippets. I mentioned those earlier. Those are um, what you can use when you want to write assertions and you can't remember what the syntax of something is. So if you were to scroll down in those snippets, you would see that there is one called response code is 200. So you click on that, it populates the test field, and then you just have to change it to customize it for your particular test. So you would change 200 to 404. So let's talk about API security tests now. So many API requests require an authentication token to prove that the requester should be allowed access. You can imagine how bad it would be if we had banking APIs and people were making requests to see everybody's data and they could get in without any permission at all. That would be very bad. Some requests also require API keys, which identify which application is making the request. And then even if the requester has a token and an API key, they still might not have permission to view a resource. So there's actually three different levels of security that we can be checking here. So let's take a look. So first we'll talk about the token. So oftentimes when you're calling an API, you will do so with some kind of a token that allows the API to say, yes, 
this person has permission to view this resource or, or to interact with the API. So in this case, in the case of my sample app, I'm using a JSON web token, also known as a JOT. And that is that um, very long code here after the word bearer. So I'm passing that in in the header of my request. And in this case, it's a valid auth token. So I am getting a response. I'm getting a 200 OK in my response. And I am also getting data in my response, which is what I was requesting. So in this case, if I wanted to assert on this request, I could write a test that said that I that validates that I get a 200 in response. And it could also validate that I got data. I could test on specific data or I could test that I just got data in general. So here's an example of what it would look like if I was testing with no auth token. So you can see I've got no auth token here. I'm sending my request to get a list of contacts and I'm getting a 401 unauthorized in response with an error message that says, please authenticate. So in this case, I could write tests to make sure that I got a 401 in response. And I could also test if I wanted to that I got please authenticate in the message of the response. Here's another example. Now I'm testing with a not found token. So this token looks like it's valid, but either it's expired or it's just a token that I made up that was not a valid user token. And so once again, I should make sure that I'm getting that 401 unauthorized response and that error message, please authenticate. And here's an example of testing with an invalid token. So this clearly is not a valid token. Foo is definitely not a jot. So I've passed that in and I want to make sure that I get that appropriate 401 response. Okay, let's talk a little bit about API keys. So my test application does not have API keys. So I will just go through a little imaginary example of what an API key might be used for. So let's imagine that we have a banking application and the banking application uses several different APIs. One of the APIs is a customer API, one is a deposit API, and one is a notification API. And the deposit API has permission to call the notification API. So let's say, for example, if somebody made a deposit the um, application would want to trigger a notification to um, send out to that user saying, hey, you just deposited some money. So because the uh, customer, excuse me, because the deposit API has permission to call the notification API, that deposit API has got an API key associated with it. And when it calls the notification API, the notification API says, well, who's calling me? Do I have permission? Does this person have permission to do this? And they say, oh, I know it's that API that I'm allowed to work with. And so then it can go ahead and run the notification. However, let's say that the customer API does not have permission to call that notification API. So that customer API has an API key, but when it makes that call to the notification API, the notification API sees it and says, oh, that's not an API that we work with, and then it will reject the request. So for API key testing, we have some different ideas that we can try. We can try testing with a valid and authorized key, or we could try testing with no key at all. We could test with a valid key that's unauthorized. That would be the example of the API that doesn't have permission to call the other API. Or we could test with a completely invalid key, a key of foo. Or we could test, oh, and for all of those tests, then we would want to validate that the response code was either a 401 or a 403. So let's take a look at some access testing now. So access testing is, does the user have permission to access the resource? And so we have two different scenarios here. We've got a happy path scenario, which is, does the user have access to the resource? Yes, so the resource is returned in the response. But we also have the user does not have access to the resource. And in that case, the 403 or sometimes a 404 for added security is returned. So let's look at an example of that. So in my sample app, um, I've created two users. I've created user one and user two. 
And then for each of my users, they've each added a new contact to their contact list. So user one added contact one and user two added contact two. And now what I'm trying to do here is I am using the uh, jot of user two and I am trying to ask for user one's resource. I'm trying to ask for that contact ID one for contact one. And so what I should get in response is, no, you don't have permission to view that. So in this case, I'm getting a 404 um, and that is because of that added security. I don't want user two to even know that contact one exists. And the great thing about all of these security tests is that you can test them in combination. So we talked about three different things. We talked about tokens and API keys and permission. And so you could create a number of scenarios. The most obvious one would be a completely positive scenario where you've got the, a valid and correct jot, you've got a valid and correct API key, and the user, you, the tester, has permission to view the resource. And so in that case, if all of those three things are true, you should be getting data in the response. But you could test what happens if you don't have permission to view the resource, or what happens if you don't have a valid API key, or what happens if you don't have a valid token. Okay, let's go on to input testing. So here is why input testing is so important. Oops, there we go. I don't know why that went ahead. Here's why input testing is so important. It's because the rules that apply to the UI should match the rules that apply to the API because if they don't, bad things can happen. So some examples of this would be field type, character length, numeric value, field format, such as phone number or zip code, postal code, um, all of those validations should be the same between the UI and the API. And here's why. So let's look at a scenario where the rules don't match between the UI and the API. So let's say we've got um, a user who um, wants uh, is using the UI and they have there's a rule in the UI that says you can only have 20 characters in the last name. And then, the, but then the API has been miscoded and that's been coded so that it will um, accept 30 characters in the last name. And so what might happen there is if somebody is working with the API and they add that last name and they add a last name that has 30 characters, that's bad data that is now in the database. And then when a user who's interacting with the UI tries to view that resource, they might not be able to see it on the screen. There might be some problem with display. So that's what would happen if, they, if there was a mismatch in that one direction. Now let's take a look at the mismatch in the other direction. So let's say that the API has a rule that says the last name can only be 20 characters, but the UI has a rule that says the last name can be 30 characters. In that case, we might have somebody trying to add a new contact through the UI and they put in a 30 character last name and they, the uh, it's not failing in the UI because the UI will accept that 30 characters. But when that request goes through the API, it's rejected because the API says, oh, you've got too many characters. So now that input, that saving has failed and the um, end user might not know why that happened. There might not be an appropriate error message there. And then finally, there's one more very important reason why we want to make sure that the validation rules are enforced both by the UI and by the API. And that is because malicious users can circumvent application controls. So just because a malicious user can't do something in the UI doesn't mean that they can't find another way around it. So if they get access to the API and if they find ways to circumvent those rules that are in the UI because the API isn't locked down carefully enough, then they can get all kinds of bad data in the database. They might be able to get information that they're not supposed to see, et cetera. So let's take a look at some um, testing for um, that, well, various kinds of validation. So first we will start with testing for required fields. 
So in this case, I am making a request. It's a post request. I want to add this new contact to my contact list. And I am missing something important. I don't have the first name in here. And the first name is required. So I am expecting that I am going to get a 400 response that tells me that I am missing that required field. So let's take a look and see what happens. Yes, that is exactly what I get. I get a 400 bad request and then I get a series of errors. And you can see there in the bottom line, the most important here is path first name is required. So now I want to assert on this. I want to assert that when a user is going to be uh, making a post request and it's missing that required field that we get um, the appropriate response. So here's my assertion right here. So I've put it in the tests tab of my postman request. So I'm asserting on two things. I'm asserting that the status code is 400. And then I am also asserting that that first name error message is returned in the response. So I'm asserting on the text that comes back in the response and that it includes the text first name is required. So here is how we test for something like character limits. So in this case, I'm doing another post request and now I'm including a first name that has 21 characters in it. And my UI and API both require that you um, have no more than 20 characters for that first name. So I'm expecting that I'm going to get a 400 in response here as well and an appropriate error message. And so this is what I'm gonna test for right here. I'm going to assert that the response code has that status 400. And I'm also going to assert that the first name is that, that the message comes back that the first name is longer than the maximum allowed length. And now we could also test for formats. In this case, I'm doing a post request and I've got my first name and last name, and those are both the right length and they're there and they're required, but now I've got a bad birth date because there is no such thing as February 29th in 2021. So I am expecting once again that I'm gonna get a 400 response and that I'm going to get an appropriate error message. So this is what my assertions are going to look like. I'm asserting that the status code is 400 and I'm asserting that I get the message birth date is invalid. And finally, we can also do tests on the query parameters. So query parameters are what goes in the URL of the request. And so in this case, I'm doing a GET request and I'm asking for a specific contact. And we saw in an earlier example that the um, after the word contacts, I'm usually including a customer or excuse me, a contact ID. But right here, I don't have a contact ID. I just have foobar. I'm trying to uh, send in something bad to see what will happen. And so once again, I'm going to assert that I get a 400 in response. And I also want to check that I get an appropriate error message. And in this case, the error message is invalid contact ID. So I'm going to assert on that. So in summary, here are some ideas that you can test if you are presented with an API and asked to test it. You can begin with your happy path testing, asserting that the response codes for every request you make are correct. And then you can start making some negative requests and assert that all of those response codes are correct. You can test that a 401 or a 403 is returned if the required security keys or tokens are missing. You could test that a 403 or 404 is returned if the requesting user does not have access rights. You can test that an appropriate error message is returned if the data in the request violates validation rules. And finally, you can test that an appropriate error message is returned if the query something in the query parameters are not found. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Wow, that was really awesome, Kristen. I really enjoyed that because that is really important about testing the API side of it because, I mean, you're right. I mean, that needs to be isolated away. So that was a really excellent, excellent talk. Um, but I want to go ahead and now I think I'm going to bring in Jonas in here and um, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of your, your slides. Okay, cool. So you did that for me. Um, guys, I really appreciated your, uh, your both your talks. It was super, super cool and amazing. And we got a lot of questions in here, actually. So I think the first one is for you, Jonas, how UI meets QA. Can you kind of tell us 
what that is and everything. Yeah, so I think like this is a kind of a difficult question because like it's you can you could talk about a, like a few hours about it. I mean, what is QA about? It's like basically, I mean, it means quality assurance. So you want to have like a bug-free software and like uh, you want to make your software as good as possible so the users enjoy them, uh, enjoy it and everything kind of that user experience is part of QA and UI is basically like the part of the software where the user interacts with your software and inputs something and sees like the output. Um, and so it's a critical part of the software in end-to-end -end testing or like it's, which is mostly testing and end-to-end testing. So uh, I feel like it's a part of QA. It's like it needs to be tested, but it's like a sub part of QA basically. So um, yeah, and mostly it's done by visual testing or end-to-end -end testing if you test for functionality and it's part of that. And um, I think this is where they meet basically, yeah. Right, right. And so I have a question actually for you, Kristen, on that. So um, you, are you basically, when you test, you're kind of on the back end kind of testing the, with the API or do you also kind of test from the front end also? Well, I think I think it depends on what the application needs are. I mean, I've certainly done right. both. Um, so what, what I tell people when they think about, well, when should I be testing the API and when should I be testing the UI is right. You want to test business logic with the API. Um, you want to test um, various security rules with the API. With the UI, you want to test things like user workflows, like you know, get it going from beginning to end, logging in, doing something, putting it as, as something in the cart to buy it or whatever. You want to test things like, can this button really be clicked? Um, so you really just, you need to evaluate um, what it is you're trying to test and then determine which is the easiest way to test it, the easiest and most efficient way. Right, right. That's really awesome. That, that is such a great point there. Um, Jonas, here's another one for you now. How do you get started with smart selectors? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, a lot of, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question because, um, but I feel like it, it, will be, it will come to you as it is like right now because a lot of tools are trying to implement them. Um, for example, Selenium 4 has like a relative, uh, locators already and uh, if you're interested you can look at for example a helenium uh, which increases the stability of your selenium selectors um, mm. and all that kind of stuff i think it will come from that on and it makes sense to look like just have like a, your eye open to see like on new release notes um, to see like how to implement i don't know like a, a fallback mechanism and just to to look around in the industry like what kind of tools are implementing what. So I don't think there's like one go-to place. It's rather like keep your eyes open about new technologies on, in the market. Mm. Mm. And you know, this kind of leads up to uh, another one here. And then I'm going to ask you this also, Kristen, but Jonas, uh, what automated tools do you use for visual testing? I mean, there's so many out there, so many flavors. So, I mean, what ones should um, use? I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of apply tools. Um, mm -hmm. so I mean, it's, it's easily integratable. So, but, but I'm not the guy, like, I, I don't want to like put like one tool over the other. There are a lot of like mm -hmm. different kind of open source application. It depends on your use case, what you need and mm -hmm. like what your requirements are. If it's like performance, if it's, um, like in detail, if you have like, I don't know, there, there, there's a lot of things you have to consider when choosing a tool um if, what is your budget like are you working in a large company is it like a small company is it like a private project and so on um but a good starting point i think apply, apply tools is actually yeah not bad yeah uh, uh, and then i kind of want to ask you the same thing Kristen. so what kind of automation tools do you think that people should use especially like for the api testing Oh, okay. So um, there are a few different ways that you can go for automated API testing. And right. one of them I mentioned, which is you can use Postman for it. Um, Postman mm -hmm. has a, a tool called Newman, which enables mm -hmm. you to run your collections from the command line. Um, so that's really useful. And then you can integrate it with um, CI, CD. Um, another thing that we've been doing at my company is we've started using Cypress for UI testing, and we've discovered that Cypress is also really great for API testing also. 
So mm -hmm. we've been using that. Um, so those are just two examples. Then many other um, programming languages have plugins that, that you can add to um, whatever language you're in to have that easy API testing. I know Rest Assured is one such plugin, but I've never used it before. So there are a number of different tools out there. That's really awesome. Um, this is good information, guys. I know there's people out there right now going like, whoa, these are the kind of questions and the answers that I really needed. So really appreciate you guys spending this time here. Uh, Jonas, I got another one for you here. Um, so testing screen recordings. Okay, I didn't say this. It's a hell of a challenge. Okay. Do you have any advice about testing visually those recordings to make sure? And then part two is uh, here. Um, for example, are there any new cuts on the screen interaction recording properly? So kind of kind of fill us in on that. Give us yeah. an answer. Yeah. So uh, this is kind of an interesting question because like I don't know of a framework who does which does that right now, like like mm -hmm. testing for recordings. Um, I feel like visual testing could do that if you have like a high um, refresh rate on taking screenshots and what I mean by that is like basically a video is just a, um, like you have a lot of different kind of screens going on and there's like a high frequency between that and then you have like different kind of frames per seconds which like end up to video and what you would do or what I would do is I would uh, try to implement a framework which takes like a screenshot or a snapshot of the of the screen like every 100 milliseconds or what uh, and mm -hmm. define those uh, as a baseline and then like whatever requirements you have for like the video recording if you can even like take a um, some baseline of that but I'm sure that, that you should be able um, that take a baseline of like 100 milliseconds and then try to adopt the visual testing for the sequence of uh, screenshots you have mm. um, and then you can like basically make your video into like a sequence of snapshots or screenshots and then you can mm -hmm. test like the implementation but well, i i would have to check on into that like so yeah of course and and, and that that kind of brings up another one i have um but was this did you how do i get a copy of postman is it open source i'm just gonna go to my next question for both of you so how do i get a copy of it Oh, it's it's so easy. I think um, I think all you need to do is just go to like getpostman.co or .com, something like that, and and there you go. It's uh, really easy to get, and it's free. Not open source. Um, it's a private okay. company, but um, but yeah, very very easy to use and very free. Uh, uh, and then so I have another one for you too, uh, um, Jonas. Um, what kind of documentation does do your tools have? Is there a lot of documentation that it has? Like if I'm a newbie, you know, starting out, I mean, for really both of you, I mean, do you find that you have enough documentation for me to, if I'm just a new guy starting out, right, do I have enough to get going using these tools? Uh, it depends, but um, I feel like the QA industry or at least QA tools have like great documentation, great support because like there's a lot of people starting out in that industry. So you mm -hmm. can watch a lot of tutorials and also a lot of open sources going on and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of great documentation on open source projects is actually happening. It depends on the project, like, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually myself had never had a problem to find a good documentation on QA tools. I think, and, and, and then another thing I got to ask you, and, and maybe Christian, you ran into this. What about updates? I'm this not in here. I'm kind of coming with these questions. But what about updates, though? If I have a really great automation tool, or even a test tool like you're using, um, have you run into problems where you know I got to upgrade it? Next thing you know, maybe it, it doesn't work like it used to, or is it really is it really good the way that the applications are written? It's really good. Um, and Postman is very, very good about telling you when the, there's a new version and mm -hmm. what is in the new version. Mm -hmm. And generally, if you are using Postman for automated testing, you'll just want to sort of pin down a version and then make sure that that your version is working with whatever version, let's say, of, of Node you're using in your CI, CD platform. Mm -hmm. um, and then just if there's an if there's an update, just check it first to make sure it'll be interactive. I think maybe in all the years we've been using Postman at my company, I think maybe there was one time where we had a little bit of, of an interaction, but that was a couple of years ago. 
Mm, that's really interesting, you know, because I know we get out there and we use these really super cool tools. We're like, we're all fired up about it. But then, uh oh, here comes updates. <laughs> and sometimes things aren't compatible anymore. Have you ever ran into that, Jonas, where you were you were using a tool and then all of a sudden you had a problem, updates or anything like that? Or everything's going Yeah, right? of, of, co of course, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I mean, like every, I think like every kind of, if you try to, develop some kind of application and you have like a project going on and you check in on right. the project. Um, I feel like you're the first like few hours you're trying to figure out the configuration and the updates. Um, I don't know, like it's, yeah, I've run into it, but I mean, with today's like with Node.js going on, like it's not too hard to fix it. I think like it's often just a single command and like a quick Google search and then you're good to go. Yeah. That's really good because I'm sure uh, I've had painful incidents way back when you do like a Java update and you're like, no, because you don't know if it's going to work and you don't know if it's going to like attack your a security issue or, or something like that. Okay, I'm going to move on. Anyway, um, so um, how, do I, how do I test encryption? Have you ever ran into something like that, having to test that? Hmm. Um... Not not in API testing. Uh, I mean, you know, in, in API testing, when we're testing the token um, or with a token, the token itself has been encrypted. Um, and so what I would do in that case, if I wanted to test that was just I would make one small change to the token and see if then the, the user wasn't able to get in. Um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of other encrypted values, Postman may have that functionality, but I have not used it. That, that's that's awesome. What what about you, um, uh, Jonas? Uh, I, I think you talked about UI, HTTPS, right? TLS, SSL. Uh, how do you test that? Um, I think, like, actually, if you do like end-to-end -end testing, uh, you can configure it. I'm pretty sure, at least in Cypress. Um, and Selenium, you, you have like you, you can test on those kind of protocols if they are set correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it's like I, I was thinking, like if you like try to really nail down on security tests, I think I've never done it actually to, to like really test for security. Yeah, um, that, but I mean, that's, that's a good question. I have to like I have to dig into into that. Yeah, yeah. But see, that this is what it's all about, right, guys? I, I love these uh, QA summits because I'm like, hmm, when you guys, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your presentations, I'm like, whoa, I never thought of that. So it's a really good platform for us just to go out and research. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, oh, wait, I'm trying to click on this. Sorry, my, my Mac here. Is it acceptable, a 500 error, and it's returned as a result of a security validation from the server code framework itself? Or... To the developer, should you wrap up that response in a 400 error? Okay. Yeah. Um, so generally, what what I've learned is that those 400 level errors are should be associated with client error, and the 500 level error is associated with server error. So mm. if if it seems to me like if it was a serv a security validation maybe about like not being able to reach the server, um, mm. then maybe, yeah, that should be a 500 response. But it, if it was an ordinary, you know, you don't have the appropriate token to make the request, then it's really actually a client error, not a server error. Mm, that's interesting how you split those up and everything. Um, okay, this is a crazy question. Um, does Postman test for other format responses, like a XML or something like that? Yes. Yes, it does. Um, and it also supports, um, oh, why can't I think of it? That new, that new query, um, J, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It supports a number of different formats. Let's leave it at that. Right, you can't remember it. And you remember it right after we're finished talking too. And you're right. like, darn yeah, it. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, something, it's something I haven't used before. So that's why I can't remember what it's called, but they do support a number of different kinds of format responses. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so it looks like I have another one. Jonas, hey, got a compliment here. Thanks for your presentation. And do you agree with changing application code to add unique identifier for element to ease and UI test implementation? I do agree with that. And it's uh, actually a great comment because like this is the 
go to way to implement a good test automation strategy, like to have your developers, like the, the process should always be like you as a tester defined together with the developers, the um, identifiers. Um, but it happens to be that this is not the case in the real world all the time. Um, so if you can do it, if you have a great communication channel, do it. Um, otherwise, yeah, try to do it um, because it eases up the process. Um, but I feel like it's often not really implemented in the right way. In the, in the, in the cool, system. sounds good. Um, I think I got a question for you there, Kristen. Uh, does backend testing equal API testing? Yeah, but, and before I get to that, I remembered the thing, GraphQL. I knew you would. I knew, GraphQL. I knew yeah. you were going to remember it. Right? <laughs> I knew you but the, the backend this. testing does not always equal API testing. So there are other ways to interact with a backend data store besides going through an API. So an API is a subset of backend testing. But it's it's very, very testable, which is which is why I really like API testing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, uh, Jonas, I got one for you too, and I, it's not here. Um, if I, if so, if I had a page right, and I had certain graphics, how would I test that? In other words, you know, like images and things like that. How do I go about doing that? Um, so, <laughs> I, I think the best way to actually do it is uh, to train a model on it, um, because, like, you know, like you need some kind of understanding what kind of graphics like it looks like there's oh, i talked about the pixel matching if you know right. that the graphic needs to be like it's a specific state you can um like make an object repository and test for those specific states or those specific like visual res representation but if you for example want to check for a graph which goes up if you put like some kind of input in there um you could train actually an AI model on exactly that. So you teach, uh, like you, you teach a model, a basic machine learning model on, okay, so um, if this input, like this should happen, and then it looks for visual, like those kind of differences. Um, it's like kind of a tricky and kind of a new thing, a new approach, but um, I'm sure we will be seeing more of like testing for those kind of things in the future. Mm, in the future. Awesome, awesome. Guys, I think we got to go. Um, any last words that you want to tell everybody out there? Because it sounds like you have, and you do, the most amazing careers. And I bet you're like, wow, how do, I, how do I get to where you are? Do you got any advice for everybody out there? Just go ahead. The floor is yours. Ooh, okay. I'll start. Um, so, so my advice is never stop learning. And so if you heard me talking about API testing today and you said to yourself, oh, wow, this, this sounds like it's probably important, but I don't want to take the time or what if I can't figure it out, um, definitely do it. Try it out. And I've got a couple resources for you. You can buy my book and I talk about API testing in there and there's hands-on activities. And you can also take my LinkedIn learning course, which is all about API testing with lots of hands-on work. That's awesome. That's awesome. Jonas, you got the floor. All right. I, I couldn't agree more with, me with the learning part, but uh, my advice is uh, don't think that tools are going to solve your problems. Uh, try to understand the methods and the like the what, what the tools are based on first and then just use the tool as a to make your life more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to have an understanding. Please have an understanding of the processes and, and methodologies below that. Great advice, guys. I got to let you go. This has been awesome. Thank you very much for your time. Jonas, thank you for running the old, complete, long schedule that you did, moderating and everything. So I'll talk to you guys later. Okay, I'm going to let you thank go. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Right, thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 <clears throat> and I will let you... Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry, guys. Um, so I think we got a, what do we got now? I think we have a announcement that's going to happen. And then we're going to take a break for a few minutes and we will continue. So I think we got an announcement. So I'm going to take it away. Thank you, everyone. And now let's welcome our sponsors, Lambda Test. Lambda Test is an intelligent cloud testing platform that recently launched HyperTest an innovative new test execution platform that is up to 70% faster than any cloud-based test ex execution grid. Interested? Talk to Lambda Test. 
Also, you have a chance to win one of $500 Amazon vouchers for filling out the survey. Just use the link from the chat and answer a few questions. Good luck! Wow, what can I say? This has been such a super, super awesome QA summit. I'm just learning so much. I really love the last speakers, and I think we're ready. Ferrari, you ready to come in here? Hey, man, what's going on? Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to – what are you going to talk about today? What do you got for us? <clears throat> uh, so my talk is about uh, going to the, to the basics and to try to explain um, – about the process that are um, uh, frequently overlooked by the by the testers, so I will try to to explain how the the process can impact in the in the development process and how to um, take advantage of of all tests. That sounds super important. So I tell you what, I'm gonna bring on your slides. I'm gonna go ahead and get off the screen, and you got it. Have a great talk. So thank you. Um, so let me. Uh, first, present myself. Um, my name is uh, Fabian Ferri. I'm the creator lead of uh, Apio Hub, that is a consultant company um, um, in Barcelona. Uh, I have uh, 20 years uh, of experience in QA almost, and uh, I have experience in uh, logistic companies and, uh, and startups. You can find me and um, uh, in Apio Hub, in, in, in my email, in, in Apio Hub. Um, sorry, but this, uh, well, I, I changed it a little bit, the, the presentation, but this is fine. Okay, so uh, let me start with an, with an old idea that uh, I frequently discuss with my, uh, with my friends, that is uh, making software is like making cars. And uh, the first, the first idea is that, no, not really, because uh, making cars, uh, well, uh, a car is not evolving like software. Uh, software is constantly uh, evolving and, 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 and getting changed, and cars are more static. But let's think, uh, let's think again. Um, if we make a second look, uh, we need, to, we need to, to think how a car is designed. Um, a car is assigned in, in a long process from the sketch uh, from the sketch part. Uh, then uh, we go for the for the blueprints, and that blueprints are separated by pieces. Um, if you look at the at the holes of uh, of the car, um, you can you can think yeah well, that holes are for uh, um, for um, avoid a, a excess of weight of the parts of the car, and that's true, but a car, it's uh, also designed, for example, that holds uh, allows access to welding robots, for example, or, or to workers uh, to, to assemble the parts of the car. So when a car is designed, um, it is designed not only in terms of quality, of, of safety, or of performance of the car, uh, it's also designed in terms of manufacturing. I mean, um, when a car, is assigned it's is assigned it how it's going to be assembled in the assembly line and 
this is important because uh, if we recall our um, if we recall our, our, our initial sentence that uh, making software is uh, like making cars, uh, we can imagine, for example, that in car companies design, uh, design a car model that is a software idea, and the output of the factory are cars that are the releases. So um, my first question here is, uh, should companies or software companies uh, design their software not only in terms of functionality, but also in terms of development process? Um, I think my, my answer and my opinion is uh, yes, it should not always happen, but uh, it's, it's, it's what it should be always because uh, sometimes uh, when we think in process, um, we need to think that almost everything a process uh, and companies has a lot of, uh, that can have a lot of teams, uh, have a lot of process. Uh, if you think even a uh, perfect code, uh, a perfect code with 100% of, uh, of coverage uh, can fail when you are integrating with other code. And, uh, and even the perfect code can fail uh, for a mis misconfiguration. So it's not all code. Uh, a big part of errors that we found are process related. Um, a process is pretty much all. Uh, from even if a process is a bad process, it's a process. For example, uh, sending code by um, copying uh, in a Slack, it's a process. Um, you can change it and you can send that email uh, with a pull request, you are changing the process. Also, we, uh, we have to get clear that uh, the quality perception is not only related with the books in the code. It's also, it can, it can be also, for example, uh, a misconfiguration that stops completely your, your uh, application. So um, it, it, it is possible to, to, to have this kind of situations. So changing a company process can impact a lot in the, in the quality of the product. And it's uh, often overlooked by by Chris. So let's have, uh, let's imagine a, a real world case when we change um, uh, a process and it impacts to a team. Let's let's imagine an heterogeneous team uh, that works on ser some services. Is not always in that way, but um, imagine a typical agile team. Uh, with uh, backend and frontend devs, uh, the clients of the frontend devs interact with the rest of the with, with the API REST, um, and they got a QA or some QAs, APO, uh, probably uh, some intervention of uh, um, of DevOps, DevOps guys. So it's a typical typical team, typical agile team that uh, most companies. Uh, are, are, are plenty of that uh, kind of uh, teams. The problems they fall. Um, teams complain about uh, the lack of uh, focus in the sprint. So um, everyone is working in something really different. They, they don't have a, really a, a topic to work on. Um, they complain also that it's more or less a waterfall, these guys sitting in Agile. And, the, the um, frequent changes of, of context when uh, they solve uh, bugs, because, uh, for example, uh, they need to get uh, some um, some closed tasks open again to solve bugs. Um, even having unit tests and so, uh, you can include in some calls when when you find um, you find errors. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you know that that kind of graphics uh, showing the cost of the of the books. But imagine, for example, this is what it's happened uh, in, in a lot of teams. Uh, the backend the back developer, um, the backend developer finishes their task, then the backend QA uh, makes their test and probably they automate the, their test. Then when it's finished, the, the, the task is done and the front end dev 
can start with uh, with their tags uh, by implementing some some functionalities that use the the endpoints that uh, are made by the the backend, and then when the front end finish, uh, the front end QA starts uh, testing. So uh, this is waterfall on agile. This is a a good topic that uh, to discuss. Probably not here, but. Uh, it can be considered that. But imagine uh, that we found a bug. Uh, it's found by the front end query and it related with the uh, back end depth. That can happen and it's easy because, for example, the back end says that uh, uh, he introduced that change, that the back end uh, didn't read because it's not well documented and so. So that happens a lot. and. That can uh, span for one or, or or more sprints, so can be quite dramatic. So the proposed change is to document the API endpoints with the uh, Open API, that is uh, the the old Swagger uh, the, the old Swagger, Swagger syntax uh, from source code or from an Open API YAML file, uh, and generate mockups for the API. That's that's a change in the process of, of development. Uh, this is more part of a more technical um, presentation, but uh, it's only to, to give you some some introduction. Um, this is uh, the documentation we introduce in the in the endpoints. Uh, it's only documentation. Well, not really uh, because there are um, uh, there are tools for for Java, but. Um, it's it's documentation. It's, it generates documentation, and on um, on you have uh, the the version the version of Open API specification file. You can use it as source for the mock it API, and also if you enrich uh, your documentation with samples, you can have uh, mock data for your for your further test. Now you have a, a documentation that is uh, auto generated. And it's consistent with, the, with your uh, commit and branch. So you have, for, for example, a master branch with uh, the old functionality or, or, or the project functionality, but you introduce a change. You have uh, you have the changes uh, live in your branch. So uh, it, it it is always true what say, what the documentation says in every case. So uh, after that. Uh, you can mock the third party APIs that you are using uh, simply by getting that uh, that documentation, uh, the documentation of the other APIs that uh, are also uh, documenting. And uh, you, or you can, uh, you can ask for the open API specification or you can create uh, your own your own documentation for the for the third party APIs. Uh, and when you have it, uh, you can Edit and customize these files uh, and, ver uh, and version it as uh, as a test and dev source. So, so you, you you can have the data uh, you need for the for the mockups. Now you can start the mock server. Uh, starting a mock server, there are plenty in 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 GitHub or in, in internet. There are plenty of tools that generate a mock uh, server from the documentation of Swagger. Um, it is difficult to do. No, not really. Uh, it's a little effort for the team, for the for the backend devs, uh, to document to document the endpoints. It is not needed to document all the endpoints to start working on, because uh, you can only document one one endpoint and start to work. And also, Open API. Uh, Provides all the tools you, you you need to do this, so it's not it's not really not really hard, and also it's uh, close to standard. It's it's very standard, so uh, you are going to find people to help you and and to people to hire, for example, to 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 help with that uh, with that kind of test or with that kind of development. So it's it's pretty standard. What are the the benefits? For the for the backend devs, uh, it's fast to write and maintain, and it's fast to generate mocks. So, also it's a clear way of communication uh, with other teams, uh, and 
it's a, a only source of truth. This is important because uh, you are not you are not um, fighting with the documentation and with uh, Jira and with you 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 have a, a place where this is the truth for every branch, and you can uh, refer to that documentation for uh, for making change or for communication or for communication uh, with other teams. So it's great. Um, also, with the documentation, even if you have uh, an already working endpoint, uh, they can compare the working uh, own version with the documentation examples you, you have uh, to, to, to make us a first step. So it's, it's great too. Um, the, and this guide, uh, this, the, the mock test can guide the, the devs uh, through the development. So, benefits in back, uh, in back end testing. You have an API up and running. So, you have it's, it's a mock up, but it's a server for you. So, you can go for the test from the start. You can test the documentation is correct. You can, uh, you can start writing, for example, uh, your, your test, your, your API test. And also, BDD approach makes sense here because you are writing your test uh, before, even before the, the endpoint is programmed or, or, or updated. So you, you, you can code that test and, and, and better here, uh, it's, it's correct to use. Uh, also, you can start uh, writing contact testing to integrate with other teams. And also, even with the documentation, if, if we go to that documentation, that buttons, uh, there are buttons to call uh, this uh, mockup. Uh, so you can uh, use that button to generate a URL and using the recording of JMeter, for example, you can um, get your uh, load testing up and running almost free. There are also benefits for the, for the front end development. Uh, they can get uh, mockup data and they can start develop it, developing their components even before the real code of the API, it's, it's up and running. So it's, it's nice for them. And also they can change the, the examples in the, in the YAML file to make, a, to make some more complex examples. I know that uh, front-end developers can intercept uh, with other tools um, the course for the API to mock up that uh, that kind of uh, test, but um, you are you are talking uh, with the uh, same source of truth for the whole team. So um, don't underestimate that that thing. You are working with one documentation, and that's very important. And even benefits to to the Bob's team because they got artifacts, they are mocks, but they got artifacts uh, to start to check the deployments. To configure the pipelines and even for the configuration of ephemeral environments uh, to automate the test so it's it's good to to uh, that 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 kind of change uh, can be very beneficial for for the team also the the whole team um the whole team um, can focus in the same task they are working on the same because they are working almost parallel so um, a little change in the process can improve a lot uh, the, the, the stability of the project. So um, back to the basic. Um, what is a query engine? And that's I know that, that is a, a, a change of the topic, but this is important. What is a, a query engine? Is the guy or the guy that uh, was with this, or is a uh, the guy that uh, files bugs in the in the management uh, in the error management application in Jira, or it's a uh, or it's the the guy or the girl who increase the quality. Uh, for me, we need to increase the quality uh, before to even write tests. We need to increase the quality. And what is testing for? Testing are different of uh, of quality. Uh, testing are a local alarm. Uh, or an instant image of the release. And even more, it's a security net to catch bugs. 
And there are many kinds of, of bugs uh, that are data related bugs. Uh, there are uh, code bugs, code related bugs, and configuration uh, related bugs. That um, every kind of bugs has their, um, their solutions. For example, for code, it's uh, more unit tests. Uh, for a related uh, for related bug uh, for data related bugs, uh, you can make copies of the of the database and try to to sanitize or, uh, and encrypt the um, not, not to encrypt to um, to get a, a local copy of the data. But there are another case, uh, another kind of bugs that are worse that uh, are the for example unexpected changes in interfaces of the of a different service, uh, incorrect test environment that uh, makes uh, false positives, false negatives, and errors in documentation and, and specification. These tests are difficult to prevent, and some of them arrive to production. And most of them are process related. And what should we do? Uh, with our process. When we change a, a process, we should aim first for write and maintain tests, that's normal. But then uh, we should analyze the root cause of tests. It's not only to identify the team that introduced the, the, the bug, or uh, not, uh, not only to blame in Git, it's to analyze, like I mean, uh, airplane accidents, analyze the root cause. What was the change of actions that uh, put the, 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 the back in production or, or, or catch it by, the, by your um, test set? Then uh, try to introduce a change that avoids that, uh, that kind of bugs. And then measure your bugs and your bugs frequency and the kind of bugs. Uh, with that cycle, you can uh, try to uh, analyze your process, test your process uh, in the same way that you are uh, testing your, your code, uh, simply by taking measures of what kind of bugs uh, are more frequent and introduce a process that avoids that, uh, that kind of process, I, that kind of bugs, sorry. So what should you do? Uh, analyze the process using the test uh, the test results. That's uh, that's important, but there are a thing that are more important. That it's um, to avoid the the survivorship uh, bias. Uh, you should prioritize the bugs found in production because um, the the test uh, the test you get with your uh, uh, the the books you get with your test. Um, are because you are uh, focusing in that kind of uh, in that kind of test yeah, and in that kind of uh, bugs. So you should prioritize the the books that uh, you cannot catch with your uh, book net. Uh, change or introduce better process. Uh, always try to improve the process. Um, that's important. Uh, never stop. Uh, all process can be improved. Um, check if the process fits uh, in your team. Not always a, a process that uh, you find in internet or you find in some talk uh, works, works for your team. So try to make your team comfortable. Um, you also should understand the context and use mockups. When I say the context is uh, your team, it's making a part of the software, not all the software. Sometimes, for example, you need, I don't know, uh, an email for, uh, for the checkout process. Uh, if, the, if you don't have the ownership of the, of the, of the mail server, probably you, you should mock up that mail. You, you, you don't need to um, they get that dependency if that the uh, email server is up and running, or if they have uh, corrupted data, if you cannot control the, the email, you should mock up and then let for the integration part uh, when it's tested. 
um, related with the above know the ownership of the component data. So um, try to mock what you can uh, with what you can and um, try to to get it clear what you can not and, and, and know that it's a dependency when it's not uh, when you don't have the, the ownership. Uh, absolutely prefer well known standards uh, to some homemade um, some made technologies tools and so and prefer a process that can be automated mm, do not give more more work to do to your to your team it's easy to to ask for example you should write a mail every time you make a comment but it, it, it should not happen it's it's better to make a, make use of passive systems of test that uh, try to make manual manual operations like writing an email or change or or fill a i don't know a, a form uh, it's it's better uh, if you can automate and don't um, don't stick uh, only with test so um, if you if you are only testing you are not really in Proving the quality. Probably you are maintaining the quality, but you are not improving it. Um, do not try to test impossible scenarios. Um, this is very typical because some teams uh, try to automate everything. And if, for example, the API is behind a VPN and the data is encrypted, and they, they also try to, to automate or, or, or to test. And sometimes you get the accountability, and that's the the the, the next uh, the next point. Do not put in those tasks that you don't trust. So if you arrive to a moment that uh, that the that a thing cannot be tested because uh, you have a shitty staging uh, server, and you are not going to trust what you tested, speak with your team. And say clearly, um, guys, I cannot trust uh, on that task. If you want, we can put in in down, but we need to uh, change or change our process uh, to 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 improve the testability. Because if not, uh, I cannot trust in the test uh, in the test I'm uh, making to 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 test application. So. The, the the conclusion is the the quality of final product of the releases is uh, heavily dependent on the programming and delivering process. So put uh, put an A in 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 the process, not only in the test, not only in the code. Um, as the code evolves, the different process can evolve too. Um, we are living um, a big golden age of the DevOps. So put an A on that. Uh, don't stick in in the long um, long running uh, um, test uh, runs because the uh, the teams wants to um, deliver uh, as much as possible uh, fast and, 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 and even uh, teams wants to to deliver directly in production with the with the last um, with the last uh, devops uh, uh, technique so uh, think that your test needs to be needs to evolve it's, this is not invalidating uh, when uh, my colleague says about uh, about uh, the testing techniques because they are very interesting and, and, and very valid that's of course but uh, we need to put an A uh, in a speed and, and and in the automation or the the well the automation of the creation of tests not only in the speed of the execution of the test but uh, to improve the speed the speed of creation of the test because things are getting getting fast and. <clears throat> Quality uh, engineers should be centric in the process change decisions. 
So you should participate uh, with DevOps um, in, in designing the new process because you should include um, tests and you should improve uh, uh, passive, uh, passive methods of uh, controlling, controlling code like Sonar. Um, you should participate in that kind of decisions. And that's all from my part. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Farron. That was so super awesome. You know, I really liked that talk because it answered a lot of questions that I had, but I got to let you go for, for about 30 more minutes. I got another speaker coming in and I've got a slew of questions for you that you can help me answer. So um, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. It was really super, super awesome. And we're off. Okay. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Hello. Things are very good. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Doing great. So what do you got for us? What are you going to talk about today or tonight or wherever you are? <laughs> okay. This evening where I am. Um, yeah. I'm going to talk about uh, how I use the, the theory of jobs to be done, which is a, a, a framework that's used by product owners and how that helps me test because it helps me focus my testing on customers. Sounds really good. So you know what? I'm going to get off stage here and I'm going to share your slides. That should be them right there. And okay. I'm going to let you have it. So you Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so my name is Mike Harris. Um, I'm going to speak to you about how the theory of jobs to be done helps me focus testing on customers. I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes and then have 10 minutes to take questions. I'll give a short introduction to to jobs to be done and then talk about how I've used this framework to help me in testing. Uh, before I start, I'm going to say a couple of things about myself. I'm currently the solo tester at GeckoBoard and we aim to give every person in every organization access to relevant and understandable data so that they can make better decisions. And I'm also the program secretary of the British Computer Society's specialist interest group in software testing, otherwise known as SIGIST. So what is jobs to be done? Jobs to be done is a framework for innovation. It says innovation does not have to be messy, imperfect and unknowable. It says you don't need data rich models. Instead, it asks, what did you hire that job for? Now, I became interested in jobs to be done when I started to work with a product manager who used job to be done. I hadn't come across it before. So I read some books about jobs to be done because I wanted to understand how we approach problems. And what I found was that using jobs to be done helped me as a tester get new ideas for testing. It helped me focus on customers and so gave me a, a, an un, helped me understand quality better and helped me get new ideas for testing. I've said, I also felt that jobs to be done would be a good subject for a talk. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that last year I went to one of the 20th anniversary events for the Agile Manifesto. And after all the talks, someone in the audience asked the panel, what comes after Agile? And the answer was jobs to be done. So I think it's a very good thing to talk about. So then, what is the theory of jobs to be done? I think the first thing to say is that the theory of jobs to be done is a theory. That means it's not just a theory. Good theory helps us understand how and why. It also helps us make sense of how the world works and it helps us to predict. An example of a good theory would be John Snow's theory. John Snow was a doctor working in London when there was an outbreak of cholera. And at that time, the theory about cholera was it spread through miasma in the air. But actually he noticed that everyone who drank from a particular water pump got cholera. So he had the water pump turned off and he found that people stopped getting cholera. And from that, he developed the theory that cholera was caused by something that you ingest. That was a good theory because it took us in a long way forward in understanding how cholera spread and how to fight it. So theories can be good. Um, something else to say about the theory of jobs to be done being a theory is that one of the original people to work on jobs to be done had been an intern of the management scientist W. Edwards Deming. And one part of Deming's system of profound knowledge is a theory of knowledge. Deming believed that knowledge is built on theory and that prediction requires theory. A theory predicts the future with a risk of being wrong and fits without failure observations of the past. So jobs to be done is a theory 
not a concept or methodology. So then what is the theory of jobs to be done? It's a powerful guide for innovation. We all know that innovation is challenging. We've all worked on features that we thought were fantastic, but didn't prove to be popular. And jobs to be done frames the competition for what you're doing, and it gives you a common language for customer behavior and enables the leader to articulate purpose. It's widely used by product owners and product managers and explains why customers pull certain products into their lives. And this book here on the slide, Competing Against Luck, is the first book I read on jobs to be done. And it's, this book has done a lot to popularize jobs to be done. Now, jobs to be done, as the name suggests, is about jobs. Jobs to be done says people do not buy products or services. It says that they pull them into their lives to make progress. And we call this progress the job. Jobs to be done uses metaphors. One of the metaphors is that people hire products or services. Uh, this metaphor is continued with saying that people will actually fire products or services. Also, they hire the they hire the product when they buy it, and they fire it when they stop paying for it. And there's a concept of a big hire and a small hire. The big hire is when you pay for the new service, and the small hire is when you start to use it. A job can be defined as the progress that a person is trying to make in a particular circumstance. Um, and this understanding of what jobs are done by products you can see in advertising. Now, the Snickers bar is something probably we're all quite familiar with. And the Snickers bar's advertising says Snickers really satisfies. Now, Snickers is packed with peanuts. It satisfies hunger. That's what it does. And the advertiser has shown they've understood the job that it does in the slogan, Snickers really satisfies. Now, the same company that produces Snickers also produces Milky Way. And Milky Way is quite a different bar. Its slogan is comfort in every bar. Milky Way is bought for different reasons than Snickers. It's a sort of comfort me job. Um, so the advertiser, again, has shown that they understand the job that's being done by Milky Way. And so jobs to be done can be co contrasted with use of personas. I worked with a team a few years ago that used personas, and we had a post up on the wall of our persona, and I could go and look at that and uh, I could try and derive a test from it. But you know, if the poster told me how old they were, their marital status, their educational qualification, whether they owned a home. And I used to look at this and think, well, how do I get a test out of that? Um, but if I contrast that with the jobs to be done, I could test whether Snickers really satisfies. You know, there's something tangible there. And I think this is what's really different and I find useful about the analysis that jobs to be done gives us. But then if, if a job is the progress that a person is trying to make in a particular service circumstance, what is progress? Well, progress is movement towards a goal or aspiration. A job is usually seen as a process. It's really a discrete event, and it's not necessarily a problem, though it may involve resolving the problem. And that successful innovations enable customers to, to make their desired progress. Alan Clement, who's one of the writers in this area, says something that makes it a theory is it tells you how and why things happen and not what you should do about it. Progress involves dynamics and understanding dynamics and relationships is what makes progress different from goals. Progress involves process. This includes time, change and direction. Examples I've, I've got of jobs that involve progress are I want to have a smile that will make a great impression in my work and personal life. Or I want the sales force I manage to be better equipped to succeed in their job so that the churn in staff goes down. But if we're going to say that a job is the progress that a person is trying to make in a particular circumstance, what is a circumstance? You know, a job can only be defined in relative to the specific context in which it arises. Jobs occur during the flow of daily life, so the circumstance is central to their definition. There's a specific context. For example, where are you? You, know, you could be at home. You could be in the shops. You could be at a sports match. Um, these, where you are is really going to affect what sort of products and services you want to pull into your life. Um, because it, it, another context could be, when is it, you know? Is it first thing in the morning? Is it at lunchtime? Is it the weekends? Is it in the evening? Again, this is, context is really going to affect 
what sort of products and services you're interested in. You can think again about who are you with? You know, you're with your partner, your children, your parents, your friends, your work colleagues, what life stage you're at. It could be you've just graduated or you've just got married and just got your first children or you're about to retire. All of these things are really going to affect what sort of products and services you want to pull into your life. But jobs can be seen as being only functional, but jobs have social and emotional complexity too. Uh, some, uh, so some purchases quite obviously have that level of complexity. If you think about purchasing childcare, you're considering who I will trust with my children. That's a powerfully emotional purchase. Um, but sometimes purchasing decisions aren't actually necessarily obviously emotional. I read about a case where a couple built a, bought a new mattress. They were in the supermarket, they got to the till and there was a sign saying cheap mattresses and they bought one there and then. Uh, when they got through the till and they were interviewed and they were asked about their purchase of this mattress, they said that, well, actually they bought a really expensive mattress some years before and hadn't had a good night's sleep since. So they'd start to become grumpy and they'd become grumpy with each other. And they'd started to argue. So when they saw that mattress, they thought there's a solution to their problem and they bought it there and then. It's a profoundly emotional decision and not immediately obvious that that's what it was. But I've talked about what is a job, but what is not a job? Because a job's quite specific. It's an innovation blueprint. And this really contrasts with the traditional marketing concept of needs. I can remember studying marketing at university and we were taught that marketing meant meeting customer needs at a profit. But what's our needs? They're really quite vague, you know? A need could be, I need to eat. You know, how would I test that, you know? Um, jobs take into account the circumstances in which I need to eat. If I need to eat because I want to have a romantic meal with my partner, or if I need to eat because I want to celebrate my children's birthday, then actually there's something tangible in there that I, 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 as a tester, I can relate to and think, well, I'm actually celebrating a birthday, having a romantic meal, there's something I can test there. Is the meal romantic or is it good for a celebration? And uh, I think this circumstances is really very important. And the use of circumstances gives me as a tester pointers as how to use jobs to be done. Now, jobs to be done comes from what's called the quality movement. Quality movement's frequently spoken about as being work by people like Deming, Duran and Crosby. And I think this is one reason why Jobs to be Done struck a chord with me, because these people all said that customers have a role in defining quality. And the quality movement led through to the idea of the voice of the customer being deployed throughout the processes. This was especially true of development, where it was felt that the research in the voice of the customer would keep people on track. Duran, who's one of the people I mentioned earlier, he said quality consists of those features which meet the needs of customers and thereby provide satisfaction. That was the sort of point of view that this was coming from. And there was lots of interviews with user testing to try and keep uh, development on track with what the customer wanted. Um, Just Be Done comes out of this uh, point of view and also relies a lot on interviewing customers so that you can understand customers' feelings, what jobs they're doing, you can understand the progress they want to make and understand their circumstance. I think as testers, we need exposure to users uh, because we want to be able to take their ideas into our, or their concerns into our, our work. And I'd say that by helping me understand the customer, Jobs to be Done helps me understand quality. So Jobs to be Done says you should study customers because you want to understand what jobs they're doing. But it also says you want to understand and study people who are not using your products. So you should also be interviewing them. And studying customers helps us at testers, but also studying people who are not yet our customers. You can find out things like, is there a compensatory behavior or a workaround to get this job done? If so, this is an opportunity and we can take that idea into our testing. We can gain lots of insights by studying people who are not using our, our products. And I thought we could talk through an example here. One of the examples in the book, the first book I read, was about a restaurant that wanted to sell more milkshakes. Now, initially, it brought in customers with the right profile and asked questions like, do you want your milkshake chunkier? Would you like it cheaper? Would you like it chocolatier? Would you like another flavour? It took action on this research, but nothing happened. 
But then they hired a consultant who used jobs to be done. And he asked, what job arises in people's lives that causes them to come to this restaurant and hire a milkshake? And what the research did is it found there were two jobs being done with the milkshake. In the early morning, people were hiring the milkshake to keep the journey interesting on their way to work. They could consume the milkshake while they were driving. And they liked the milkshake because it filled them up. This helped them understand that competitors to this early morning job were donuts, bananas and bagels, something the restaurant didn't sell. But it also meant that if they wanted to make the milkshake appeal more to these people doing this job, they should make the milkshake more viscous so it would fill them up more. And then there was a second job that was being done. People were coming in afternoon and evening to buy milkshakes. And these were parents with their children. They'd been out all day with the children and the children had been saying, Dad, can you buy me this? Mum, can you buy me that? Dad, can you buy me this? And in the afternoon, they were walking past the restaurant and mum or dad said, would you like a milkshake? And the child said yes. And they went into the restaurant and built a milkshake. So the job that was being done in the afternoon was to placate children. And again, that meant the competitor was not something the restaurant sold. The competitor was the toy store. And actually knowing that the job was being done was to placate children. If you wanted to sell more milkshakes to these people doing this job, uh, maybe you should make milkshakes in half sizes so that you could sell them to smaller children. Something that this research showed is that these people didn't have the demographics in common. What they had in common was the job. And you think how different the jobs are, a one size fit all solution would work for neither. Now, something else that jobs to be done can do is help us understand what the product owner wants and that way improve collaboration. We all work in cross-functional teams with back-end developers, front-end developers, testers, designers, scrum masters, and we need a common language. The job to be done can give us that. And I found a good example of this when Barack Obama set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, he also asked Elizabeth Warren to set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. She had to bring together divisions of government with conflicting missions like enforcement and supervision. And when the committee to set up the bureau met, they focus on the jobs to be done because that's something they had in common. Now, processes should be introduced, integrated with jobs to be done. Processes should be seen through a jobs lens. Processes are invisible to customers, but the results of them are not. And what matters is how processes deliver the offering that perfectly conforms to the customer's jobs to be done. There are managers in charge of product lines. What about the job to be done? If managers are focused on the jobs to be done, they have a clear compass for their efforts and they have an organizing principle for their internal structure because all of their efforts and their internal structure need to be focused on finding a solution for that job. Um, a jobs lens can help us test. One of the processes that should use a jobs lens is testing. And here I should clarify what testing I mean. The product owner will do testing to find the solution they're looking for. And the testing I'm discussing is the testing that happens after the product owner has selected the solution. And I found a good example of this with General Motors. General Motors have a, a product called OnStar, which is a vehicle security and safety system that you use via your phone. When they introduced this, they assumed that only people who bought their top end cars would buy OnStar. But they found that people who bought all of their cars bought OnStar. So they wanted to do research to find out what job was being done by people who bought OnStar. And they found that OnStar was being hired to provide peace of mind while driving. Because if you're driving miles from town and get a puncture or have a breakdown, you want to be able to call someone to resolve the problem. So testing had to be developed to support this job. OnStar had to cover all conditions with everything else that could be happening in the car, such as the airbag being deployed or music playing. So General Motors created its own testing process. It was fast because people don't want to buy last year's technology and covered complex scenarios. And this enabled General Motors to keep upgrading OnStar. But now if I was to think about the sort of testing that I do and how I could use General Mo uh, Jobs to be done to do that, I think the first model I would use would be Agile Testing Quadrants. Um, this model was created by Brian Marrick. And if you look at the quadrants here on the slide, you can see that the two quadrants at the top half of the square are for business facing tests. The two quadrants in the bottom half of the square are for technology facing tests. And the two quadrants on the right hand side are for 
test that critique the product. And the two quadrants on the left-hand side are for supporting the team. Some people say that it's, uh, critiquing the product is also supporting the team. So they replace the idea of supporting the team with guiding development. But these tests in the top half of the quadrants of business facing tests are also called customer facing or customer tests. And they address business requirements and they include desired behaviors. In an agile team, the development team should gain an understanding of customers and how they use the product that we are making. Um, the business facing tests in the top half of the model drive development because they really need to pass before you can release the product. Now, if I was to look at the uh, testing quadrants, consider how I could use jobs to be done to derive tests, I think I could derive tests for business facing tests with jobs to be done. If you were to look at the top left hand quadrant and think of those tests that support the team and are business facing, I think in those tests I'd be asking questions like, do the requirements and designs enable the customer to do the job? Does the functionality enable the customer to do the job? If I was to think of the top right hand quadrant, where I'd be looking for tests that critique the product and are business facing, I'd be looking for job for asking questions like, could the feature do the job better? Is the job defined correctly? Did we miss a requirement? Does the product do the job for the customer that we designed it to? So actually I can use jobs to be done to populate tests in two of the four testing quadrants. And I think that shows how useful jobs to be, to be done can be for us testers. Um, so I would say jobs to be done helps me focus on customers because analyzing the progress that the customer is trying to make and their circumstance helps me understand the customer. And this gives us tools to create tests. If you think about the milkshakes example and think about the morning job, and think about all the integration tests you could create, say, based on the circumstance. You're driving to work, so to buy a milkshake. If you're driving to work to buy a milkshake, do you have to get out of your car to buy the milkshake? If you do, how far away from the restaurant do you need to park? How far into the restaurant do you need to go? When you've got your milkshake, does it actually fit into that slot that you have in the car for drinks containers? And I'm sure you can think of many more integration tests based on the context and based on the progress for the milkshakes. And I, I would say something else that jobs to be done is help us focus testing on the job, not the functionality. Because actually, what do we normally test? We normally test the functionality. If you think about my testing, I'm working for Gecko Board where we help customers make dashboards and then share those dashboards. So what I'm normally testing is, has the data gone into the dashboard? Is it, can I see it on the dashboard and then can I share the dashboard? So I'm testing inputs and outputs. But actually, what about the job? The job really helps us to define quality. And if I think about the job, I get different tests. Uh, I think about examples from my recent work. We had customers who asked to do something complicated and I watched the user testing videos and thought about their circumstance. So when I was testing it, I talked to the copywriter who was writing the help pages and we wrote some great help pages to help people do through this functionality. And also we added some calls to action to help people through it. And that was through thinking about the context of how complicated it is. But then and I also had another example where I was testing a new part of the UI. It all worked as designed. All the buttons did what they were supposed to. But when I was thinking about what progress the customer wanted to make, then maybe we'd risked, we'd missed uh, giving the customer the ability to edit a particular element on the UI, which would allow them to change the value of a particular item. Um, we had to make that change and then customers could make that particular type of progress. And these are examples how jobs to be done help me focus on customers. Because if we're focusing on the job, we're also focusing on the customer. Yeah. Something else I found interesting in, in jobs to be done was actually looking at what questions people were suggesting you should ask when interviewing customers. You could ask, what role does that app play in their life? Or why is it important or is it? Uh, a few years ago, I was working on an app in which customers only logged in once a month. That was an important piece of context for us and affected how we worked. Um, you could also ask who else is involved in the purchase and use of the app because maybe they've got a different job. Maybe they're in a different circumstance. They're a different person. Maybe they've got different progress they want to make. 
What are the barriers and points of friction in buying the app? Well, what are the alternatives to buying the app? That's a, uh, an uncomfortable question, but it's very important to know that. Um, or are there occasions when the customer does not use the app? What would we expect them to do? Again, it's an uncomfortable question, but maybe someone's using some shareware and some manual steps. Well, we want to help make our product better, so they want to buy our product. And is the app used in unusual ways? I think you can probably say that it is because every app I've worked on has been used in unusual ways, and I think that's probably common. Uh, I also read about a, a ticketing app, you know, and the person was saying that when they started working on ticketing app, they thought they were just selling tickets. But what they actually learned is that they were enabling families to have a good time together. Now that's a job, and that affected the way that the testing and development was done. So how then can we use jobs to be done to test the app? Well, if you think about that ticketing app, you could be thinking about what progress does the customer want to make? Maybe they want to celebrate a success. Maybe they want to celebrate a birthday. And what's the customer's circumstance? Maybe they're a family with a large number of young children, or maybe they're a family with adult children. Um, but actually you can also think about another job that the customer wants to make. I think you can always think about more jobs. I worked for a company a few years ago where all the staff with their partners and children were all taken out for a company family days or sort of bonding exercise. Well, there's a different progress there in the different context which you could use to feed into your testing. And I think you can always think of other circumstances. If you think about the ticket purchase, you can have different families, with family with teenagers, a retired couple, or a young couple without children. And all these test cases can be used in manual and automated testing. I also think jobs to be done can be used with exploratory testing. This book by Elizabeth Hendrickson, Explore It, I found very useful in helping with exploratory testing. She says exploratory testing involves simultaneously designing and executing tests to learn about the system, using your insights from the last experiment to inform the next. And something I, I use from the book is her idea about testing charters. And she said the idea of a charter comes from when President Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark to explore the Missouri River with the equipment he gave them to discover trading routes and communication. And you can take that structure to explore something with something, to discover something else, to create a testing charter. She says a good charter offers direction without over-specifying test actions. An, an example of an exploratory testing charter could be, I want to explore charts with all supported browsers to discover browser-specific errors. But how to use jobs to be done? Well, I would have to say that what the thing to do is to, to plug in progress. So you could say, I want to explore progress with something to discover something else. So I want to explore having a good time together with a family to discover if the information they require is provided at the time of purchase. Or you could plug in the circumstance. You could say, I want to explore something with the circumstance to discover. I want to, an example would be, I want to explore having a good time together with a family with three generations to discover if the information they require is provided at the time of purchase. Now, something this, this using jobs to be done in a testing charter does is it makes the jobs to be done visible. This can cause discussion and this can improve collaboration within the team. It can also help you look for gaps. You can look for gaps between product purpose and its known use. Changing the circumstance can help you do that. But actually, if you think about your product, there are going to be very many uh, jobs that you're perhaps not aware of. And using the tools of looking at what progress customers are trying to make and what circumstance they've got can actually help you a lot. One of the books I read talked about margarine. Margarine is marketed as a yellow fat, apparently. And, uh, but if you think about the jobs that margarine does, there are many, many jobs. It can be something to moisten the crust so it's easy to chew. It can help you not to burn your food while you're cooking. There are so many jobs that margarine can do. And it's really good to think about how many jobs your product can, can be used for. So I would say jobs to be done can help us. It can help us innovate by providing a framework for innovation. It can help us collaborate by giving us a common language. And it can help us focus testing on the jobs our customers hire our products for. Uh, here I've got some references and I'll share this slide afterwards on Twitter uh, if you're interested in the references I use for the book. Um, 
the Deming book I've got on then, New Economics, contains his system of profound knowledge and his, his ideas about the theory of knowledge. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. I uh, also like to thank Ben Newell, product manager, for his help. And I'd like to finish by saying I hope that you felt you were right to hire this presentation. And if you have any questions, I'll be very pleased to answer them now. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate that. Let me pull your slides off here and let me bring in Ferran and how you guys doing? You guys doing good? Did you like that? Your presentation? Is it a lot of fun? Cool, cool. So, um, I'm just going to get into this. Uh, Farron, this is for you. Can I use mock-ups with unit testing? Uh, that kind of came out of that. I'm just curious. Uh, well, not really because unit testing, uh, it's uh, a level under the mock-up uh, mock world. Well, um, this is not the mock-up I'm referring. The, it's a different kind of uh, mock-up for the, for the unit test. Uh, when you mock up uh, with unit tests, you are mocking up the service or the integration of your classes, not creating a service, an API service that it's a, a mockup. It's a kind of different mockup. Okay, okay, that's cool. Um, I think this is really for both of you. Uh, what is the best way to get started as a QA engineer? <laughs> I think that there's, there's lots of ways to get started. Um, I think the first first thing you to do is actually to start testing. Um, and I, I think that uh, um, one of the things to do, you, you can test websites, you can look for bugs in them, and uh, you could report those to the companies whose website it is. And you know, maybe you'd like to work for one of those companies and you could target companies you wanted to work for. Um, I'd say that there are other skills around it. I think there are lots of good books to read. I think Janet Gregory and Lisa Crispin's book on agile testing is a good good place to start. Um, uh, if you want to be looking at test automation, I think the Test Automation University is fantastic. It's got lots of free courses which will help you. Um, and as a, apart from that, I would say lean into the, the testing community. There are lots of great forums and uh, people can help you. Uh, and They'll be pleased to help you. So I would advise you to sort of... Uh, join some forums and ask some questions. But, sorry, Ferran, what, what, what advice would you give to someone? Yeah, what no, advice no, do you uh, have? Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you, but uh, let me add that find, uh, find a good team. Find a good team to join and to and to learn. That's that's important. Don't start as the only way of a team because uh, there, is a, there is a lot of errors to do. So it's, it's better to, to start with someone that can, uh, can help you, can help you and teach you. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, this is a really funny one. Just curious, whose fault is it, QA or developer, if there's a bug in production? <laughs> okay, well, I, I, if I, yeah, if I, if I was to answer, this question is who owns quality? And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that the, the convention is that now that the team owns quality, so I think the team takes responsibility. And uh, mm -hmm. I saw part of Ferran's presentation where he talked about the team doing uh, uh, root cause analysis. I think that's a really good response. So I think the team owns it. Um, um, but actually, ultimately, management owns it uh, because management's responsible for quality. Um, but uh, I think really the team should... That's a good one, yeah. Well, that, that's that, that's what W. Edward Stemming says. Who's possibly the most prominent management scientist, mm. for, and, uh, mm. um, and he, he says management has to own quality because um, if you delegate quality, you can end up with different levels of quality in the organisation, and that mm. way quality falls. So actually, management has to own quality. Um, um, but actually, management can say the team is responsible for quality. Yeah. That way, the team will deal with it, which is what I think Fran was talking about. And mm -hmm. this response of actually having doing root cause analysis when there's a bug in production is right, and it's a good thing for a team to do. Mm -hmm. Fran, what do you think of that? What's your comment on that? Um, let me recommend that uh, don't blame people uh, because yeah. we are right, all human right. beings, and uh, probably um, there is some reason for uh, making an error. So, try to prevent the, the, the error and the situation that uh, provokes the, the, the error, but don't go for the people because it is, there is no point. Mm -hmm. 
That, that's a really good point. I think it's it's a team effort, right? Because I mentioned yeah. you mentioned about agile development and everything, and that is a mm -hmm. massive team uh, development and the collaboration that's in it. Mm -hmm. So that's a really really awesome point. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Another, another one I have here is this. I mean, what's the best way to test production deployments? So, well, yeah, I know it's a difficult one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I, I can say what we do. I mean, we, we have a continuous deployment. So actually, every feature branch is tested and then it's deployed. Um, so, uh, but I think this question is probably asking a, a team that makes monthly or quarterly releases or, some, or weekly releases, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say the best way is to move to continuous deployment. Um, I think the quicker you release, the smaller the size of your release, the easier it is to test um, mm. and the better quality you'll have. Um, the thing about making monthly or quarterly releases is inevitably you get like 20 things in there and definitely some of them don't quite work. Um, this is my experience. And mm -hmm. if you, but if you release every feature branch, every commit as it is made, then each one has to work. Um, the last time I worked on a team that made monthly releases, I used to put stick it, uh, sticky notes on the wall for every bug that went in production. The wall wasn't big enough. Um, now I work with yeah. continuous deployment. I, I don't have those problems. Mm -hmm. mm, that's, that's interesting. That, that, uh, okay, here's, a, here's one for you, uh, Ferran, here. Um, there are many companies out there that are adopting a frequent release process. Like what you just mm -hmm. said, Mike, um, this is during a sprint, you can send to production multiple pieces of work. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, yeah. and I guess there's a question on that. What are uh -huh. the advantages, disadvantages you see on that? Uh, well, uh, advantage, uh, the decoupling yeah. of, uh, the decoupling of, uh, microservice, it's, it's good. It's objective, mm -hmm. objectively uh, good. Uh, also. Um, the frequency helps that uh, the, the tasks uh, put in production are, um, are little, so you can control more what you are going to to, to, to put in production. And the disadvantages, um, in my opinion, are the, the complexity of uh, a big uh, ecosystem of uh, microservices and also, um, well, the, the the gap you produce uh, between front end and back end because uh, front end goes in another speed. So probably right. the activities can be different. Mm -hmm. But let me add that uh, independently of, of my opinion, this is what company are going. So probably we need to think of that and, and understand what is going on and, and reconsider our, our roles in the future yeah you know what and, and fact, going to change. right right in fact you know what there was a question here hold on let me find it because it was exactly uh what you just said hold on a second here um uh right here right here here it is um what will the future of testing look like and how could testing evolve i mean it kind of runs into like what you just said uh, mike what do you think of that what do you think the future of testing look like well, I think we're going to be using AI and ML. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they, these are the things it's going to be. Um, I think in that way, I think there'll be things that are very different. Um, but I, I also think that there are things that are going to remain the same. Um, if you think about the cycles that we work in, we work in plan, do, study, act cycles. This is the Deming cycle. And uh, it's been around now for nearly 100 years. And it's been used by good engineering teams to improve quality for that time. I don't think that's going to go away. It's what Scrum's based upon. It's what the toy, it's central part of the Toyota production system, therefore part of Lean. Um, so I, I think these loops, uh, giving feedback, um, are gonna still be there, but I think that use of AI is going to be the, the really big thing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. Uh, Ryan, you got anything to add to that? Uh, Probably uh, we should focus on on passive systems, uh, not not uh, not making not making tests, not programming tests, or programming uh, the, the the test fastly uh, using probably some kind of uh, artificial intelligence, mm. and also um, to be closest to a cultural way 
for teams, not a, a workforce, but a cultural way, and, and try to provide tools to the teams instead of uh, making tests. Mm, that's that's really interesting because here's another question for the both of you. Um, do you think the process first becomes harder to accomplish as deployment cycles get shorter and workload increments? No, absolutely not. No, I'd say that it is quite different. Um, uh, if I was to think back, when I, I've worked with teams who've uh, had monthly releases, and one of the teams that I was a test lead, we cut from monthly releases to weekly releases, and we're moving towards from we got to continuous delivery. Then we're moving towards mm -hmm. continuous deployment. I think mm -hmm. that the process got easier because actually you're doing with smaller batches, and small batch sizes are core to both lean and agile ideas and mm -hmm. um, I, I think that this is uh, something that we need to grasp with. There's a very good story from Taichi Ono about where the small batch size it started and it was to do with uh, Toyota's um, uh, mm. factory system where they found that working in small batch sizes which they had to do at that point mm -hmm. improved quality um, and actually this is where we want to be is I think with small batch sizes and so I, I would say process it gets much easier Lean and Agile are designed for small batch sizes. So actually, mm -hmm. um, I think it gets easier and you should have the confidence to go for it and mm. uh, release more frequently. Uh, I think it's really all about confidence. Mm -hmm. mm. I look at it like sort of like living code, right? It's sitting there and it's constantly flowing from development yeah. right into production. It's not like yeah. sitting stale and then you get a chance of bugs getting uh, introduced into the system and things like that. That's a really good point. Um, Ferran, this one for you. Thanks for your insights. Hey, you got a nice compliment. How do you promote train the process first mindset within your team and also your organizations? So talking a lot with the with my teams and, and mm -hmm. trying to convince that uh, well testing it's only a security net and you need to you need to improve pro, uh, process and putting in a lot of examples and trying to introduce changes uh, little by little. It's important to uh, not to put big changes. It's like, uh, if you know about A-B testing, uh, you change things uh, little by little to, to uh, correctly analyze the results of that change. Because mm -hmm. if not, uh, you, you cannot understand that chaos of, uh, of uh, changes. So it's better to mm -hmm. use few by few. That, that, that's really awesome. I Okay, here's here's one that I haven't heard in a while. Um, how has COVID changed testing? Has it in some way? And has it changed the way jobs are performed? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I mean, we, we were just lived through and are still living through this yes. huge revolution, yeah, huge right. changes. Um, we're having this conference remotely. You know, we wear masks. <laughs> We've all had vaccinations. You know, we do social distancing. Um, right. And that way we're safe. Um, so actually, one of the ways it's changing is actually we're all working remotely. Mm -hmm. um, and I, some of us will be doing hybrid working by now. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's a really big change. Um, and has it changed the way jobs are performed? I would say that it has because everybody else is working remotely as well or working hybridly. And so um, I think this is a really important question for customers to look at um, because you, uh, companies to look at because we need to know what jobs are people doing now. They're going to be different to what jobs they were doing before COVID. Um, you know, so uh, you know, we're, we're using a particular uh, platform for tonight's meeting. Maybe uh, Geeko wouldn't have been using this before COVID. Mm. You know? So that there yeah. are lots yeah. of jobs which are really different. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just talking about that. And if we each were to think about our own businesses which we're involved in, we can mm -hmm. see how COVID has affected people. They're not in the office. What does that mean? How does that affect their use of our product? What jo jobs do they want to do? Their context has changed, their circumstances change because they're at home, they're all distributed. You know, Maybe teams are more international now, maybe companies are yes. more international now. So mm -hmm. in fact, the context has really changed and that's something that jobs to be done can be really good at picking up and really good at exploring. And mm -hmm. it's that sort of analysis which I find really very useful. That That's really an interesting point because I see that we're, we have in this big collaboration worldwide now. I think it's really brought the whole world together, yeah. especially yeah. with these companies. Like here I am talking to you, and, and you're in, you know you're in England, he's in Spain. This is like you know super cool the way this all works, and we're all learning together. 
And yeah. actually, um, I got one more question. I was trying to roll into this one here. Uh, when should you not use the theory of jobs to be done? This is somebody asked this question. Well, when not to use it, I haven't found when not to use it actually. Um, uh, you know, the, our product manager uses it in trying to understand uh, an, uh, what jobs our customers are using. We can communicate that to us, which is really useful. I've as I explained, I like using that analysis to try and inform my testing. Um, so I haven't found when not to use it. Because um, uh, when I'm testing, I'm actually testing what jobs our customers are doing. Um, so uh, uh, to me, I think it's really very useful. And that's, that's why I wanted to share that in the presentation right. that I gave tonight. And uh, I hope people found that useful. Oh, yeah, definitely. I really did. Because here's one question for both of you guys. How can I test? I need another tester. <laughs> Serious. I know. When do I when do I need another tester on my team? Uh, Ferran, go. When do you think you when you start to get a load? And I don't know. Uh, probably when you are not uh, arriving to the uh, release age, and and you need to test more. That's uh, a matter of numbers. But uh, probably you should analyze uh, why why you are, you are not arriving before mm. to to hire another test. But tests for me are always welcome. Mm, right, right, right. What about you, Mike? How would you test to have another tester? <laughs> well, I, historically, people used to talk about there being ratios between developers and testers. I don't think mm -hmm. that's a good thing to do. I think that actually that uh, you want to think about when you want another tester because they're going to add value. Um, and so I think that's something that we as testers really need to be thinking about. And that's something that's really good that Fran was talking about, the idea that we can mm -hmm. be involved in process. We're interested in quality, mm -hmm. far more than testing. And I think that we need to have that mindset. And if, if we have testers mm -hmm. are adding value and actually we're stretched, mm -hmm. then in mm -hmm. fact, we need another tester. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, uh, that's the issue. If you find yourself being stretched, and we can be at a very sharp point in the development process because there can be the one tester and it, you're the bottleneck and that's very uncomfortable. You don't want to be the bottleneck. You've got to improve oh, the process that, is that so way. Mm. So in fact, you, you want to be seeing when you can add value and how you can help teams uh, to uh, release quality software more quickly. That's a great point. Um, okay, looks like I got a little, oh, compliments to you guys again. Thank you for your presentation. Awesome guys. What are your advice, best practices to make QA and dev teams collaborate more effective? That's a really good question, by the way. So how do you make them more effective to collaborate? <clears throat> Fran, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think that the most important part is to demonstrate that uh, the quality matters. Uh, and the devs can, for example, deploy on Friday and go for some beers. Uh, the, the, this is a, the, the more important part. So, uh, when 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 they are confident with you, uh, they they mm -hmm. collaborate effectively. That's mm -hmm. that's not rocket science. The problem is how to arrive to that to that point. Uh, you need to introduce ideas and and to try to demonstrate what is working and what is not working and understand mm -hmm. a lot uh, what they do and mm -hmm. uh, especially as a little. Uh, to understand that they are humans. They are mm -hmm. not trying to, I don't know, uh, make things bad. They are making errors, like, mm -hmm. like you and like me and like everyone. That's, that's really interesting. Mike, you got to add to that about how you make things more effective? Well, I think it's something you've always got to work on. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you've got to make sure that you're in integrated with the team, you're going to all the team's meetings, you're at planning, you're at the retrospectives, you're at stand-up, you're part of the sprint review, you're involved in all of those things. Mm. Um, I think there's also an attitude from us, and I think Fran's idea that we're involved in quality is really important, because actually we're, we're one of the builders, if you like. We're not the building mm. inspector, we're one of the builders too. And I think mm -hmm. that's an important attitude. And we need to keep telling that to the developers and keep showing them how we are <laughs> and how we're helping them to do their job well. Developers mm -hmm. want to do their job well. They want to produce high quality software. Mm -hmm. They're also really good testers. They spend a lot of time testing. Um, mm -hmm. I go to our developers uh, meetings and have really great conversations with people there. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's something you've got to constantly work at 
find out how to engage and, and use the structures that are there uh, and keep talking to people and seeing how you can help them. That's that's really awesome. I like that because what I can hear from the both of you, it's the whole team concept, isn't it? It's not yeah. the separated world of a developer, whoever else is is part of that agile team. It's bringing everybody together. It sounds like that makes a really effective uh, project. Uh, I got mm -hmm. one more question. I think we got to wrap it up. What is a good practice to put yourselves on the position of testing for a user's perspective? So what's a good practice in that? Well, I, I think I, I would say jobs to be done helps me do that um, because yeah. it's, it's all about the user. It's understanding what job has the customer hired our product for and the, the structure I use is looking at what progress they're trying to make with the job and what's their circumstance. So that really helps me. And if your team is using jobs to be done, there'll be user interviews as well. And you can watch those user interviews and learn an awful lot about customers from there. So I, I would advocate using the theory of jobs to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I, if, I think wherever you are now, there'll be a jobs to be done meetup. So if you're interested in that, that would be a good way to pursue it. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. Karen, do you want to add to that? I mean, what is good practice? Uh, yeah, uh, simply to try to understand what it's uh, what is trying to do the, the developer and then try to get the holes that uh, he forgets to, to, to implement. That's, that's the idea because user, user perspective is it, it is strange, but there are a lot of users, or it can be a lot of users, and everyone is different. And we need to interpret what the, a crowd of people can do. So we need to focus on, on what the developers is not um, emphasizing. In, mm. So mm. Try, try, try to search what they, not to hide, but uh, try to not to put the accent. Because that, probably the errors are there. Right, right, right. That's awesome. Guys, Um, you, we got one minute. Uh, or, or just tell me something like super cool. What do you want to tell everybody out there? This is your time. So just go. What do you want to say to everybody out there? Give us your advice. In, in my case, uh, the the world of IT is changing. So try to, try to help uh, to make that world uh, a, a better place to be. Yeah. Nice, nice. Mike? That was really nice, friends. Thank you yes, very much. Yes. Um, I think mm -hmm. that I would say, if I was to say, contrast that, that, I would say keep learning. Keep learning new things. Learn at your own pace. Uh, keep doing new things, and you'll, you'll be surprised at how much you've learned over a year and actually that you're doing things in a year's time that you just couldn't do today. So I just say keep learning. Mm -hmm. That's really That's awesome. Really. Guys, this has been a great conversation. I wish we could continue right. it, but... I got to move on to the next speaker. So thank okay. you very much for your time. Just thank you for everything and all your insights. I'll see you later. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you for. Thank Oops, you. Sorry. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. I got my next uh, person coming in here. I have Melissa. Hi, Melissa. How's it going? Hey, good. So, what are you going to tell us today? What are you going to talk about? We're going to talk about disrupting your career and specifically kind of making that shift from QA, traditional QA, into quality engineering. And, and not only, um, you know, even if it's not necessarily a title change, but how you can kind of embody a lot of the skills and traits that make up a quality engineer. That sounds super awesome. In fact, I am so super excited. I say super a lot. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring in your slides and then I'm just going to get off stage here. Have a great time. All right. Thanks. Um, hope everyone is enjoying um, their time. Um, I, I sat in on, on, on several sessions earlier today. Some great, great info. Um, I hope you are learning as much as I have been. Um, and I know this is kind of the end of the end of the day, or close to the end of the day. So hopefully this energizes you in what I think is, um, you know, just a fabulous place and transition point for not only software testing, quality assurance, but of course, I'm a little partial to the quality engineering. So what are we going to talk about in the next 30 minutes or so? Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, the QE being the new QA, kind of what, what do we mean specifically about that? Um, and then more importantly, we're going to talk about what quality engineering is and more importantly, in some cases, what it isn't. And we're going to kind of bust some of those misperceptions that folks 
for sometimes leaders have around the role of quality engineering and, and kind of what quality engineering is. Um, and then we're going to talk about just kind of the continuous everything, right? Um, with the, you know, DevOps being firmly um, kind of it within our SDLC and being roles that we've been hiring for and kind of building and investing in for many years now. Uh, but there's this kind of concept of continuous everything. And so what does QE specifically need to do? And what kind of innovation do we have at um, at our at our disposal to support the continuous everything from testing to deployment to of course improvement. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the, the role of testing um, traits and and characteristics to consider. So, let's start. So. <clears throat> You know, what, why specifically? Why are we moving? What's the difference between quality engineering versus QA? And, and some may just say, well, simply you're replacing the, the word engineering um, or excuse me, you're replacing the word assurance with engineering. Right. And of course, that's some a little bit in there. But really, it's a nice place for us to pivot and kind of bust some of these misperceptions of quality assurance. And what are the, some of those misperceptions of quality assurance? Um, as you know, and if you've been in your career, um, even as close to as long as I've been in my career, you know that there are a lot more misperceptions on what quality assurance is um, versus what I actually have showing on this slide. But you'll kind of get the point. The, the idea here, and, and of course, the, the session right before me, we talked a little bit about this as well, um, that with quality assurance and us not kind of having this reboot or pivot and redefining what our role is in the industry and modernizing it, um, you know, the misperception, the biggest one that we see is that um, because we happen to have the term quality in our role, that we become the team that owns quality. And I'm not going to harp on this point much because many speakers before me and probably many speakers even tomorrow as part of the conference will talk about this. But the, the misperception that there is one team that simply owns the quality and if anything is perceived or real that there is a quality issue, we tend to get that finger pointing back to us, right? Um, it's not necessarily a skill. Anyone that is a user can test, right? And and I'll be honest, um, you know, 25 plus years ago when I started my career, um, that is how we staffed a lot of our testing and quality assurance teams. It was by real users of the software who wanted to make a pivot or change in their own career in some cases. So we kind of assumed that the, the role was not necessarily as technically skilled as it needed to be. Um, and so we staffed a lot of our QA teams many, many years ago with folks that were simply great users of the software, right? And there's still very much a place for great users of the software, as we'll kind of talk a little bit about later. Um, but the fact that there was a misperception that anyone that was just a good user of the software could just step into that role um, and be a tester. That was a misperception of, of kind of the old school traditional quality assurance um, perception. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, if it's an issue that's found live or on production by a user, then, of course, it's QA's fault because, you know, there's this, this expectation or this statement that, QA is generally the last ones to touch it before it goes out live and, and being consumed by our users. And of course, um, you know, once 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 there is an issue that is discovered on production, the a lot of cases, the, the easiest person to come to or the easiest team to come to would be the last people or one of the last people that would touch that. And in a lot of cases, that would be QA. So as we kind of move into redefining what the industry is moving us towards, um, I like to use the, the you know, the, the quality engineering specific um, definition. So the way that I like to define quality engineering is really by emphasizing the engineering portion of it. And I kind of break it down into these kind of six characteristics, right? Any engineer, regardless of the profession, has deep expertise in, in all six of these areas. But it really is the holistic view of, you know, what are we doing? How do we define success outcomes and those measurements in order to measure that, right? So we have to have an innate understanding or the ability to find that understanding by both explicit information that's shared with us, but more importantly, implicit information that might not be readily shared or centralized, but we can do the digging. We have that expertise and skill set to be able to define that. And then we 
after all of that information gathering, we design, we, de we design that comprehensive strategy, whether it is um, a strategy that is going to eventually become our enterprise-wide test automation strategy, or if it's um, the framework or use of a tool to house scripted tests, whether they are automated or not automated. We're designing, we're able to take the def definition that we went through the step before and we design that strategy. Then of course we have expertise or should have expertise in actually building the solution. It's not enough to just say, this is what we need, but we have to go that extra step and mile and say, here's how we actually build that solution. Um, and then of course we execute that solution, right? And, and again, if the solution is um, scripted or unscripted testing um, that goes about there and whether the scripted testing is of an automated nature being executed by a machine or framework or whether those tests are somehow uh, going to be walked through um, through a human tester, human quality engineer, we have to have the ability to execute that solution. And then, of course, we measure all of the results of any of those four steps above that. And then we appropriately communicate out and report on those most important areas, um, areas that would eventually um, have higher risk. Um, or would need more vetting out there. So all of those six characteristics combined is really when we start looking at the true role of the quality engineer. And the way that I really kind of like to summarize that up is by kind of this quote here. Um, we know that we are operating as quality engineering um, in that quality engineering role when this quote applies to us. We are influential or we influence, we have the ability to influence the building of the software or in this case, the solution before the software is begun to be built or before the software is built. And I'll kind of let that land a little bit. The re reason why this quote is so grounding in the quality engineering is because it is um, ensuring that before that solution is started to be built, whether the line of code um, after that, you know, refinement and grooming sessions that happen, is that we have been so coupled with the rest of our um, project team counterparts and dev specifically in this, that we're influencing how that software solution will eventually be consumed um, before that software is built. So that means, of course, that the whole shift left, which I'm sure everyone has heard about, that's certainly one of those other grounding kind of statements and quotes that we have in our modern, uh, modern industry. Um, but that shift left really applies here because what we're saying is it's not enough to simply have an assigned tester to a ticket or to a story after the dev work is gone. We actually have to be the, the true value of quality engineering is when we are just as coupled with those conversations um, in vetting out those requirements and, and talking and freely being able to work through potential solutions so that we can be influential in there. And of course, you know, part of that quality engineer is that we have to be able to balance that technical acumen with user advocacy. And again, uh, session before, before mine right now, and then earlier today, we were talking about if we as testers or quality engineers specifically aren't advocating for our users, then we're missing a key component there. So a good quality engineer understands the right balance to strike be between being very deeply technical and having that technical acumen, but also the importance and value of being able to always advocate for the user throughout all of those activities. And then, of course, we're context driven, um, you know, and this goes along about with the kind of explicit versus implicit information. But really, you know, given the information that we have, we determine if that information is enough for what we need to do. And if it's not, we go out and find it. And it is the difference between finding explicit information, which looks like things that are readily available and centralized to the entire team, stand up information. Um, acceptance criteria and user stories, requirements documents, or any other supporting documentation or information that should be readily available to the team. That's explicit information. And quite honestly, if it's readily available and centralized to the team, then we should really feel comfortable decreasing the time that we spend validating explicit information where we really show value and provide a ton more collaborative process with our teammates is when we find that implicit information, the information that's not centralized or easily available to everyone on the team. And more importantly, taking that next step. And once we uncover implicit information, 
we make that information explicit um, by doing a team solid back to our team. So, so I talked about kind of quality engineering, what it is, right? So you can kind of frame where we're going with what the role of quality engineer is, but it's more important at this point to really kind of ensure that we are not falling down the rabbit hole of that misperception of what quality engineering is from others without clearly defining what it is. Um, we will not have a great story or narrative when someone makes an assumption or has a perception of what it should be if it doesn't align with our definition. So we talk about a little bit around what it isn't, and more importantly, so we're not the mistake finders, although we will find this, absolutely. We will find mistakes as anyone would find mistakes as they're really kind of getting into either very specific conversations at refinement or grooming, or as they're getting into the code or the software solutions themselves, right? But that is not our job. Our job should not be to ensure that someone to the left of us or someone that we're working with on the day-to-day -day did her or his job. That is firmly in the um, responsibility of that individual and their manager or their team that's in there. So if you're ever finding that you are put in the place where the expectation is that you will find others people, other people's mistakes, um, that is not the role of the quality engineer. Um, we're, we're also not and should not be set up to be the catch-off for failed processes. Um, so in that situation, you know, we may have un, uh, unclear or ambiguous acceptance criteria. Um, and I'm here to tell you that if by the time uh, a quality engineer starts actually exploring and testing um, stories or groups of stories as they come our way, if we still have ambiguous acceptance criteria, um, that's something that we can certainly bring up. Um, but that's not something that we should be put in the situation of finding. Those are things that we should all be shifting left. And then, of course, one of the other kind of biggest misperceptions is that we own or that we are responsible for the only testing that happens within the SDLC or within the team. Um, so it's important to kind of use these three statements as grounding as we move into the, the kind of the key components of quality engineering. So as I mentioned, you know, we have continuous everything. We have continuous deployment. We have continuous integration. We have continuous improvement. We have continuous um, more and more and more and more words to kind of add to that. Um, quality engineering fits very nicely in the continuous pursuit of continuous anything. Um, things that we should be looking at when you think of, well, how do I know if I'm really quality engineer is when you are interacting with the sol solution or the code or the software more than you are executing scripted types of tests, right? And so we want to always increase the amount of exploratory type testing and use the technology to handle those more repetitive types of test scripts or test cases, those repetitive tests that we tend to run as part of, say, a smoke test um, or end-to-end -end test or anything like that. So we know when we can when we can measure the amount of time that we're spending in that exploratory mode, we know that we are moving the needle more towards supporting quality engineering. And we can do that by bug busts. Um, you may have heard that term before. Um, I love to, to implement something like this, you know, once every two weeks or so, once a month or so, depending on, you know, how big your team is, um, for, especially for leads or managers, anyone that has, you know, that, that influential being able to assign work or kind of assign timing of work out. Um, bug busts are a great way. Um, it's a great way to kind of get extra sets of eyes on areas of the code or the platform um, that an, an, an individual might not have uh, been working in before. So I really like to kind of focus on one area of the code, time box that to an hour, maybe hour over lunch, maybe bring lunch in or provide lunch, something like that. But the idea is that you're getting new sets of eyes within your quality engineering or testing team and looking at new areas of the code that they may not have had exposure off um, before. Bug busts have, in my, in my experience, have yielded so many incredible cool pieces of information, whether they're in the form of bugs um, or enhancement requests, or even just sharing an experience. So again, as we elevate the user advocacy at the same level as the technical acumen, balancing out both of those where they're equal, understanding the Adva taking advantage of the fresh eyes in those bug busts is a great way for us to do that. And I know that was a qu question for the other session as well. Like, how do you continue to advocate for the user? So that's one good way that we've done that. 
Um, again, kind of how do we continue, how do we support the continuous everything? Um, continuous deployment, some of the mantras around the always, you know, the, the, the continuous deployment is automate everything, right? And, and so for me, I, I'm not necessarily a big fan of automating everything for the simple fact of automating everything. Um, but there is absolutely excellent times and places um, for things to be automated, right? And so instead of coming in and saying, well, our goal is to automate a, an X percentage or X number of test cases that had already previously been um, executed by one of, you know, a, a quality engineer or, or a human versus a, a, a framework or the machine from the automated standpoint, um, it's better to kind of look at the things that should be automated first. So I, I really enjoy a, a, a priority one through priority three scale with just about everything, but specifically around automating. How do we know what should we be automating? Well, first we should really be looking in some cases to the left of us. What is dev doing? What are their standards? What are their consistencies? What could each individual developer produce in the form of unit or integration tests? And when we start getting a landscape of what testing, whether it's in an automated fashion, such as unit and integration testing or non, when we start getting that landscape of what's happening, we can further put ourselves in those areas that we know have zero coverage or very little coverage and start prioritizing our own time to spend in the areas that we know are not covered by any other of our teammates. Um, and the only way that we would know that is by having access to those tests to see um, what is the coverage like, or more importantly, having those conversations with our developers and, and forging those relationships, asking them what their own individual testing or quality checks are so that we establish that relationship, we know when we're working with a specific developer how deep or maybe not so deep they go into their own testing so that we can always be overlaying the right strategy and the right area of focus when we start getting into those stories or pieces of stories that we are starting to test. Um, the next kind of component, you know, first, you know, first P1 would be that unit and integration testing. We should have or know what the strategy is from our dev counterparts. And then as we get in there, um, we kind of, I like to say the next thing that we should be automating again, instead of going through a bunch of test cases that have already been run by a human, um, we're going to start looking at things that are going to be meaningful. Um, in here. And in, in another way to look at this is the, prop, the next priority of where we would focus our test automation would be around a smoke test. Anything that could cause a hot fix if released in production. I even further define this by saying a smoke test really kind of consists of very basic actions, CRUD, create, read, update, delete. If any story that we're developing has any of those actions as part of its solution, those would be really, really great um, areas to focus on for um, continual test automation uh, as well. But again, we want to kind of do this a little bit prescriptive and start out with the P1, P2, and then P3, which we're seeing here, which is in that user advocacy, right? So now we're tying the next priority of where we automate um, into advocacy that's tied to a customer's um, end-to-end -end flows. Um, we, you should all know who your kind of top-level platinum customers are, um, and you should easily be able to understand what their no normal flows are, and those would be excellent choices for kind of a priority three of where do we focus our time on automating. And again, always supporting the continuous everything by pairing up not just the automate everything mantra, but automating the smart and most valuable ways. So um, continuous improvement, right? So we, we talk about that a lot, but really how are we doing that? Um, we, we generally tie continuous improvement to you know retrospectives if we even have those. Um, sometimes they're quarterly, sometimes they're at the end of every sprint. But the idea is that we wanna make sure that we have the ability across the team to check in and make sure that things that we had initially said that we were going to do, that we understand when we can't deliver on something that we had committed to, the reasons why, and really having those things that come out of a retro um, and that continuous improvement, we really want that to be coming out and, and much more actionable within the squad. So thinking about the traits to consider, well, okay, now we know what a quality engineer does, and more importantly, what they don't do, 
what are things that you specifically can have, right? So traits to consider when I interview folks and I've just gone through a round where I interviewed over a hundred candidates here, things that I'm looking for, these traits are being curious. Um, don't just necessarily ask, how is this supposed to work? But be curious around what happens if I do this. Um, and for those of you who have been in your career for maybe 10 plus years or so, you, you may remember this very famous uh, interview question that went through the rounds. I know I answered it with many, many companies that I interviewed 15 years ago or so um, was, you know, how, why do you want to be a tester? Why do you want to be a QA? And one of the best and favorite answers that interviewers would love was, well, I like to break things, right? And, you know, that we've, we've certainly modernized that that characteristic now, but really we should be looking at where will this break, but more importantly, tying that to what will the user's experience be if something does break? Is it going to be catastrophic? Is it going to be annoying? And we really should not only be looking at how a bug would necessarily be classified by severity, but what the user's experience is and thinking like a user, but also acting like a user. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're measuring that at all points in times. We're, we're, no, we're no good as a quality engineer if we don't actively feel comfortable sharing our information liberally and widely within our squad. So skills to consider, right? So now those are traits that I kind of kind of work out through my interview process, skills that we should be consider, considering, right? And so we kind of look at the traditional specialist versus the generalist roles. And what specialist roles look like, you know, an automation engineer, a performance engineer, an accessibility engineer, right? Where we would pass off stuff after we've tested it to another team and they would do their thing, right? I think now's the time to look at what we had traditionally called or had as specialist roles and moving them into being more generalist roles that are within the responsibility and purview of the quality engineer. And so here are some things that we have traditionally considered specialist roles that I would challenge that we could certainly bring those in or at least some aspects of them within quality engineering so that we have that right information real time coming back to the squad instead of handing it off and then having more layers of communication um, happening in there. So um, in summary, why QA, why QE versus QA? So we're stifling the misperceptions. We're getting in front and we're controlling the narrative of not only what we do, but what we don't do. And that is always going to be very unique and custom to your company, right? And sometimes a good leader is going to need to re-educate folks on their original thoughts of what testing and quality assurance was and putting it into the quality engineering lens. Um, we shift left and we do continue to see and make recommendations on when things can and should be shifted left. And then, of course, we adopt those traits and skills that help the shift to the left and we move into the quality engineering role. So with that said, I think we've got a few minutes for questions here and I will turn it over to uh, Mike here. Yay. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yeah, you know what? Actually, we have like three minutes. You're definitely correct on that. So um, I got some questions. For example, how do you build up a team? You know, you have the different diversity of the team and everything. What's the best way to do that to really build a very successful test team? There you go. There is your yep, question. Uh, great question. And and luckily, I have just done this. I'm right in the middle of it. So when I started at my 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 role as director of quality engineering about six months ago, um, I we built a team. That was one of the first functions. There was an existing is an existing um, team that was there, but we tripled in size in three months. Um, so pretty pretty heavy lift with that, but. Um, the first thing that we needed to do, we paused on all hirings. When I walked into the role, I actually had open headcount, which is a luxury for a lot of leaders, right? We wow. always like to have open <laughs> headcount. Um, and I could have absolutely hired um, seniors, a whole bunch of seniors, right? And there were people mm -hmm. that were really, really interested in working um, at, at the company I work at, at Guild. Um, but we paused and said, you know what? We're looking now for, um, we have the ability and the luxury of having a lot of, uh, having open headcount that will 3x time. So what we did is we actually looked across and did a bit of a reorg in ensuring that not only did we understand and have the vision and strategy of quality engineering um, to the folks that were here when I started. So we did a lot of education on what quality engineering is and how it's going to be different than perhaps how some folks had operated as QA before. 
And then we made sure that we got that vision and strategy in front of all of our candidates, right? So what I wound up doing, and this was a little bit of a of, of overhead, but I'm glad I did it, was that mm-hmm. I was the first person after we went through all candidates coming in through recruiting, I was the first person that they that every candidate talked to because I knew that I could deliver the message consistently and that mm-hmm. the vision and strategy, I could explain mm-hmm. it. And, and that way, if anyone wasn't comfortable or didn't like that kind of role of quality engineer, they at least had it at the very, very beginning of the interview right. rather than at the end Later of the interview. On. Right. Yes, so we yes. did a lot of education mm-hmm. and I edu- you know, did a lot of road shows on what quality engineering was moving into. And so it got a lot of alignment. I was really lucky where I was kind of given the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, and said, wow. go build this. So mm-hmm. um, I know that that's not, everybody has that that situation, but that's really what we did is we really focused on pausing the hiring at that time and really got the vision and strategy in place and then had that very concerted message, both to the existing team and then to anyone coming in here. And I'd say I've never ever 3 x um, a team in as, in a short amount of time as we have and we're seeing wow. a ton of success right now on that on the model and approach yeah. and that was not just me it was me hearing and and listening to a lot of people and pausing and kind of using the mantra of sometimes you have to slow down in order mm-hmm. to go faster and yeah really right right increase that absolutely wow that's really really an awesome answer but i gotta let you go because i got the next speaker but i have a lot of questions for you coming up in 30 minutes so Thank you, Melissa, very much, and we'll see you later, okay? All right. All right. See ya. Okay. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. <clears throat> I have my next speaker. Hey, Wim, how's it going? How you doing? Fine. And you? you how am I, you're asking how I'm doing? I'm okay. It's kind of cold, <laughs> I guess, and I'm tired, <laughs> and uh, you're my last speaker. <laughs> so anyway, what are you going to talk about? What do you got going on? I will talk about what I did not learn from books on software testing. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that title. I'm like, oh, I got to hear this one. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring in your slides and then I'm going to get off stage here and you got it. Okay. So yeah, give me a sign when I can start. Can I start? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead and start. It's all yours. I'm getting off stage. Okay. Thank you, dear testing friends. Welcome in my talk. It's uh, for me quite particular because I'm I'm located in Belgium and here it's about uh, midnight. So I think it's the first time I present on a conference um, on a topic about midnight. But uh, no worries. I will tell you about what I did not learn from books on software testing. Well. I think since the start of testing, and you can discuss when was that exactly, um, but since the start of testing, then we have a lot of books on, on, on testing. And here I put only uh, a few of them because since, and along with the evolution of, of technology, of uh, evolution in IT, we had the evolutions in our testing domain as well. And I think today, Testing has exploded in all kinds of directions because today we have test automation. We are talking about performance testing. Recently, we are uh, talking about AI testing, cloud testing, and so on. So there are many, many very interesting domains in, in testing, which brings, of course, a lot of information, not only published in books, but also published in articles, blogs, and, and so ever. And I, I grew up with, with the blue book. So it's the book, it's uh, with the TMAP book. So that's, uh, you see here, the, the, the blue book. I started my career in, in the late 90s. And for me, TMAP, that was the Bible. And when I refer to the Bible in the next slides, then I, I mean the, the, the thick TMAP book. And, and for many years, it, yeah, it, it, was, it was really my guide. So when I came uh on on the project uh, and i saw some gaps then i just took my book i looked up the section which was missing and then i i completed the things like uh, a proper uh, defect uh system uh proper documentation for a test plan and and so on but by doing projects over the years i realized that sometimes that i didn't find the answer in the bible and sometimes i i had to be creative 
inventive and as a real tester, real thinking out of the box. And that's what I want to share with you. I want to share some what I call perspectives. I, I don't want to call it a lesson learned because for me, uh, a lesson has a kind of, of negative connotation because it, it would it would may may say that that I have the truth, but I don't pretend that I'm having the truth. I just want to share with you a view, a perspective, but that is even right as your view. And and the goal is that maybe after uh, in, in in the questions of afterwards that, that you may contact me, me by mail or, or or on my LinkedIn profile that that you get ideas. Maybe that you can discuss, that you can give feedback, that you, no matter if you agree or disagree. So what I want to share with you is five perspectives based on my career so far in, in testing. And there is no particular order. So there, I just, there, they are in a random order. Oh, hey, Vim, I'm so sorry. Can you please double check your sharing because your slides are not changing? Uh, you probably shared your like PowerPoint window or yeah. Can okay. you please stop sharing and start sharing again? Just share your whole screen. That will help. Okay. Sorry. Uh, all right. Okay, just open your slides, make them full screen. I'll add them to the stage. Yeah. Is it now yeah, better? That's, that's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, sir. okay. I don't know what, what you didn't saw. You saw the, this slide? No, we saw just the first slide, the title one. So can you just uh, scroll through all, through them all? Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So was some um, practical thing missing with with uh, with sharing the screen so yeah that that that's a slide showing that as uh, since the start of testing we have a lot of books and i grew up with with the blue one the the tima book so like i said i want to share some perspectives with you not lessons learned and even right as yours and this is my first perspective transform to a no ship tester what do I mean with it? So look, look at this, look at this image. They they are cute, aren't they? But in fact, those sheep, in fact, we are staring to ourselves because we testers, we are sheep. And why are we sheep? Because we are bleeding all over the time. We are bleeding for many reasons. And here you see some of the reasons why we are, are bleeding in a project. And in most cases, the reasons, they are valid. It's valid reasons. We have no requirements. They are not, not complete. They are changing. Uh, the, the, the planning is too tight. So all valid reasons. However, if we keep hammering the same nail in, in the project, it will not make us the most nice colleague in, 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 in the project team. So what I think we should do as tester, because we have the, the means and the tools in hand to cope with this kind of situations and to stop bleeding. What do you think of exploratory testing? That's that's type of testing that was in, in, invented, that was created just to deal with a situation where your requirements were not perfect, where they were in change, where maybe the business couldn't give you all the details. Even with exploratory testing, you can already do some use of testing. Of course, exploratory testing may not be the only type of testing you are doing in project. The second one, that's coming right out the Bible. If you get, uh, if you get um, a build, 
no matter if it has been installed manually or, or pushed through a CI CD pipeline, the first thing you should do is a sanity test. Do a basic scenario. And if that is failing, then revert, revert it back to the developer. Look together with your test coordinator, with the project manager, okay, what can we do? Is there anything useful we can do or should we wait? And should we uh, continue with testing once we have a new build, which, uh, which allowed to pass the, the smoke and sanity testing? Test data. Test data together with test environment, th the preparation of it, that I think that are for me the two most underestimated tasks in terms of effort in a project. And I think we really need to, to, to dedicate a kind of yeah, test environment facilitator who manage, who is really caring about setting up the data and setting up the environment. And if we don't have, if we don't have the, the test data because the DBAs, they, they, they didn't put it in, in the environment or it's incomplete, we can create our data ourselves through the UI using API services you can do it manually or you can do it with automated test. You upload some data. Of course, I know in, in uh, ERP system like, like SAP, of course, you need some preloaded data. But in, in some other cases like uh, web applications, you can start creating your own test data. And the last one is about the requirements itself. If we know that they, they are not finished, they are vague, don't wait with testing. Don't let it be an excuse to, to sit down, to wait, but start. And based on your common sense, based on experience with this kind of application or, or with, with your expertise in, in a certain domain, you can do some, some, some testing. And if you, detect, if you detect gaps in the requirements, in, in the analysis, pass it back to your developers, to your analysts to complete it. And so here the message is, we, in fact, testers, we have the means to stop bleeding and to transform to a no sheep tester. Second perspective, fail fast in production before passing slow in test. And that's all about testing in production. I think if I would have presented this 10, 15 years, 15 years ago, I think I would be completely banned from any conference at all. I would be put on a blacklist of guys you never want to work with because how unprofessional can you be to promote testing in production? Well, I think like, like, like we have seen, technology has changed, uh, IT has changed. And for me, modern QA, should include testing and production. And it's not a question if you should have to do it, but when and with the when, I, I don't mean the, 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 the point in time, what I, I really want to say, which circumstances can it make it more efficient to test into production instead of trying to set up your environment and trying to pass um, in, 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 in test environment. And here you see four reasons which make it, which can be an, an argument for you to say, okay, let's do a control test in production. The first one is in case that you have to deal, and today we have more and we are more and more working in very complex environments, meaning microservices. Uh, very connected environments with interfaces, with suppliers, third parties. But it's not about uh, that complexity. It's also the complexity of combinations of hybrid on-premise components, components in the clouds, which can make it very hard to mimic this complete environment in, the, in, an, in an test environment, which maybe if you succeed, you will have spent a lot of effort. And then, of course, we didn't talk about to set up the test data and the consistency of the data in this uh, complex environment. Performance and scalability. 
like I said before, test, setting up a test environment is already hard for just doing your, your function and testing. So even for doing a representative test uh, performance, uh, test that even, even, even harder. And then we can rely on the cloud because in, in the cloud and, and with the orchestration systems like Kubernetes, OpenShift, we can uh, spin up, spin off uh, easily uh, servers with the right configuration in, in terms of CPU, RAM for the duration of the performance test we need. And then we, we shut it down. Especially if you are more interested and if, if you are more focused to test usability, then do a test and production can be useful as well. And that's, and I will explain it in the next slide, that's typically done with what we call the mechanism of feature flags. And that's a little bit linked to, to chaos engineering because chaos, Chaos engineering, that's something which is yeah, a little bit a little new. And in chaos engineering, the, 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 the idea is to, to really uh, create disruptions in your system and to test how is my system reacting on very severe disruptions. And it can be that, that we, with, on purpose, we create timeouts in our system. We pull out uh, a server just to see what will happen with all the messages that were in the queue? Will the application, when the server is back, will the server be able to, to, to pick them up and to, and to process? Or are we losing some, uh, some, some data? And that are valid reasons to do controlled testing in production. And this is typically this one that's, that's not the only mechanism you can use uh, for doing that. But for example, the, the, the Netflix, uh, the Spotify's of this world are using the techniques, the technique of feature flags. And what, what does it mean? It, it are features, part of functionalities, which are available in the code. And by, by pushing a, a kind of a configuration, you can enable that feature for a part of your user. So for example, in the A-B testing there, it, it's, it's typically um, features about usability, just to see, for example, in a web application, a mobile app, if we, if we change the, the color of a button, if we change, if we add an, an, another control, what, how would that impact the conversion, for example, of a web application? While, for example, in the Canary release, there we are talking about two different versions of the applications, where in a version B, we embed complete new features, but we allow only a controlled percentage of our users to use that version uh, uh, through load balancer. And if we see that version B is working well in production, then we can enlarge the group until we have push the version B to all the users. So that's a way how you can uh, test in production. And even that, 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 that's a topic on itself for a conference. So we cannot go into all the details of, of testing into um, production. The next perspective is about hope for the worst, fear for the best. And I know maybe you, you will think, yeah, that that phrase is not correct because it's uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Well, I have rephrased it a little bit. And here you, you don't just see some smileys. No, these are the testers' emotions. These are typically testers' emotions in a project, going from being very happy, very motivated, to be anxious, angry, demotivated, sad, mad, whatever kind of, 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 yeah, of, of mood, this, this, this can happen. And I want to illustrate it with, with my first two projects I did. The first project I ever did in testing was one really according to the book, fully team up and even, and when I look back, it was, it was even insane. I could tell my test coordinator, give me two days to apply test design techniques and to come up with the number of test cases we need. After that project, I never got 
that time to apply test design techniques. So second project, same customer, but total chaos. It was horror. It was a nightmare because everything was against the Bible and the book, what I, what I, what I was teach and learned. And, and one of, one of the, the main reasons was because we had a test coordinator, but he was completely overruled by the head of the business. But that guy, he didn't have an, a clue at all about testing. So, and I remember very well, I called my account manager and said, please get me out of this hell. And of course, I was billable. He just let me stay in, in that hell of a project. And a couple of projects afterwards, then I realized that I learned a lot from that tough project. And even when, when I look now back, because after that project, I did some other very crappy, crappy project, I learned the most from the tough projects. And that's all to do for me what, what I call resilience. Resilience for me, that's the, the, um, the way how you, how you can survive the tough situations, how you can stand up after uh, situations which are totally demotivating, which is totally far from the ideal world of what you have learned in books, what you have read about it. You learn a lot. And so I formulated my own, what I called, like similarly to the Agile Manifesto, I call it the Resilience Manifesto. And so the first part of that manifesto is become scaled at taking risks, over defining risk. If you have, if you are in a tough project, then you have to take risks. It's not anymore to, to play the what if scenarios. No, it's really to make decisions knowing that there are some consequences, but you have to go ahead. And, and that's for me that the, the, the test coordinators, I remind me the, the best are the ones who had the courage to take decisions, to take, to dare to take the risks. And it's such, it's such a project, it's about valuing what you have. It's not about complaining what you not have. It, it's not hammering on the nail. It's not bleeding like a sheep. That's not, uh, we, that's imperfect. We cannot start do. No, just look, okay, what do we have? And in that situation, what is the best I can do for the project to, to contribute to testing and to, to the quality. It's, I always say to, to colleagues, it's like a rock or stone in a river. Don't try to move the rock or the stone, but think about how you can get along, how you can get around of it. And dare to fail. And it, it's, it's linked with, with, with the first statement of the Resilience Manifesto, of course, if you have to take decisions with a risk, with a consequence, in some cases you will fail, for sure. But accept it. Don't don't be don't be afraid from 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 a failure. And look back. Okay, why did we fail? And what can we do better to avoid this kind of failure? And the last one is compassion, compassion or empathy, and that's. That's in that, that's a general message for, for 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 life as well. Whenever you have been in a tough situation, you will better understand people that have been or are in a similar situation, and then you will better understand why the business cannot give you the right information, why the developer is ignoring uh, your your defects. And to illustrate this, I I had one. I worked on a project and the developer, each time I, I logged a defect, he was always arguing about the severity and I didn't understand. And once I, I asked him at the coffee corner, hey, why, why, are, why are you doing so difficult? And then he explained me that his company, because they were the, the developer uh, supplier, they had a contract with the customer. And in that contract, there were penalties if they had, for example, I thought it was five open defects in a severity high. So he got a message from his boss, whatever, 
whatever bug you you see coming in you have to minimize the severity knowing this information then i understood why he was doing so so difficult and i think resilience the resilience manifesto can help us a lot to think and to overcome tough projects the fourth perspective is rain always falls down from clouds okay maybe that's kind of a log very logical statement and when i was thinking about that perspective i had to think about uh, the fact why are they using smoke uh, fog smog in in movies and there are different reasons i um, i read about it and in, in so one of the main reasons is to create uh, an atmosphere of mystery uh danger uh, suspension and in some cases it's used to to make to hide things to make things invisible well when i see the the, the in, in over the last year the rush from customers to put everything in the cloud then sometimes i have the feeling that they want to do it just to 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 be to get rid of the the problems they they had when everything was on premise and maybe by the belief okay if we put it in the cloud then we are get we are rid of of any problem with all these applications it will magically solved by by the by the provider by the by the hosting company or the cloud itself well of course it doesn't work like that and for us cloud testing sometimes i customers ask me okay explain me what is the difference between testing a function an, an application on premise and testing uh, an application in the cloud then to be honest i'm a bit confused what do we mean with cloud testing because you can there are many many interpretations are we defining it as testing the cloud resources itself so do we want to do a test of the amazon platform the services you can use on an amazon of or an azure can be a valid case to to test for example if your customer which plat cloud flat platform he want to use and and he asks you as a test okay can you do an evaluation for him that could be a valid way of cloud testing or do we mean is a testing of system applications which are hosted in the cloud and then in that situation you have even two types you have um, applications that are by nature uh, hosted in the cloud like for example uh, salesforce salesforce or do we mean is it an application which was originally an application on on premise but we migrated it to the cloud so that's another way of cloud testing and we can also mean cloud testing by using cloud-based tools to support our testing activities uh, think at test management tools that are hosted in the cloud or uh, performance testing tools like uh, a blaze meter that's for example a, a platform hosted in the cloud that can be used to uh to, to to fire the load so there are many interpretations of cloud testing so first of all try to define what type of cloud testing and even it, it can be more complex you can use cloud-based tools for for testing applications that are hosted in the cloud so it can be become very complex and cloud testing cloud testing compared to functional testing in a sense it we should do the, the, the same activities, we should do the same preparation, but there are some particular challenges linked to uh, cloud testing. And here I, I, I just have listed some of them. And the uh, first one is, is an important one for performance testing, multi-tenancy. Uh, as a customer in, in the cloud, you, you, you are uh, assigned a tenant. But another customer, of course, is, is, um, is using another tenant, but in the end, they are using the same uh, infrastructure behind. And if you do performance testing for customer A, maybe 
the performance can be impacted by the activities which are done on the tenant for customer B. So that are things that uh, you, you need to take in, into account that the, the results of a performance test can vary from, from day to day, from the moment of the day. So good thing is to repeat several times the same test if you have uh, to deal with, with such, such uh, situation. Um, latency especially playing a role when you have the hybrid situation, uh, components on-prem, applications on-prem with the database hosted in the cloud or vice versa. So also for not only for performance testing, but even for your automated scripts. And that's a typical pitfall in automation that when you run your automated script fully in an on-prem environment, then you you have no uh, impact of uh, latency of uh, uh, of screens, but once one part is hosted in the cloud, then by latency screen screen is is um, you you get time out, and if your script is not um, uh, wor worked out or is not supporting this this kind of of issues, then your uh, your automated script will be will be interrupted. Lack of control. I take that something to to take into account that um, if if you if you want to use uh, cloud platforms in in some cases you cannot do whatever you want like you can do in an on-prem environment. Uh, for example, if if you want to do a performance test on a tenant in Salesforce, you have to request it upfront to Salesforce, and even you have to provide a complete test plan test strategy so that they know okay what are what 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 do you plan to do so you cannot just say okay i will launch here uh, a, a performance test security and privacy yeah i think that's uh, that that that's an open door but um recently here here in belgium we had a case that um, that the provider they were hacked and the the servers they used for their uh, their de the development project in in the cloud, they were hacked by uh, by someone for mining bitcoins, and it was only not not uh, noticed because a customer got uh, alerts from from the cloud platform that they have an extreme high usage. So that was uh, yeah, that's an example of a typical challenge related to cloud testing, and. Last perspective is, and sorry for for uh, for for the slang, is what I call uh, cut the crap. And cut the crap in in English it means okay, uh, don't uh, don't tell the get get to the point. Okay, uh, we we don't status the the real situation. Don't make turns around and 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 deviate. No, we we want to go directly to to the point. Tell us where where we are. What. I think in testing that often in and especially in status meetings, in defect meetings with our stakeholders, that we have the the, the tendency to 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 overwhelm the stakeholders with a lot of data, with a lot of figures, with a lot of data, even that they are don't look in it. And in the end, in fact, and that that's my experience in, 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 in some projects that the stakeholders, they were totally not interested in those figures. And they were only interested in the fact, okay, is my system supporting the main activities? And main activities, then I mean the famous CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. And, and whatever, and okay, if there is a feature, if there is a functionality with, with bugs in it, Okay, I'm not interested if we're talking about 200 or 210 or 205. No, okay, I know there are, there are bugs, but tell me what are the main activities to which level they are they are uh, supported. And yeah, that's that's in fact here you see the the the, the, the famous the crucial basic questions that our stakeholders want to be answered by us. And 
And maybe in, instead of, and I was was thinking based on on some uh, some of those those projects and, and meetings with stakeholders, I was thinking, is there a way that we can uh, present data in, in another way to to make it more meaningful, to make it more uh, linked linked to the business? And then I thought, okay, why are we not trying to talk about what I call the crut the crap point? In the critical point, of course, according to the Bible, you should always strive for 100% testing coverage. But of course, 100% testing, you cannot testing 100%. There are always uh, constraints, either it be planning, time, budget, resources, whatever. So let's try to think about what is what is the point that is good is good enough. And like you see here, two, two, two examples, depending on the type of application, depending on of the context, the, the crud, the crap point will be different on the curve. For example, if you have, uh, if you have to test, if, if you have a customer and you want to launch a website for a one-off event, then maybe, okay, you, you, can, you, you, ha you have to test the basic functionalities, but after that, that that can be good enough, and maybe it's not interesting or, or it's not worthful to to test in into performance. And typically, and then I, I I refer to 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 ticketing websites for for famous festivals. If you know that if that fest festival knows upfront that all tickets will be sold out, no matter how long uh, um, uh, the, the users have to wait, so why should they care about doing a performance test the only functionality that's interesting okay once they are they they are in the website they need to be able to book a ticket and that's the main functionality and so we can with minimal testing we can can be enough while for example in a home banking and and, and especially that i think it's a trend everywhere but at, at least in belgium we see that most banks they are closing their physical offices and they push everyone to digital banking home banking either through website or, or to uh, through a mobile app of course they cannot afford to to do some minimal testing and to keep and to uh, to push something which is uh, has a crappy quality and in such a case your cost of testing will be much higher because you have to test more it's not only about the functionality, but it's about uh, security, uh, performance, uh, usability. So, message here is maybe by representing data to your stakeholders, take it from another perspective. Try maybe to go away from traditional overwhelming people and stakeholders with a lot of data, and maybe you can provide the data, but not in the first uh, in the first stage and, and 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 have it for those stakeholders that are really want to go into the details but try to make it more in yeah and such such kind of 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 reporting and this bring me to 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 the end of of my story and and what i try to 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 share with you in in, in my talk is whatever your your path, your your evolution in testing, from whatever situation, project from A to B, try and and dare to deviate, dare to deviate from from paths where you were working along with for many years, like like I've done with with following the the, the Bible and the book. I don't say that you don't have to, to read books. Of course, you have to read books, but try to think out of the box. Try to combine elements from, from different angles, from different books, and in the end, through the projects, follow your own path. So that's my message for today. Thank you. Hey, Mike, you're muted. Yeah, I just saw that. It's late. I can't believe.
Here, let me go ahead and bring Melissa in here if she comes in. Um, hi, Melissa. How's it going? Hey, good. Okay, great, guys. I really appreciate your talk and everything. So let me uh, go ahead with some questions here uh, for you guys. Um, I have a question. What about multi-cloud testing? How do we proceed with that? How is that tested? That's that's kind of an interesting one. Uh, uh, multi-cloud testing. Yeah. What about multi-cloud? Then I uh, with multi-cloud, it's meant uh, private, uh, public clouds. Yeah, like two different clouds. Let's say like AWS and let's say like um, you know Azure Cloud. How will we test those two together? Yeah. Well, first, first of all, try to define uh, what what type of cloud testing do you mean? Is it just an application that you need to test from a functional point of view, which is ho hosted either in, in Azure and a part in, in Amazon? Then, in fact, the, 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 the platform on which it's hosted should be for you assessed a little bit, a little bit the black box. If you are asked to do cloud testing more from the uh, platform angle then of course, different kind and then you you should go on onto the platform and check okay well what what are the features or based on on the test you need to do to to verify and make it a new and or make a, a comparison between uh, between platforms interesting interesting um here's a question for you actually both of you but melissa it's first for you how to convince superiors about risks if they don't want to listen and are pushing forward, how to gain that deserved trust that is often misinterpreted in the eyes of developers and project managers. So how do you convince superiors about risk and everything like that? So that's interesting because I think we, we kind of have trust in there as well. I think if there is any need for convincing on risk, then we don't have the trust, right? So mm. I, don't think you, I think they have to be one in the same. You have to be able to have that trust in order to even have a conversation around convincing. But in, in a normal world, um, you know, I, I'd say that the fact that, that that a company or even a leader has invested in a quality engineering or software testing team means that there is some understanding that we will be able to at least mitigate risk or know mm. where the risks are. So in that mm. situation, it's always a it's it, it's always a, a matter of, of trade-offs. Um, you know, I think any any quality engineer or tester will always say that they never feel like they have enough time to test because we're mm. always thinking about risks in there. And it's it's not filling in um, and then adding more time to your day to complete all the testing. It's really being mm. able to simply and quickly um, sort out areas that are harder risk. The way that we do this is we start out by taking um, the the landscape. In fact, we're, we're doing this right now with our team. We're doing an assessment for every project team where, um, and we are understanding who is doing what testing first, right? And we start all the way to the left of us. What what is Dev's process? Kind of what I talked about earlier is not only unit and integration tests and are they centralized and available, but their own individual checks, right? And so when we start looking at not only what QE has traditionally been responsible for creating that test strategy, the testing, but also looking across the entire squad, we focus risk on areas that have not previously been looked at from any other mm -hmm. team. So we come back around and say, okay, we know we've got great unit test or integration coverage here. And we know this developer spends a lot of time on her, his code. So we're going to deprioritize those as less risky areas because we know we at least have some eyes or something being looked at. And then we kind of categorize mm -hmm. that quickly and we add that into reporting dashboards to say, here's the areas that we have determined as being the highest risk areas. And then we start following the, the issues and the, and, the, and the bugs that we find. That's one way that we've been able to do that if there is a need for convincing. But I'll say in, in my world, I, I, we don't really, there is no need for me to convince higher ups or anyone. You're, you're not bringing in a quality engineering or investing in quality engineering without understanding that that is, there is no need for convincing. <laughs> right, right. That's but, awesome. That, that's that's yeah. such a true point. Um, Wim, do you think it's okay for QA teams to rely on dev teams to understand business requirements? And in my opinion, this is somebody said, they should be working more with BAPO instead. Do you agree with this? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? 
Yeah, it's. Do you think it's okay for a QA team to rely on dev teams to understand business requirements? We'll just leave it there. Well, let's say if that's the the only input you you have to start with, you start with it, and at least by 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 starting from that input and by uh, having your own knowledge, then it, it can can help you to to detect the gaps, to go back to the developers to say, hey guy, hey, you provided me this input, but based on on the test, I found that this and this there is a gap, and maybe at the time can be that you go to uh, a product owner to, to to discuss okay what is, is that correct and do we need to 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 update or to to complete the requirement and as if you are working in an agile then normally you you have the benefit that you have the business already represent uh, represented in your team by by a product owner so he can help uh help you as well to to provide the input about what you Hmm. Did we lose? There he is. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a, sorry, something is a little delay and a lag, but let's move on here. What would be your advice to get juniors on board without overwhelming them, especially in multi project time critical setups? Not sure who that question is to if we're talking about multi project setups. Um, uh -huh. I probably need a little bit more context for me, unless it's relevant yeah, to- Yeah, actually, I'm sorry, it, it was. It says, um, it says for you, I'm sorry, I didn't see a part. Okay. Musa, adapting skills that help to shift left, blending soft skills with technology and balance, technical acumen with user advocacy is a nice career challenge, but also a big mountain to climb. That's kind of the buildup for the context of the question. Got it, okay. Then part two or two, right, is what would be your advice to get juniors on board without overwhelming them? especially in multi-project time critical setups? Um, so I'd, I'd maybe challenge that first statement a little bit to say that's it's not necessarily a big mountain to climb if it is part of your role, right? And and leaders, mm -hmm. quality engineering leaders, and again, I, I, that's very much you know where it, it's so important for us to define the role and what our responsibilities are and get mm -hmm. and make sure that everyone is aligned and on the same page with that so that if the role is defined as that you balance technical acumen and user advocacy, then that should not be a mountain to climb. Where I think some of the, the overwhelming mm -hmm. pieces of it is when you are new to a company and you're doing company onboarding and then you're mm -hmm. new to a project team and you're doing team onboarding and maybe mm -hmm. that is kind of that higher mountain to climb. So ways that we've kind of gone, gone around or you know, gotten through some of that is again by establishing the role of quality engineering and making sure that at the projects or team level um, that we that everyone else understands our role. It's not enough mm -hmm. for me to just do this presentation and roadshow and then assume right. that everybody in the organization mm -hmm. magically understands what the right, role right. of quality mm -hmm. engineer is. Right there is that kind of white glove treatment for people that might not have ever worked in an, in a quality engineering um, model like that and make sure that they have that right the, the worst thing that can mm -hmm. happen is that you know your quality engineering leader defines the role you as a quality engineering team have agreed and you're totally aligned with that and then you have somebody that is distracting at the pro at the team level right and so mm -hmm. sometimes they could be a very a vocal and very like a, a team lead or a dev lead or even an, an, an engineering manager or something where they have their own perceptions of what tests and QA were in previous past and companies and mm -hmm. they assume that that is what quality engineering is and so what I've mm -hmm. found and especially again relevant to what we're doing and the just the the, the hiring that we've done is to to understand who the who the folks are that might not be on board and understand how much influence they have in the team being able to move through it um, and then make sure that that you uh, I'm partnering up with them to make sure that the message of quality engineering is understood and that they can advocate for that in in my absence if needed right of mm. course i'm not going to be able to be on every single team and every single squad chance you know to get in front of everybody but to mm -hmm. to define those and call those folks out and and partner up with them 
um, has been how we've kind of gotten through some of that more overwhelming, especially if you're switching from traditional quality assurance into more modern, innovative quality engineering. It's a it's mm. a heavy lift, and a lot of it really relies on the messaging and that alignment. Wow, that's really awesome. I mean, seriously, it sounds like a lot of collaboration that has to happen with the team. Um, I got another one for you. Uh, Whip, how do you manage conflicts between, uh, both of you actually, how do you manage conflicts between quality and speed? Because I, I have examples of that in the past when we kind of had to get something quickly into production and we kind of bypassed a little quality there. I'm not going to say what company it was, but how do you manage those conflicts between quality and speed? <clears throat> um that 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 uh, that's a good question it's yeah. uh then i referred try to define what what is good enough to to go into production and don't good try to, to to go for and uh, the 100 percent which which never which you will never achieve but let's define if your business want to go into production or or whoever pushed to, to go into production look at the status of of your quality is it good enough Maybe it, it's good enough knowing that that you are releasing, for example, an application to to, uh, to 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 one country, and maybe within a few months to uh, to to other countries, and then it, that gives you time to uh, to do some uh, to do some additional testing. And yes, yeah, sometimes the, the 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 best way of increasing quality is by running against the wall in into production, by then realizing, oops. Yeah, that was a little bit too speedy that we go into production. Mm. And like I said, dare to fail, learn from the failures and mm. adapt what you, how you can avoid it. Right, right. That's really awesome. Um, here's, here's one for both of you here, because um, we got to wrap this up real soon. What was the worst te testing experience you encountered and how did you resolve it? I'm sure we have all our little stories, right? So what was one of the worst ones you had? I'm sure a lot of people want to hear this because, you know, we've all gone through this. So the, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the most weirdest situation I had was uh, we were asked to do an assessment for a customer. And while we were doing the assessment, the, 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 the test coordinator, he, he, he got a call and about an incident in production. And he just say, okay, give, give me five minutes. He just jumped into the code of the application. He just uh, added some lines of code and he just oh, no. pushed a new release. And we were looking and knowing that we were working with the Bible, then we say, what is that? And he say, yeah, yeah, in, in the past, I, I did some development the, and on the application and I knew in which module the defect was. So I can help my customers, so it's fixed. Oh, <laughs> it was, yeah. was very weird for us. <laughs> That's... That was, that sounds crazy. What about you, Melissa? I'm sure you got a story too. Oh yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I'd, I've actually had um, maybe some over eager devs that um, have had production access and we didn't have yeah, enough time yeah. to have, to, to kind of lock that or just do an audit of who's got it. And they, they thought they were pointing to a test environment. They were pointing to production, made some big oh. changes um, and it resulted in, you know, in an incident, right? I mean, I, and, and not that that's not necessarily testing because that can really happen happen to anyone. But um, I think, you know, I think for, for us, um, the mistakes are going to be made like that. Right. And, and, and mm -hmm. we just, I think more, again, as, as, you know, as we mentioned earlier, it failures and mistakes are great because that means that something is happening. It's how well can you recover from those failures and mistakes? And the more you make mistakes, the faster you'll be able to recover from them. And hopefully in that mm. more catastrophic kind of mistake where you're, you think you're on a lower environment, you're actually on fraud, mm. you know, you, you are, you're, you're just, it's, it's muscle memory, right? You, oh, mm -hmm. I made a mistake, let's recover and then come back around, right? But the, but the less where mistakes and fail, failures are, are, or the more that they're looked at as, as bad things, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you will then have the people that are like, uh-oh, I did something. And sometimes they will hide or sometimes they will try and cover <laughs> it up. So the more you, the culture supports mistakes, the more people will just be able to be direct and honest when they make it and then right. be able to quickly, quickly recover and address. Right. Okay. I can, I'm, I want to add something here. Okay. All you project managers out there. Did you hear what she just said? Don't blame us. <laughs> we 
can learn a lot from this. <laughs> Do you have anything? To, oh my gosh, that was awesome, guys. Okay, okay. Here's a here's a funny one that we got to go. How do you feel? How do you deal with testers with different personalities? That that's that's great. In in fact, in in a team, you 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 should have different personalities and in in yes. Called uh, in 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 BTI profiles, but um, yeah, l l along the team, try try to look and and try to 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 position people uh, and and use them in 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 the on the best what they are and what they like the most. So if if you have a techie guy, so maybe that that's someone who can can do some automation or some technical API testing. If you have someone who is more uh, looking for uh, uh, managing a team, then can be test coordinator. So, yeah, and and, and sometimes it's it's uh, even in, inside your team or for with the customer, you have difficult persons to work with. But that's uh, then it's like like uh, my my statement: don't try to move the people away. Try to see how to get along with it and to continue mm -hmm. with with the team and the project. Again, I'm, project I'm gonna, managers, listen to this. Go ahead, go ahead, Melissa. Sorry. I was going to say, I'm going to add to that because I think yes. different personalities, I think we all mm -hmm. want different, we should all want different personalities. And I'm going to even yes. one up that and say, not only different personalities, but we should really be looking at DE and I as well, right? Diversity, mm -hmm. um, equity, and inclusion at this point. Not only look, seeking different personalities, but seeking different backgrounds. We our engineering teams, our tech teams, especially technology in general, we are in a lot of ways leading the charge in DE and I um, because we we have you know because of where we sit in in just our you know just in in the world of economy. But I'd say that we should be seeking to have an extremely diverse team and not mm -hmm. only from personalities or de and i um you know characteristics but also levels of of experience as well as i as i mentioned at, in my talk you know i had open headcount and the open headcount was for seniors when we looked across the landscape of folks that were on the team when i started almost all of them were senior members and we mm -hmm. said you know what hey we we actually want to hire folks that are newer in their career and maybe even newer in tech because that's mm -hmm. going to give us a great balance and quite honestly that's been probably one of the the funnest things that i've seen about that but mm -hmm. not only look at different personalities but look across the spectrum your tech team should be very representative of the users that are actually yes. consuming your software and platform mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that that's really an awesome point and then i think this is our 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 uh, last question it looks like I got to, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, whoever did that. Somebody's awesome out there. What do you think? Okay, what do you think promoting from within versus hiring externally? Which is better in teams of ongoing QA projects? So is it better external or, or higher internal? What's the best thing to do? I, I, I'll take this one only because it's very fresh in my mind. Um, okay. We, we had a role right now where we, we went through um, – you know, determining whether or not we wanted to have an internal person um, to step into that role. And we decided that we actually wanted somebody with fresher sets of eyes and more experience than anyone at the time that had at that point. So uh, there is no cut and dry answer on this one. It really is going to get back to, it depends on what you're doing. You know, it depends on that. I mean, if you if there is, um, if you can, if you've established a relationship with somebody that's an internal hire and you know that they kind of have the chops and they're very hungry for that, and you can not only make the investment in them, but also make the investment in mentoring them up to that level. Right, that's a key right. component that we always forget. I, I'm really, you know, I think if anything that I can impress upon anyone is, when you are in the middle of hiring, um, prepping for the hiring, once that approval, that headcount gets approved, actually doing the hiring and then doing all the compilation of the data from the, from the interviews that you've had, you have mm -hmm. got to throttle back on everything else on your calendar. A good mm -hmm. thing is if you're in the middle of hiring, back your calendar down by at least 10% and likely 20% because we're doing no candidate, internal or external candidate, any good if we don't actually have that time built in. And I'd say mm -hmm. the, the relationship and trust can be more ruined if you are handling an internal employee that you're going to see 
throughout the day, even if they don't get that job or pull, pull them in, you're going to ruin trust if you don't actually be realistic about the time that it's going to take to bring somebody up in that mentoring fashion. So as long as you build it in, cool with going with internal. And if you mm -hmm. can't, then you have mm -hmm. to go for the skill set that you need. And that might right. be an external hire. Right. That's awesome. What do you think, Rem? The same thing? Or do you have any extra comments? Um, on no, I, I, I believe in, 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 in promoting uh, uh, pe people, even if they are junior to, to, to higher positions mm -hmm. with, uh, with coaching. And then that's especially something we, we do in, in our company. And it's because it's, it's hard to attract people, to find people. So mm. then, yeah, the, the, the best you, thing you can do is to, to promote because then those people will feel that they are valued, that mm. they, there is somebody who can help me that I can address my questions and who will bring me to the level that is needed to to work on yeah certain certain projects that that's that's awesome guys you got I think okay we got to end this you got 30 seconds what do you want to say to everybody out there right now this is your time what do you want to say advice or, or whatever go ahead just take it uh, I, for, for me, quality engineering is, is I think, the future of our industry. And even mm -hmm. if it's not the title or the role change, it's the characteristics and the mindset that are mm -hmm. more important. Even if the title doesn't fit what you're doing, but having those uh, traits and characteristics is where we're going to be. And that's where the industry is pushing and pulling us. Keep awesome. calm and testing. <laughs> what? what was that? What was that? Keep Keep calm and testing. Yes, that's awesome. Guys, that was really great. I'll tell you what, I really had a good time. I really appreciate all your advice. I'm sure a lot of people did too. Um, I hope you come back again for this. We really appreciate it. And I just want to say, you know, good luck in your testing. <laughs> you too. Likewise. See you guys later. Okay, bye-bye. Good night. Bye. <clears throat> all right, guys. I guess I get to say the final words. Oh my word, I'm telling you what, I learned so much today. Uh, there was just some fascinating speakers today. And um, all I can say is take this information because I really do the same thing. I'll take this information that I learned that I gained from this summits. They're incredible. And then what I do is I apply it and it just really helps me out. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Anyway, I'm getting tired, right? Anyway, I'm going to let you guys go. And tomorrow is the senior track, what I understand. Everybody, I will see you later, and I will be on the last track tomorrow if you want to hang out and have some super cool fun. All right, talk to everybody later. Bye. Have a good one.